and good morning everyone. Amanda Zitzman here joining you alongside my colleagues Erica Tinsley and Brian Hernandez. We are standing by for the Aurora Theater shooting trial to begin this morning. Today marks the 28th day of this trial and we want to start by going into what we learned in court yesterday. There have now been two psychiatrists, a Dr. William Reed and now Dr. Jeffrey Metzner that have agreed the shooter was sane at the time of the shooting back in 2012. Dr. Metzner was actually the first psychiatrist to interview the shooter, but his evaluation was deemed incomplete. So they called in Dr. William Reed and Reed spoke to the gunman over five days, concluding to the court last week the shooter was in fact sane. Dr. Metzner took the stand yesterday. He also said the shooter had the capacity to know right from wrong. We left in the middle of the redirect and we want to play a little bit for you now from the courtroom. Based upon everything that you've seen, it's very clear to you that the tragic and horrible shooting spree on July 20th was a direct result of Mr. Holmes' illness. Is that right? Correct. And without that mental illness, um, the shooting would never have taken place. That is my opinion. What's concrete thinking? Concrete thinking is to be contrasted with abstract thinking. So for example, if I ask you to tell me people in glass houses should not throw stones. If you have an example of abstract thinking and I say, what does that mean? Abstract thinking would say, well, you shouldn't be critical of other people if you have the same faults. Concrete thinking would be you shouldn't throw stones in a glass house because you'll break the glass. So, so that's what uh, concrete thinking is. Mr. Holmes displayed evidence of concrete thinking? Correct. And that's, an, that's a sign of schizophrenia, is it not? It's consistent with schizophrenia. Or schizoaffective it, disorder. With a lot of other illnesses, but also with uh, schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. And you can also have concrete thinking and not be mentally ill. So I don't want people to think that if they have concrete thinking, that's a sign of mental illness. Not necessarily, but Correct. it can be. It can be, but it's... It, because you have it doesn't mean you have a mental illness. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, nihilistic philosophy and philosophy in general. Can we do that? I guess we're going to. <laughs> There's been some talk about how, and you heard um, Dr. Reed's testimony about how Mr. Holmes had the uh, belief for in moral relativism, um, or what could be called nihilism. Um, let me ask you this. Can somebody believe in moral relativism and still be mentally ill and psychotic? Yes. Isn't it true that many times people's psychosis or delusions incorporate aspects of religion or philosophy into the delusional construct? Correct. For it's example, not, it's, it's not restricted to either religion or philosophy, but correct. Could be anything, right? That's correct. Like I, I, I think I'm Jesus Christ, for example, would be a delusional, a delusion you mentioned before, right? Correct. That would be related to religion in some fashion, Correct. right? Um, 
And so the fact that Mr. Holmes may have a belief in moral relativism does not mean that his thought process was not psychotic, does it? Correct. Whether or not he believes in moral relativism or not is irrelevant to whether the thought process is psychotic. I mean, it could be either way. Correct. Dr. Messer, in light of all of the stuff that Mr. King just went through with you and all the different possibilities from suggesting that something else was to blame for it or something else could have caused it or all these different scenarios, including the drunk driving one, has your opinion changed one whit that this guy right here had the capacity to know right from wrong based on societal standards of morality when he walked into that theater on the 19th and 20th and tried to murder the theater full of people. It has not changed. You still extremely confident in it? Yes. How about the other prong? Anything about what Mr. King brought up to you or threw out as possibilities that changes your extreme confidence in your previously stated opinion that this guy had the capacity to form the intent to murder after deliberation and to act knowingly with regard to all the other alleged criminal conduct? My, my opinion hasn't changed and my degree of confidence hasn't changed. In fact, had you considered all of the things that Mr. King had just brought up in cross-examination in formulating your expert opinion on the matter of sanity? I believe so. There was another portion of the exchange here towards the end where you were confronted with uh, other hypothetical facts from this. For instance, had the defendant actually uh, made an assessment that he could get away? and had driven away, how would that impact? Do you recall that exchange? Yes. I, I want to give you a different hypothetical that touches upon that. If you had had a hypothetical where the defendant, on the same day, goes to a gun store, purchases an AR-15, buys ammunition, carries it out in broad daylight, walks across the parking lot to, let's say, a, a theater, walks in in broad, light, broad daylight, does nothing to be surreptitious or cover up what his plans are, goes and even gets a, a Coke to drink, walks into the theater and starts shooting folks from that regard. Do those facts, are those facts distinguishable enough from these that they begin to suggest that maybe this guy doesn't know right from wrong on a societal standard of morality? They would be. When you are considering this crime, are you focused on one, two, or three things or do you look at a global perspective of all the decisions that were made by that guy right there? You look at the totality of the circumstances, uh, so it's not uh, based on just one factor. And I want to make sure that I'm clear on this, too. We keep saying psychotic and psychosis, and those are the right terms. I get that. But they all flow from the delusion. Is that right? Yes. And I want to make sure I know what the delusion is. Is the delusion that he thought he would feel better and his value would increase the more people he killed? The d delusion was that he would increase his self-worth by killing people. And a secondary thought he had about that is that this would help him become less depressed. So there are really two aspects of it. Is it accurate or fair to conclude that the defendant then made a decision to substitute human lives for his increased self-worth and feeling better. Objection. Calls for an improper opinion. Overruled. Go ahead, sir. I think that's accurate. McGuire and Mr. Edson, and uh, we are so outside the do, presence um, of the jury at this time. From the Dr. The Messner, jury? we do understand that court is now sure. in session. The live no. feed is up. Your Honor, so I have one matter that needs to be put on the record. Yes. Um, I want to let the court know, and I apologize for this, that, um, and I've spoken to Ms. Teach McGuire about it, but uh, James's sister, Chris, has been in the courtroom yesterday. I did not advise her. Correctly, I thought that she was already excluded from the sequestration order. She was not, and that is my fault. That is not her fault. 
I apologize to the court and I apologize to Ms. Teach McGuire. I did ask her if she had any opposition to excluding her from the sequestration order so she could be present. She, uh, Ms. Teach McGuire indicated that she does not have any opposition to that and I did let her know of my mistake yesterday so I'd ask to modify that order. Your Honor, if I could, I, I was just made aware of this by Ms. Teach McGuire. Can we have some time to think about this and take this part under advisement and, and discuss it at a break possibly? All right. Um... If the people want to discuss it, that means that my previous order stands, so she would have to um, be excluded from the courtroom until I modify the order, if I modify it. I'm assuming you, that you're referring to, when you say James, you're referring to your client, Ms. Higgs, and when you say Chris, you're referring to Chris Holmes, your client's sister. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor, that is correct. All right. Um, but at this time, she's not exempt from the sequestration order, so... She'll have to wait outside, and then um, let's discuss it at the break. And then if the people have a change of mind at that point, then she can come back in the courtroom. Or even if the people don't have a change of mind, if you still want to make that request, I will consider it at that time, okay? So she should step out for now. All right, let's uh, bring the jury in, please. Oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to make the... Um, page from the DSM that Mr. King used in his cross-examination with Dr. Metzner yesterday, I would like to mark it as a court exhibit if that's okay with the court, just out of an abundance of caution. Of course. So I think we're up to see TR 51. Yes. Is that right? Okay, and I'll provide it to your staff at the break. Great, thank you. And that was the page that Mr. King used with Dr. Metzner during his cross-examination yesterday, uh, and it's a page out of the DSM-5. Okay, let's bring the jury in, please. Our number DTR-57, just okay. for the record. Great, thank you. Apparently, one of the jurors is still not here, so let's have everybody uh, be seated. I, I could have kept everyone standing, but I figure you could be more comfortable. Mr. Honor, Bruckler. Unless the court has other business, could I, I could address the issue with the sister thing right now and just have a quick conversation if the court's amenable to that? Absolutely, of course.
Your Honor? Yes, sir. Yeah, I've talked about it with the smarter people at my table, and um, I think the position that Ms. Tish McGuire conveyed to Ms. Higgs is the one that, uh, that we're in agreement with and would adopt. So we have no objection to the court amending its order about sequestration to permit the defendant's sister to be present in the courtroom. Okay, without objection, then I will grant the request. So the uh, sequestration order is uh, orally amended, and Chris Holmes may be present in the courtroom even when she's not testifying and specifically before she testifies. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, if I may. I, I don't know if this is a good time to, to discuss the email uh, situation since we seem to have a little bit of time. I'm trying to find out what's going on with the juror who's missing. So as soon as I have some information, I'll let you know. I don't want to get started and then uh, find out that she's here. So I'm going to step down and try to find out um, if there is an update on the missing juror. And then as soon as I have an update, we'll let you know. Okay, the court will be in recess. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Amanda Zisman back here joining you. Apparently, we have a late juror in the courtroom, so as they work to iron that out, we want to go more into what happened in court yesterday when Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Metzner was testifying, saying that he believes the shooter was sane at the time of the shooting back in 2012. Let's play that now. Doctor, the finishing up from where we were this morning, I want to ask you, if you could tell us which factors you considered from all the discovery and your examination that go to the capacity to uh, form the intent to murder after deliberation and to act knowingly as regards July 19th and 20th, 2012. Well, the, the most obvious ones are the information in the notebook. There's a number of pages where he describes the, uh, his plan for the movie theater and plans other options uh, other than going to the movie theater. And then 
I, as I mentioned before, I questioned him line by line about that. So it was very clear uh, that he had thought about this for some time. And, and then the knowingly part, the, um, the plans from the perspective of carrying out the shooting were realistic, meaning he didn't go out and buy water pistols. He bought an AR-15 and a Glock and a Remington. So th that goes to the knowing part. And, and th they're the major obvious uh, factors. You know, speaking of the 19th and 20th of July, um, we have heard Dr. Reed use the phrase acutely psychotic. Is there a synonym that, that you would use to describe if someone was that they were, they were not acutely psychotic? Well, I, I heard the testimony by Dr. Reed with th that uh, particular use of acutely psychotic. And the, the word acute has changed between DSM-4 and DSM-5. But my understanding, I think, of what Dr. Reed was talking about is if you look at Judge, I'm going to object as to his understanding of what Dr. Reed was talking about. That calls for speculation. The objection um, as to speculation is sustained under Rule 602. Doctor, let me ask you a different question. D do you, did you find that the defendant was floridly psychotic on the 19th and 20th of July 2012? Objection relevance. Overruled? Go ahead, sir. I found that he was psychotic not that he was floridly psychotic. The, the distinction that I would make between psychotic and floridly psychotic or acutely psychotic is if you look at his presentation around November 11, 12, 13, when he went to Denver Health Medical Center, he was floridly psychotic. And what I mean by floridly psychotic, again, if you were in the room, you didn't have to be a psychiatrist to say that something was wrong with Mr. Holmes. It would be obvious to a lay person. On July 20th, I think that Mr. Holmes was psychotic because he was delusional. But unless you talk to him, that wouldn't be apparent to you that he was psychotic. Be, um, be, being psychotic or floridly psychotic, he, uh, the, they both are very significant impairments and reflection of significant mental illness. Uh, the fact, though, that it's the delusion that we're talking about for the psychosis on the 19th and 20th, that, that's the one we're talking about increasing his value? That's correct. <clears throat> and despite the, the determination that he had that delusion on the 19th and 20th, you still adhere to your opinions that you gave us right before lunch? Yes, and that's in part when, when you're psychotic. That doesn't mean that you lose all reasoning ability. And in fact, he, um, he was acting on an irrational psychotic notion, but he was very organized in acting on that. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about some specific things from uh, the discovery that may touch upon these capacity issues. One is, um, did the def do you recall what the defendant told Dr. Spenton and Feinstein was his rationale for not studying for the prelims? I'm not sure that I um, recall what he told them. I know what he told me and I know what he told them, what he was doing instead of studying, but I'm not sure I recall what he told them about why he wasn't studying. Do you recall from the reports and stuff that were generated that he told them he was prepared enough, he studied this way often, I know what I'm doing, this is no big deal, I've done it before? That refreshes my memory, yes. Is that what he told you? No. What did he tell you? What, what he told me is that most of his life he, he was trying to please people. And one of the ways he would try to please people and please himself is by doing well in school. And one of the ways he did well in school is he studied a lot for exams because he was fearful of not doing well. And by the time prelims came up, he decided he was going to be his natural self and not study because of what other people 
uh, expected of him uh, or his fears of what would happen, but to just be himself and take the test without studying. Did he tell you in terms of his planning um, how he was able to case out and draw out each of the theaters that we've seen in his notebook? Yes. How did he do that? Well, he told me, I think it was between June and July, I believe he went to the Century 16 Theater um, nine or ten times and looking and going into different theaters and figuring out which would work best. And he eventually picked Theater 9 and 10 because of the layout. And he eventually picked Theater 9 because Theater 10 was being used as overflow uh, for people who couldn't get into Theater 9. And the Theater 10 movie, I think, was beginning at 12.15, at least the previews. And the Theater 9 movie was starting at 12, and that's why he chose Theater 9. In terms of the planning also, you spoke with him about how he decided to make purchases online versus at stores. Do you recall that? Yes. Tell us what he told you. Well, the purchases at stores w was based on convenience, meaning what's, what was close to him. The purchases online were based on price. Did Forgive me for not remembering this. I didn't put a check mark right here. Did I ask you already about his use of an incorrect birth date on um, adultfriendfinder.com? You have not. Let me do that. Um, did you talk to him about the birth date he chose to put in when he was signing up for adultfriendfinder.com? Yes. And what was it? He used the incorrect birth date because he really didn't – he wanted to be able to not be identifiable – uh, th through that and giving a wrong birthday is just one identifier that may make it hard to identify. Now, I think that was more related to the dating perspective than r related to what he was planning to do July 20th. Did he tell you why he chose to commit this mass murder at a movie theater? He did, and it, again, it was in part related to some leading questions from me, which was based on uh, reading his notebook, which clearly said why he, he uh, chose that. And let me uh, ref refresh my memory. And welcome back. So today we expect to hear more from Dr. Metzner in court. He is actually the second psychiatrist to give the opinion that the shooter was sane at the time of the shooting. I understand court is back in session, so we want to toss it over to that now. We are outside the presence of the jury. Uh, the juror who's missing left a message early this morning for us, or not that early, but indicated that apparently there was a power outage. Uh, in her home and she overslept, the alarm didn't go off. And so she called at about 8.15, it sounded like, and said she was on her way, but she's not here yet. And I'm not sure whether uh, we misunderstood in terms of uh, the time. Um, we think she called at about 8.15 and said she was on her way, but that may not necessarily be accurate. And so given that, uh, I think we'll make use of our time and I'll rule on exhibit p tr dash. 1227. And Dr. Metzner, you can stay there or you can step down, whatever's most comfortable for you while I do this, okay? Yes. Judge, could we inquire what the juror number is? Yeah, this is juror number 640, who's never been late before. So the uh, juror who was late yesterday was uh, a different juror. Um, I believe that was 872 who was running a little late yesterday. And then these are the only two days that we've had anyone be late. Uh, other than yesterday and today, uh, the jurors, all 24 of them, have been on time every time. So, all right. The, uh, there are some global objections to exhibit P-TR-1227, and there, there are some specific objections to 12 particular emails. Uh, in terms of the global objections, there is a relevance objection. There is a Rule 403 objection. Uh, and I'm going to address those uh, in a little bit. There is a hearsay objection. So let me address that objection first. Um, in terms of the hearsay objection, the objection is overruled. 
To the extent that the emails in this exhibit contain statements by the defendant, those statements are not hearsay. They are statements by a party opponent. To the extent that the emails contain statements, statements by someone else, they're not hearsay because they're not being introduced introduced for the truth of the matter asserted. They're being introduced to place the defendant's statements in context so that the jury can understand the defendant's statements in context. And I'm happy to give a limiting instruction uh, along those lines. I'm making the same offer that I have made throughout the trial to the defense in terms of uh, giving the jury a limiting instruction with respect to these statements made by people other than the defendant uh, I disagree that a limiting instruction uh, will not be adequate uh, in this case, uh, and um, th there's no basis um, that supports that argument. Uh, this happens all the time in courts. Statements are admitted that are not hearsay, and uh, if a party wants the court to tell the jury uh, specifically that those statements are being admitted, for example, uh, to show the effect on the listener or, for example, to place in context some other statements, uh, courts do that. Uh, this happens all the time. So I disagree that a limiting instruction will not be adequate to address this particular situation, especially given the nature of the statements by other folks in these emails. These are not statements that, in general, uh, have any risk of undue prejudice or that um, lead me to conclude that uh, one, one or more of the concerns listed in Rule 403 um, is present. Uh, or that one of those concerns, one or more of those concerns should lead me, should lead me to, um, to uh, keep these uh, emails out. Number five is a confrontation issue. Um, there's not a confrontation issue here. These are not hearsay statements. These are statements by the defendant, uh, which constitute statements by a party opponent, and statements by other people that are not being introduced for the truth of the matter asserted. But in any event, to the extent that the defense wants to examine these folks, um, they're welcome to do it. And to the extent that these folks have already testified, uh, if the defense wants an opportunity to call them again, I'll give them that opportunity. Same thing with uh, people who haven't testified or perhaps people that the defense is not familiar with. I think Ms. Spengler named one uh, person that she said uh, they weren't familiar with. I think it was somebody by the last name of Mock, M-A-U-C-K. And if the defense wants an opportunity to call that person to the stand and other people to the stand, whether they've been called before or not, I'll give them a chance to do that. They'll have a, an opportunity to do that. Uh, there was a reference to character evidence. And I think Ms. Spengler was trying to be candid with the court, and, and I, as she put it up front with the court. And in that process, uh, although she didn't concede that these were not character evidence, uh, she acknowledged that the phrases in the specific objections don't necessarily fall directly within inadmissible character evidence. And, and I, I don't believe that any of this is character evidence. In terms of the relevance objection, that is the primary objection by the defense, and also related to that, the Rule 403 objection. And with respect to Rule 403, there seem to be three particular issues that the defense is focusing on. Uh, danger of unfair prejudice, confusion of the issues, and related to that, inviting the jury to speculate. And then third is the unnecessary presentation of cumulative evidence. And so let me address the relevance and the Rule 403 objections. Uh, global objection, uh, I should say. Uh, these emails in this exhibit start on August 5. 2011, and they go through June 13 of 2012. So they span a period of less than a year, uh, about 10 months. Uh, but this is most of the period during which the defendant was a student at the University of Colorado. Uh, and consistent with previous rulings, I find that these emails are relevant to the issue of sanity and to the culpable mental state elements of the offenses charged. Uh, these emails are probative of the defendant's state of mind, 
his ability to understand events and information and to respond to events, information, and queries in a logical and coherent fashion, his ability to be aware of and understand the world around him, his thought processes, uh, how he was able to think and the way he was able to think, whether he had organized or disorganized thinking, the way he was able to perceive and process specific information, the way he interacted with other people and communicated with other people, the way he was able to share information with people uh, as part of those communications, the way he chose words, uh, and whether his speech uh, in, or whether his, his uh, communications, uh, written speech, it would be your communications, were organized or disorganized, whether he was connected or attached or detached or disconnected from reality, uh, connected or attached to reality or disconnected or detached from reality, the way he was able to accumulate and put together information, uh, all those things. Uh, and uh, in sum, they're relevant to the defendant's mental state, mental processes, mental and cognitive capacity, and the issues related to the plea of not guilty by reason of insanity and the culpable mental state elements of the offenses charged. Um, it is worth noting, as I have done before, that there is a disagreement between the parties in this case as to whether the defendant's mental state and mental capacity experienced some type of decline in 2012. As I have understood the parties, the defense appears to assert that the defendant's mental state and mental capacity deteriorated uh, in 2012, perhaps as early as February when he first sought counseling or, or even in March. Uh, the prosecution appears to allege that nothing changed and that the defendant was the same throughout 2012 as he was before. Uh, this disagreement is one of the issues or is at the heart of, of the issues raised by the insanity defense. Uh, and not surprisingly, both sides have spent a lot of time on the issue as they question witnesses. In order for the jury to assess each party's position, I think the jury needs to have a frame of reference. The jury needs to have something to which to compare the defendant as he was in the first part of 2012 or throughout 2012. During the first four or five months of 2012, the main aspect of the defendant's life and the aspect that consumed most of his time was school. Therefore, it is important, in my view, to allow the jury to view information about the defendant as he was in the last half of 2011 uh, when he started school or around the time that he started school. Uh, so that way the jury can compare the defendant uh, as he was when he was in school in 2011 and as he was when he was in school in 2012. After all, school was the main part of his life during that time frame. Uh, consistent with this view, I have allowed emails um, throughout dating back to 2011 and I think essentially to the to April, May, or the mid-2011, mid whenever the defendant started school or whenever he started uh, communicating about school and whether it was registration or getting an apartment or classes, the program, all those things, uh, all of the emails go back to, um, I think, April or May, perhaps June of 2011, and they're related to the defendant's school life. The emails in question will allow the jury, and when I say the emails in question, I'm referring to the ones in P-TR-1227, will assist the jury uh, as the jury considers the defendant's mental state and mental capacity in this continuum or progression of time uh, between 2011 and 2012. And it's really between the summer or fall of 2011, mostly the fall, and then the spring and summer of 2012. Uh, and it's really mostly the spring and then the beginning of summer of 2012. Uh, Dr. Reed, by the way, opined, as I understood the testimony, that the defendant had negative symptoms of schizotypal disorder going back to high school and that he started, ex started experiencing sy symptoms of delusional disorder in, sometime in 2012. The range of date of all these the range of dates of all these emails in exhibit 1227, P-TR-1227, is certainly within one of those time frames. 
and the range of dates of most of the emails in this exhibit is within uh, both time frames. Uh, Dr. Metzner, who's still testifying, uh, I think said yesterday that the defendant experienced some negative symptoms, what has been referred to as negative symptoms, as far back perhaps as undergraduate school, I think he said in college. Uh, additionally, Dr. Reed testified that in assessing the defendant's sanity, it is important to explore all aspects of his life. Uh, he certainly did that in his lengthy examination. Dr. Metzner, uh, as far as I can tell, did the same thing. Um, Dr. Metzner performed a lengthy examination of the defendant over 25 hours and explored multiple areas of the defendant's life uh, and went back before July of 2012, in fact, long before 2012. Uh, and by the way, I don't know that I agree with the defense when the defense asserts that these experts did not rely on any of these emails. It's my understanding that these experts and other experts were asked by the parties to review most, if not all, of the discovery in this case, uh, a voluminous amount of information to be sure. I think Dr. Reed said last week that it was in the uh, range of 60,000 or 70,000 pages, perhaps more. Uh, and in any event, the fact that an expert may not have specifically mentioned an email or emails in his report or testimony doesn't mean that they don't constitute a part of the information on which he relied in forming his opinions. Uh, for example, Drs. Reed and Metzner uh, appear to me to have relied on the defendant's interactions with others, his communications with others, his behaviors, the organization of his speech and thinking, his mental processes and his mental capacity and how any of that may have changed uh, to th in 2012 as compared to 2011 and before. And these emails would be examples of some of those things. Um, in any case, I agree with what Mr. Orman said uh, last week when he argued about this exhibit and he said that uh, ultimately it is the jury that will make the decision on the issue of sanity, not Dr. Reed or Dr. Metzner or any other experts. So even if the experts had not relied on these exhibits or on these emails, it doesn't mean that they are irrelevant. They're not rendered irrelevant just because of that. But as I said, I believe that they have relied on, on um, some of these communications. They have relied on, on all the information that they have been provided. And certainly, it's my understanding that they've been provided um, emails that the defendant was sending and have specifically looked at the things that I've talked about, the defendant's uh, communications with others, interactions with others, the defendant's behaviors, organization of speech and thinking, the defendant's mental processes and the defendant's mental capacity and cognitive abilities and how they may have changed between 2011 and 2012. Uh, let me just say, by the way, that I understand that just because you're able to interact with others, to communicate with others, to process information, to respond to information logically, reasonably, coherently, and appropriately, etc. I get it. I get that that all does not necessarily mean that you're sane. I get that. And that's a point of defense has been making throughout. But that also doesn't mean that any evidence of your cognitive capacity to interact with other people, to communicate with them, to process information, and to respond to information coherently, logically, reasonably, and appropriately, et cetera. And when I say et cetera, I'm referring to the other things that I have mentioned, the other activities that these emails deal with or are probative of, uh, or the other uh, aspects of the defendant that uh, these, the defendant's mental state that these emails are probative of. Uh, it doesn't mean that they have no relevance to the issue of sanity. So yes, on the one hand, just because someone can communicate and interact with people and process information, uh, it doesn't mean that they're sane, but that also doesn't mean that the person's communications and interactions and evidence of his ability to process information and to respond to it appropriately and coherently is inadmissible or that it is irrelevant. And I think that the um, testimony of the two court-appointed experts, Drs. Reed and Metzner, show my point, or I think they, they corroborate the point that I just made. But as I said, the relevance of this exhibit 
exist independent of their opinions. Uh, so for all those reasons, I find that these emails are relevant. I also find that the probative value of these emails is not substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice uh, or by the danger of confuse, confusing the jury or uh, inviting the jury to speculate or by the unnecessary presentation of cumulative evidence. Uh, in terms of the specific objections, uh, let me run through the uh, 12 emails or email exchanges that were identified by Ms. Spengler. The first one is um, uh, email uh, August 23, 2011, number 1359, and the number refers to the bait stamp number. Uh, this is an email exchange between the defendant and his father, Robert Holmes. Uh, and then I think there was a, an argument that there is double hearsay because Mr. Holmes, Robert Holmes, that is, discusses statements by Chris Holmes, the defendant's sister. Uh, it's not hearsay, and it's not double hearsay because these statements are not being admitted for the truth of the matter asserted. Uh, in terms of character evidence related to, to Chris Hall, uh, Holmes, uh, I don't find that to be character evidence. Again, it is not being introduced for the truth of the matter asserted, and I don't think it rises to the level of, of character evidence. It is a statement, I think, that Robert Holmes is conveying to, the, to his son about something that Chris said to him about her roommate in college, uh, and her roommate possibly being a crip, C-R-I-P. Uh, and the defendant then responds to that, finding it unlikely that that's true or that that's the case. Uh, and so it's probative because, uh, for all the reasons I stated earlier, but it is also probative specifically because it shows the defendant's ability to understand and process the information and events discussed by his father. Uh, it also demonstrates his mental or cognitive capacity to respond to his father in a logical coherent, reasonable, and appropriate fashion, and it is within the time frame that we've been working, or that I've been working with. It's August 23, 2011. It's certainly within the time frame that the experts have found to be relevant. Uh, so the court concludes that this evidence is probative of the issues of sanity and the culpable mental state elements of the crimes charged, and the probative value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. Uh, again, this is an exhibit, this is the earliest, one of the earliest emails in the exhibit. It's from August 23 of 2011, uh, and by the way, most of the emails are from 2012, but this is one of the earlier ones, but I think in addition to what I just said, it also gives the jury a reference point, a point of reference to compare the defendant in 2012 to. What was the defendant like before... Uh, 2012, and was there any change? Was there anything that, that changed? Was there anything that uh, changed in terms of his mental capacity that shows that he developed a mental illness or that perhaps even if he had had a mental illness already that, that's, that somehow it became more, um, uh, that it, it was manifested more clearly? I think the jury, in order to assess those types of issues, needs to have a point of reference needs to be able to compare uh, that to something uh, before that. Uh, number two is the email from October 30, 2011, bait stamp number 2964. This is an email exchange between the defendant and his mother, which contains a reference to speeding and the police being lame. Uh, and Ms. Pengler, again, I think in an effort to be as candid as possible with the court, acknowledge that this is probably not inadmissible character evidence uh, under Rule 404. Uh, she didn't concede it, but she said it's probably not inadmissible character evidence. And I appreciate her candor, and I agree with her. I don't think this is inadmissible character evidence or that it falls under Rule 404 either. Uh, as to the irrelevant and Rule 403 objections, um, it appears to me that the primary concern here uh, by the defense is for the risk of unfair prejudice. I see very little, if any, risk of unfair prejudice here. Uh, I mean, a speeding ticket in the context of this case uh, is extremely unlikely to have any um, risk uh, to prejudice the defendant in any unfair way or in any way for that matter. Uh, the same is true for the defendant's comment about the cops in Colorado being lame 
for not even having a 15 mile per hour leeway, as he put it. A lot of people get a speeding ticket at some point in their life, and when it happens, it is not uncommon for people to feel annoyed at the police for having received a ticket, and, for, and it's not uncommon for people to have the type of reaction the defendant had, especially given that it was, um, he felt that, that this was a speeding ticket for going, I think, 11 miles over the speed limit. Um, also, the most reasonable inference that can be drawn from a subsequent email from November 15, a subsequent email exchange about two weeks later between the defendant and his mother, which is at bait stamp number 3297, is that this was the defendant's first speeding ticket. The defendant's mother asks the defendant if there's a way to do online traffic school to knock off the speeding ticket. Uh, the reaction was not, oh well, another speeding ticket, uh, you know what to do, or just pay it off, you've done it in the past, that kind of thing. The reaction seems to me to suggest that uh, this is not a, a common occurrence with the defendant. Uh, on the probative side, uh, in, addition, in addition to the reasons that I have stated earlier, uh, the email from the defendant in this exchange contains a discussion about activities that he, that he is engaging in with his gal, as he refers to her, and with his friends. Uh, one of the big themes in this trial has had to do with the defendant's ability or inability to socialize with others in 2012, including how shy and introverted and socially awkward he was at that time. The parties appear to disagree about whether these are symptomatic of mental illness or whether they are merely normal traits of the defendant's personality and whether there was a change in these behaviors at some point in 2012. The defendant's discussion of social activities with his girlfriend and friends in, in late 2011 goes to these issues. As such, this is evidence that is probative of the issues of sanity and the culpable mental state elements of the crimes charged, and the probative value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. Having said all of that, in an abundance of caution, if the defense wishes, I will order the prosecution to redact uh, this particular page of the exhibit by deleting the following words. And then I got a speeding ticket because the police are laying here, 46 in a 35 zone, not even a 15 MPH leeway. Uh, in my view, such a redaction will not take away the primary property value of the email, but will completely avoid any danger of unfair prejudice. So I'll leave it to the defense to tell me whether they prefer to have that redaction made or whether they would rather not have the redaction made. Either way, the defense is not waiving their objection. I, I understand their objection. I'm overruling it. I'm giving them a choice of whether they wish to have that redacted or not, and it is up to them to make that determination. Uh, number three is an email from November 15, 2011, bait stamp number 3297. I just mentioned this a moment ago. This is an email exchange between a defendant and his mother uh, this is the one that contains a reference to the speeding ticket and whether it can be knocked off through online traffic school. The defendant responds that the amount of the fine is not yet showing online. The defense makes the same objections uh, to this email as it made to the last email, so it's the same ruling. Uh, in this email exchange, by the way, on the probative side, the defendant mentions that he plans to spend Thanksgiving with a bunch of his peeps uh, which I infer to mean his friends, and with his gal, Gargi, which he says should be fun. Uh, as a, for all the reasons I have mentioned previously, including in the ruling on the admissibility of the last email from October 30, 2011, this email exchange, uh, in my view, is probative of the issues of sanity and the culpable mental state elements of the crimes charged, and the probative value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. Consistent with my last ruling, if the defense wishes, I will order the prosecution to redact Mr. Holmes's comment, or excuse me, Mrs. Holmes's comment, no response to my email about your speeding, speeding ticket, can you knock it off your record by online traffic school, and the defendant's response, I don't know about the traffic school, the fine isn't listed online yet. 
Uh, and by the way, that last sentence by the defendant implies to me that he had gone online and looked for the fine due on the ticket, something which, again, is probative of his capacity to understand the world around him, to process information, to react appropriately, logically, reasonably, and coherently to it. Um, but as I said, I will still order uh, those redactions if the defense wants them, uh, because in my view, such redactions will not take away the primary probative value of the email, but will completely avoid any danger of unfair prejudice uh, with respect to the speeding ticket. And the same thing is true with the last email. Next is number four, uh, an email from December 9, 2011, bait stamp number 3987. This is an email by Cami Kennedy, a program administrator at the University of Colorado, asking about the defendant's correct date of birth. The defendant responds with his correct date of birth. Uh, and if I remember correctly, I think she had two possible dates of birth and was trying to figure out which one was the right one. Uh, Ms. Spengler said, seemingly, I suppose, it, this is insignificant, uh, but there's no relevance. And why draw the juror's attention to the fact that the university may have had two dates of birth to the defendant? I agree that this is insignificant in terms of uh, any unfair prejudice or any risk for unfair prejudice. In terms of the probative value, the court relies on all the re reasons I have previously articulated. Uh, specifically, as it relates to this email exchange, I note that the defendant responds to a query by the school. He processes the information and replies with the information requested in an appropriate, reasonable, logical, and coherent format, which again goes to his state of mind and his mental processes, and by extension, to the issues of sanity and the culpable mental state elements of the offenses charged. And in my view, the probative value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. Next is the January 16, 2012 email, bait stamp numbers 4456 through 4459. This is an email exchange between one of the defendant's professors, Diego Restrepo, R-E-S-T-R-E-P-O, all the email from Professor Restrepo says is that he marked up a document apparently submitted to him by the defendant using I, that's a small I, annotate, A-N-N-O-T-A-T-E, on the professor's iPad. Uh, there appears to be an attachment to the email with the defendant's submission, and there are three handwritten markings or notes by the professor on that submission. Uh, the last page, page 4459, bait stamp, page 4459, has the defendant's response to the professor's constructive criticism. And the defendant's response is part of an email. Um, Ms. Spengler is right that this email appears to contain a specific document that appears to be homework, um, but... Um, in terms of the pro and, and I don't believe the defense objects to the to the homework. I think the objection is to the email, if I understand correctly. But regardless, I think it's all relevant. Uh, in terms of the probative value, I rely on all the reasons previously articulated as it relates to this specific part of the exhibit. I note that the defendant's response to the professor's constructive criticism shows his cognitive ability to understand and react to constructive criticism, his thought processes the way he processed information, the way he put information together, uh, all of which is relevant to the issues of sanity and the culpable mental state elements of the offenses charged. And the probative value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. Next, I have an email um, dated January 31, 2012, uh, bait stamp number 5334. This is an email by the defendant to Frank Guido, G-U-I-D-O. I think Frank Guido is a professor at the University of Colorado, and the defendant is inquiring about a third rotation. There is a reference in the, in the email to the work being done by Mr. Guido or Professor Guido on impulsive aggression disorder. Ron, just so the record's clear, yeah. I think it's actually Guido Frank. I think the last name is first. Okay, thank you. Guido Frank, thank you for that correction. Um, and so the uh, I believe that the uh, particular... Um, concern the defendant has is the potential for um, unfair prejudice as a result of the mentioning of impulsive aggression disorder. Uh, if this were the only email 
related to the defendant seeking to be admitted into a third rotation, I might understand the defense's concern with respect to the reference to impulsive aggression disorder, uh, the subject of the research of this lab. But given that there are four emails that are almost identical and contain what appears to be boilerplate language uh, in which the defendant is requesting admission into a third rotation, and the only difference that I can see, uh, substantive difference that I can see between the emails is the subject of the lab work being done, um, I'm not concerned because it is clear to me, and I think it'll be clear to the jury, that the email does not demonstrate the defendant's interest in impulsive aggression disorder. Rather, when the email is viewed in the context of the other three emails, the other three similar emails, it is clear to me that the defendant is simply trying to be allowed into a third rotation. Uh, that's consistent, by the way, with the evidence that the jury has heard so far. Uh, additionally, there has been no mention in this case of impulsive aggression disorder uh, as something that the defendant was concerned with in his self-diagnosis, nor has there been any reference to this disorder by any expert, and there's no evidence that this disorder was present in the defendant at any time or that the defendant's alleged conduct at any time was consistent with this disorder. So in the end, I don't see much, if any, risk for unfair prejudice, and this email has probably value for all the reasons that I have said before, including with respect to the defendant's state of mind, ability to process information, the issues of sanity and the culpable mental state elements of the offenses charged, and the probity value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. Nevertheless, having said all that, if the defense wishes, in an abundance of caution, I will order the people to redact those three words from the email, impulsive aggression disorder. Such a redaction, in my view, will not take away the primary property value of the email, but will completely avoid any danger of unfair prejudice. Number seven, this is a email exchange. Actually, this includes two emails. Uh, from February 7, 2012, it's an email exchange at bait stamps numbers 5623 through 5626. And then uh, an email exchange from February 15, 2012, bait stamp numbers 5781 to 5785. All of this is, is generally an email exchange and a continuation of that email exchange between the defendant and Professor Kurt Freed who has testified. Uh, Ms. Spengler admitted that the context of these emails is generally benign. I think she meant the content of the email is generally benign, and I may have written down the note incorrectly, but the content of the email is generally benign, and I agree with her. It's simply about scheduling. However, there are references to doing rat transplants, and I think that's her concern under Rule 403 and under Rules 401 and 402. I don't see any risk of unfair prejudice or, or any risk of prejudice in general at all. Uh, I have said this before and I'll say it again. I don't see the reference to doing research with rats as having any risk at all of undue prejudice or any risk at all of any prejudice. And this email exchange, in my view, is probative of all the issues that I have articulated before throughout my ruling uh, today, uh, and it is therefore relevant to the issues of sanity and the culpable mental state elements of the offenses charged, and the probity value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. Next is an email exchange from February 13, 2012, base stamp number 5747. This is a, an email exchange between Cami Kennedy, the program administrator at the University of Colorado that I mentioned earlier, and, um, and the defendant, but the email from Ms. Kennedy is specifically sent to a bunch of students or multiple students, including the defendant. Uh, and then there's an attachment to the email, which is a summary report purportedly written by the defendant to the National Institutes of Health. And I believe there is a, a response by the defendant attaching uh, that summary. The summary references in vitro experiments on rat brains, uh, and I believe that it's the reference to these experiments on rat brains that the defense finds particularly problematic under Rules 401, 402, and 403. 
for the reasons I stated, I disagree. I don't see anything concerning with respect to research with rat brains. And in my view, the attachment um, appears to be something the defendant wrote about a very complicated scientific concept in February of 2012, so just some months before the shooting. Uh, and in my view, it is relevant for all the reasons that I have articulated throughout my ruling today, including because I think it is probative of his state of mind, ability to process information, mental and cognitive capacity, and by extension, the issues of sanity and the culpable mental state elements of the offenses charged. And the probity value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. Uh, number nine is an email exchange uh, from February 19, 2012, bait stamp number 5919. This is a short email exchange between the defendant and Cami Kennedy, uh, the program administrator at CU, regarding an issue with the defendant's billing statement. Um, Ms. Spengler argued that this has very limited relevance and that it's inflammatory because it shows that the state of Colorado was paying for the defendant's tuition. Uh, I'm not sure what's inflammatory about that. I, I disagree. I don't, I don't see anything inflammatory uh, from the fact that the school uh, had, had apparently given the defendant uh, some kind of scholarship or funds to pay for his schooling. Um, and in my view, the probative value, uh, actually, let me back up. She argued also that the probative value does not outweigh any of the potential inflammatory effect. Uh, and that's not the standard. She may have misspoken, but the standard is not whether the probative value outweighs any potential inflammatory effect. The standard under Rule 403 is whether the probative value is substantially outweighed by the risk for unfair prejudice. So uh, in this case, uh, the email exchange contains a reference to the defendant discussing financial issues related to his education. So it is probative um, of all the issues that I have articulated earlier, including uh, of his state of mind, ability to understand the world around him and to respond to questions and, and uh, appropriately. And it is also probative of his attachment to reality or whether he was attached or detached. He was attached to reality or detached from reality. Uh, so I find that it is relevant to the issues of sanity and the culpable mental state elements of the offenses charged and the probative value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. Uh, next, we have uh, an email exchange from February 23, 2012, base stamp number 6101. This is an email regarding a different exchange between the defendant and Dr. Freed, again about scheduling. Uh, this one references work that the lab is doing with rat brains and that is the concern that was expressed by Ms. Spengler, the mention of uh, work with, la with rat brains. I I'll just say again, I disagree that there is anything at all uh, that causes me concern about that. I don't see that as having any risk at all of undue prejudice or even prejudice at all. So, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, um, this exchange is relevant for the reasons that I have been articulating throughout my ruling. Uh, so I find that it is relevant to the issues of sanity and the culpable, culpable mental state elements of the offenses charged. And I find that the probative value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. The penultimate email exchange in this exhibit is an email exchange dated uh, November, th uh, excuse me, March 26, 2012, bait stamp number 6859. This is an email exchange between a defendant and a Mary Mock, M-A-U-C-K. I mentioned her name earlier. Um, in this email exchange, the defendant is requesting after hours and weekend batch access to the lab. Um, as I mentioned before, Ms. Spengler said that defense counsel is not are not familiar with Ms. Mock, and none of the experts have relied on this email or on her, uh, and that, that doesn't render this email exchange uh, irrelevant or inadmissible under Rule 403. As I mentioned, counsel can call Mary Mock to the stand if they wish. I will give them an opportunity to do that. And this email is relevant for all the reasons I have been articulating throughout my ruling. Uh, and so I find that it is relevant to the issues of sanity and the culpable mental state elements of the offenses charged. And I find that the probative value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. 
Finally, there is an email exchange dated May 16, 2012, bait stamp number 8587. This is an email exchange involving the defendant and Professor Freed and uh, Lee Young Mook, M-O-O-K. Uh, the defendant forwards his rotation PowerPoint presentation in this email exchange, or at least a draft of it. And it is unclear whether it is a draft or the final version of the PowerPoint presentation. Ms. Spengler argued that the jury has already seen a portion of the presentation and video and that, um, and that Dr. Freed has already testified and also that we do not know if this is the final draft of the presentation. Uh, in terms of Dr. Freed already testifying, I will, as I said, give the defense an opportunity to call him again if they wish. Uh, in terms of uh, the jury having seen a portion of this presentation and video, um, Ms. Spengler is right. The jury saw three short clips, video clips, of the final presentation that the defendant made. Uh, they were very short. I think they were a minute to two minutes each in length. Uh, and <coughs> Ms. Spengler is also right that we don't know if this is the final draft of the presentation or if this is a draft before the, that preceded the final draft. Um, but I nevertheless find that this email exchange, including the attachment, is relevant uh, because what we can reasonably infer from it is that this is something the defendant put together uh, around May of 2012. It is something he wrote uh, in May of 2012, which is only approximately two months before the shooting. Uh, this presentation goes to the defendant's ability to put together information in a manner that does not appear to be, um, in a manner that, uh, uh, that arguably does not appear to be disconnected from reality, that appears to be coherent, that appears to be logical. Uh, of course, the jury will have to assess that, uh, but it, it is relevant for those reasons. And this is within the time frame that uh, Dr. Metzner testified the defendant had already had um, I think um, he's uh, a trigger present in March in the Gmail chat. So this, this would be after that Gmail chat uh, between the defendant and his girlfriend. Uh, and, and so it's within the, the time frame that's uh, shortly before the shooting. It is generally relevant to the issues of sanity and the couple of mental state elements of the offenses charged. And in my view, the probative value of the evidence is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. I want to be clear again. My rulings should not be confused with saying and should not be interpreted as saying that these emails show that the defendant was sane at the time of the offenses charged. My ruling simply is that they are probative of the issues raised by the defense of insanity and they are probative of the culpable mental state elements required by the offenses charged. My ruling is that they are relevant, that they have some relevance to those issues, and that the probative value of the exhibit is not substantially outweighed by any of the dangers listed in Rule 403. So the defense can let me know when, uh, whenever, if it wishes to make the redactions that I have offered or whether it prefers not to make those redactions. But for all those reasons, the exhibit is admitted. <coughs> I need to step down for a moment, so I'm going to step down for uh, a few minutes, and then I'll, I'll take the bench again, and then we'll hopefully start with the jury at that time. The court will be in recess. Thank you.
Welcome back everyone, Amanda Zitzman here joining you alongside my colleagues Erica Tinsley and Brian Hernandez as we track the latest developments in the Aurora theater shooting trial. Now court is taking a break. We understand that a juror was late because of a power outage. She actually overslept, so the judge has taken a break now after making a ruling on some emails. So we want to go over that while we're in this break. Right off the bat, the judge basically ruled that some emails sent from the shooter's account will be admitted. Now, in assessing the shooter's sanity, the judge says it's important to look at all aspects of his life here at a time frame that is relevant to the trial. And he says these email emails are a part of that, that they can provide a way to understand the shooter's mental capacity. And he doesn't see a risk of prejudice in admitting those. And he also says that this should not be interpretive, uh, that it shows that he believes that he was sane at the time of the shooting rather they are just relevant to the issues at the trial. Now there are some emails that uh, will not be included but will be redacted and if you bear with me here I'm going to read through some of those for you now. So there was uh, an email that was written in relation to a speeding ticket um, that the shooter allegedly had gotten. He apparently asks um, how to get out of the ticket potentially by going to traffic school uh, in addition, there's another email about spending Thanksgiving with his peeps, um, and uh, they will exclude an email concerning the issue of two birth dates that the university had apparently had on file for home. So those are the ones that will either be uh, not admitted or redacted for the jury. So. Ultimately, it's up to the jury to decide, of course, the decision of sanity, despite the two state appointed psychiatrists that have given their opinion that the shooter was same at the time of the shooting back in 2012. So we are waiting to get some sound here from what has happened in court so far this morning on day 28. Erica, how are we going on that? Are we... All right, we are almost ready. All right, we're good. All right, let's play some of that for you now. The, uh, there are some global objections to exhibit P-TR-1227, and there, there are some specific objections to 12 particular emails. Uh, in terms of the global objections, there is a relevance objection, there is a Rule 403 objection, uh, and I'm going to address those uh, in a little bit. There is a hearsay objection, so let me address that objection first. Um, in terms of the hearsay objection, the objection is overruled to the extent that the emails in this exhibit contain statements by the defendant. Those statements are not hearsay. They are statements by a party opponent. To the extent that the emails contain statements, statements by someone else, they're not hearsay because they're not being introduced, introduced for the truth of the matter asserted. They're being introduced to place the defendant's statements in context so that the jury can understand the defendant's statements in context. And I'm happy to give a limiting instruction uh, along those lines. I'm making the same offer that I have made throughout the trial to the defense in terms of uh, giving the jury a limiting instruction with respect to these statements made by people other than the defendant uh, I disagree that a limiting instruction uh, will... All right, we want to cut into that. It appears that the judge has re-entered the courtroom, so let's go ahead and listen in. Outside the presence of the jury. The jury is here. Oh, the one juror is here now, and so they're ready to go. So please bring him in. Mr. Orman, if you would approach, please, so I can give you the exhibit back, exhibit P-TR-1227. And then uh, one of the breaks will address the potential redactions, okay? Thank you.
Please be seated, everyone. Good morning, members of the jury. I hate to do this to you because you just got here and I know you waited for us. One of you was running late today and so we decided that we would make use of the time uh, while we were waiting for that juror and uh, uh, the attorneys and I uh, then did some work that we had to do anyway outside your presence and it went a little longer and um, so I know that the juror who was late was here at about uh, 10 after 9 or so, but we went a little longer than that, and I appreciate your patience. I know that you just got here this morning, but I have been handed a note, and um, I, I need to take something up outside your presence again. So my apologies. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to send you back, uh, and then we'll come and get you when we're ready for you, okay? Thank you. Please remember all my advisements. They all apply during the break. Thank you. <clears throat> Please be seated, everyone. Uh, folks, I need to step down for two minutes, and so I'm going to do that for two minutes. Don't, don't go too far. Just a couple of minutes, okay? The court will be in recess for a couple of minutes. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. We are standing by for the Aurora Theater shooting trial to resume here on day 28. The judge actually came in, welcomed the jury, but then said he had received a note, had to step out of the courtroom for just a couple of minutes. So in the meantime, let's go over what happened so far today. The judge ruled that some emails from the shooter's account will be admitted while others will not be or will be redacted. Let's go to what he had to say earlier this morning.
The emails in question will allow the jury, and when I say the emails in question, I'm referring to the ones in P-TR-1227, will assist the jury uh, as the jury considers the defendant's mental state and mental capacity in this continuum or progression of time uh, between 2011 and 2012. And it's, uh, for example, Drs. Reed and Metzner uh, appear to me to have relied on the defendant's interactions with others, his communications with others, his behaviors, the organization of his speech and thinking, his mental processes and his mental capacity, and how any of that may have changed uh, to th in 2012 as compared to 2011 and before. And these emails would be examples of some of those things. Um, in any case, I agree with what Mr. Orman said uh, last week when he argued about this exhibit, and he said that uh, ultimately it is the jury that will make the decision on the issue of sanity, not Dr. Reed or Dr. Metzner or any other experts. So even if the experts had not relied on these exhibits or on these emails, it doesn't mean that they are irrelevant. They're not rendered irrelevant just because of that. But as I said, I believe that they have relied on, on um, some of these communications. They have relied on, on all the information that they have been provided. And certainly, it's my understanding that they've been provided um, emails that the defendant was sending and have specifically looked at the things that I've talked about, the defendant's uh, communications with others, interactions with others, the defendant's behaviors, organization of speech and thinking, the defendant's mental processes and the defendant's mental capacity and cognitive abilities and how they may have changed between 2011 and 2012. Uh, let me just say, by the way, that I understand that just because you're able to interact with others, to communicate with others, to process information, to respond to information logically, reasonably, coherently, and appropriately, etc., I get it. I get that that all does not necessarily mean that you're sane. I get that. And that's a point of defense that's been making throughout. But that also doesn't mean that any evidence of your cognitive capacity to interact with other people, to communicate with them, to process information, and to respond to information coherently, logically, reasonably, and appropriately, etc. And when I say etc., I'm referring to the other things that I have mentioned, the other activities that these emails deal with or are probative of, uh, or the other uh, aspects of the defendant that uh, these, the defendant's mental state that these emails are probative of, uh, it doesn't mean that they have no relevance to the issue of sanity. So yes, on the one hand, just because someone can communicate and interact with people and process information, uh, it doesn't mean that they're sane, but that also doesn't mean that the person's communications and interactions and evidence of his ability to process information and to respond to it appropriately and coherently is inadmissible or that it is irrelevant. And I think that the um, testimony of the two court-appointed experts, Drs. Reed and Metzner, show my point, or I think they, they corroborate the point that I just made. But as I said, the relevance of this exhibit exist independent of their opinions. Uh, so for all those reasons, I find that these emails are relevant. I also find that the probative value of these emails is not substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice uh, or by the danger of confuse, confusing the jury or uh, inviting the jury to speculate or by the unnecessary presentation of cumulative evidence. Uh, in terms of the specific objections, uh, let me run through the uh, 12 emails or email exchanges that were identified by Ms. Spengler. The first one is um, uh, email uh, August 23, 2011, number 1359, and the number refers to the bait stamp number. Uh, this is an email exchange between the defendant and his father, Robert Holmes. Uh, and then I think there was a, an argument that there is double hearsay because Mr. Holmes, Robert Holmes, that is, discusses statements by Chris Holmes, the defendant's sister. All right, you've been listening in to the judge's ruling that some emails from the shooter's account will be admitted in this trial. We understand the live feed is back up, so we'll toss it over to that. Um, 
I stopped the proceedings because one of the jurors handed my staff a note that my staff then handed to me uh, that uh, I knew we would have to discuss. And what I'm going to do is, doctor, I'm going to have you step down because we have to deal with this issue that doesn't concern your testimony. Thank you. Uh, this is a note that I have marked as question form number 173. Uh, it's from juror number 673, and it reads as follows. I I'm not sure if this is something you need to know, but I think the juror in seat 9, who is juror number A72, I just added who is juror number A72, uh, may or may not be reading the news on this case. She said it came up on her Facebook feed. She has said that they've tried to call a mistrial and also that the attorneys aren't allowed to have phones anymore. She said one of the attorneys posted on Twitter that he or she hoped the jury saw part of the video and the judge was mad. I don't know if this is information info I don't know if this info is true or not, and wasn't sure if you needed to know. Juror 673. So in light of that, I think what we have to do is, uh, or what I propose doing is bringing in Juror 673 first, uh, having me ask her more questions about uh, when this happened, where it happened, and who else was present. And then we proceed from there. Is that, uh, does that sound uh, sensible to the people? Yes, sir. To the defense? Yes, Your Honor. All right, let's bring in juror number 673, please. The records should reflect that juror number 673 is not present in the courtroom. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. How are you? We'll see after this. Okay. Thank you for your note. I appreciate you letting me know about this. You did the right thing. That's the first thing I wanted to do. I have some questions for you about this. Uh, when did this happen? Yesterday. At what time? What part of the day? It was either late into the lunch break or the afternoon break. I'm not sure. And it was a one-time event? Yes. And it sounds like it's the, you said that the juror in seat nine um, said some things that lead you to wonder whether she is reading the news or not. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so these are statements that you yourself heard juror number nine make? Yes. Do you know who else was present when she made those statements? Actually, before you tell me that, where where was this? In the juror assembly room on the, on the patio. On the patio? Mm -hmm. Okay. And how many, uh, in addition to you and in addition to her, what other jurors were present? There were two others. Two others? The one... Without, na without mentioning their names, because we don't want to mention their names, can you either tell me their juror numbers or their seat numbers, or can you describe them for me? Juror number eight, or in seat number eight. All the way at the top in the first row? Yes. And then third one over from here, so I don't know. Okay, so the third one over would be in seat number 19, and that would be juror number 412. And in juror number eight would be juror number 495. And do you know whether they heard the comments? I think so. I believe so. You believe so? What makes you think so? Were they close to the juror who uh, made the statements? Yes, we were all standing around in a circle. Did anyone else say anything else? No. Did anyone respond to um, the juror sitting in seat number nine, who is juror number A72? Uh, not anything more than 
uh, what, O or something like that. What was it? O. O. Just something to respond to a statement. Did they both do that or just one of them? I'm not sure. You're not sure? No. But you're, um, you think that they both would have been within a short enough distance that they would have heard this? Yes. Okay. All right. Anything else? No. No? Let me have you step out for just a moment, okay? Actually, let, let's uh, bring her back one more time, please. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. The records should reflect that your number 673 has returned again. Uh, did you take any action based on that uh, information that was said by that juror, juror number six, uh, juror number 872? No, I didn't say anything or do anything except for write that note this morning. Okay, and you didn't look anything up uh, on the internet or do any research or try to find out whether what she was saying was true or not? No. You took no action? No. Okay. Anything about what you heard that you think uh, affects your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in this trial? No. Um, as you sit here, are you still confident that you can be fair and impartial throughout this trial? Yes. And are, do you think you're going to feel um, um, curious about looking this, trying to find out if this information is true or not and that that's going to lead you to, to violate one of my rulings? No, sir. Honestly, I'm not curious at all. I just feel really bad. But, but. No, you should you should not feel bad at all. You've done nothing wrong. And, in fact, I appreciate you telling me about this. You did the right thing. Um, but uh, you, you think you'll be able to comply with all my rulings? Yes. And have you complied with all my advisements and admonishments so far? Yes. And, and you're confident that you'll be able to continue to do that? Yes. Okay. All right, let me have you step out for just a moment. Let me talk to the attorneys and then uh, we'll, come, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll come and get you in just a little bit. All right, we, we, it seems to me, based on what she's saying, and she comes across as very credible. I, I find her to be very credible. Uh, it, it seems to me that... Um, that the juror sitting in seat number nine, juror number A72, appears to have violated uh, one, if not more, one of my advisements. Uh, it also, I'm also concerned to some extent that uh, jurors 495 and 412 didn't say anything about it. Uh, it appears that they heard something and didn't say anything. That's concerning as well. So. The question is, what do we do at this point? So let's take juror number 673 first. Uh, is there any, are there any other questions that the prosecution is requesting that I ask juror number 673 at this time? The only question I can think of, Your Honor, would be to inquire as to whether the <laughs> note that she gave you contained the complete amount of information that was disclosed in this, I'll call it a conversation. I think that's a good question. Any other question? I think Your Honor covered the other questions I would have wanted when you brought her back in. All right. Mr. King, any other questions that you think would be appropriate for me to ask juror number 673 at this time? Judge, I'm requesting a brief recess at this point so that we can discuss this amongst ourselves and, and um, make a, have a thoughtful response. This is too important to rush through, frankly. I, I agree, and I'll give you some time, but in terms of just asking the question that Mr. Orman requested, do you have any problem with me doing that? 
I have no objection to asking that question, though. No. Okay, I will ask that question, and then I'll give you a recess, okay? All right, let's bring her back, please. The record should reflect that juror number 673 is back in the courtroom. Um, I have an additional question for you. Is the information that you provided in your note complete in terms of everything you heard from juror, uh, the juror sitting in seat number nine, juror number 872 yesterday? Can I look at it again? Yes, could you please give her the note back? It has my name on it now and the date, and I have marked it at, with a number, um, the question form number, okay. but you can ignore that, okay? Okay. And take your time reviewing it, and then let me know whether there's anything you need to add or change. Uh, it's... In terms of uh, the Twitter comment or whatever, um... She had said that one of the attorneys had posted onto Twitter that, um, did you see that part? I hope the jury saw that part of the video. And then I guess she had said that um, he, he or she, I'm not sure, got in trouble for that and said that they meant it as a text message, but that's as that's as far as it goes. Anything else? No. She did not identify the attorney? No. And she did not identify whether it was a he or she? No. Did she identify which side or which party? No. No? She did not identify whether it was a prosecution or a defense attorney? No. No? Okay. Any other information that you can remember? No. Does the additional information that you just provided change your answer in terms of whether you're still confident that you can be a fair and impartial juror in this trial? No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all? No. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to have you go back to the jury room, uh, but would you promise me that you will not discuss with any jurors anything about the note or anything about my questions or anything about the discussion that we've had here just now? Will you promise me that? Yes. Okay. Do not discuss it with any of the other jurors. You understand? I understand. Okay. And, and you're saying that the other two jurors were two jurors that you believe were present when, when these statements were made? They were. And th this was yesterday? Yes. I think, let me change it. I think the mistrial one was about a week ago. And who made that statement? Same one. I'm not sure though. I, I mean, the, the... And when was that made? during one of the breaks or lunch, I'm not. Last week? I think so. And do you remember where? Same place. Same place. And do you remember who was present? Same people. Same people. And do you remember what it is that she said? Um, just that they, I'm not sure who they, she was referring to we're trying to call a mistrial. I'm, I mean, I honestly can't expand because I don't know what's going on in any of it. I just can only tell you what I heard. And that's all I'm asking. And will you promise me that, again, you will not discuss this with any other juror? Yes. And will you promise me that you will not attempt to look any information uh, on, on the internet or through any means to try to find out whether any of this is accurate or not? 
Yes. Okay, and you haven't done that, right? No. So you don't know at this time whether what she has said is accurate or not? I have no idea. Okay. All right, let me have you step out again, okay? Thank you. Okay, the record should reflect that juror number uh, 673 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Um, I, I, you, Mr. King has asked for a break, and, and I said that I would give him a recess, and I'm going to do that. Uh, does anybody have, have an objection to me bringing the jury back in and just letting them know that there's something I need to talk to counsel about outside their presence, and then go over the advisements again to make sure that they're not talking to each other about the case or anything related to the case. We don't object to that, Your Honor. Mr. King? I don't have an objection to that, Your Honor. All right. Approximately how long do you think I um, should tell them? Half hour? I think a half hour would be sufficient, Your Honor. Sufficient. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's bring the jury back in, please. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury has joined us again. Welcome back, folks. Thank you for your patience this morning. Uh, sometimes during trials, as you know, there uh, I have to discuss things with the attorneys, uh, scheduling things, legal things, administrative things, uh, and... Um, and sometimes we have to take our time with things, and this is one of those. And so I wanted to bring you back in to tell you that there are some things I need to talk to the attorneys about outside your presence. And so I'm going to give you a longer break so that you're not just waiting, wondering what's, what's going on, okay? So we're going to take a longer break. Uh, since we're going to take a longer break, 
I brought you in so I can give you the advisements to make sure that you all remember them <laughs> and to make sure that you follow them. I know that you know them, but you have to follow them. Each and every one of these advisements is critical. And if even one of you violates a single advisement, you can create problems. So let me go through them again. And I appreciate your, 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 uh, your indulgence. Number one, please do not discuss any aspect of the case with each other through any means. You're free to talk with each other, but not about the case. Do not talk about anything related to the proceedings or anything related to the case. In addition to not being able to discuss the case with each other, you may not communicate about the case with anyone else through any means. That includes your spouse or significant other. All you can tell people is that you're on a jury in Arapahoe County and that we're anticipating that the trial will last until August or September. Number three, please do not talk with any witnesses, parties, or attorneys about anything, whether related to the case or not. Number four, to make sure that witnesses, parties, and attorneys do not talk to you, please make sure you always wear your juror badge and that it is visible to all those around you. Your juror badge will also reduce the risk that people will talk about the case in your presence. If you hear someone talking about the case, please remove yourself from that location immediately. And if despite your best efforts, you happen to overhear something about the case, let my staff know that right away. You're not allowed to hear anything about the case. And so if despite your best efforts, you happen to inadvertently hear something about the case, you need to let my staff know that you wanna to talk to me. Uh, don't tell my staff what it is you wanna talk about. Just say, hey, I need to talk to the judge. Uh, next is, please do not talk to any members of the media about anything. And when I say anything, I mean anything, not just things related to the case. Uh, next, you must not read, view, or listen to any news or media reports that may refer to the case. Because there is media coverage of this trial, you must be particularly vigilant while listening to the radio, watching TV, reading the newspaper, or using the internet. You're not allowed to get any information from an outside source, uh, whether it's the media or some other information. You cannot visit any locations mentioned in the case or conduct your own investigation outside the courtroom. That means that you cannot consult any treatises, dictionaries, books in relation to your jury service in this case. You cannot, and you cannot visit any locations that you may hear mentioned. You cannot start forming any opinions about the case. Uh, you must keep an open mind and you must be mindful of the fact that the defendant is entitled to the presumption of innocence and that presumption of innocence remains with them and must be given effect by the jury throughout the trial. Neither sympathy nor prejudice for the prosecution or the defendant may affect any of your decisions in this case. And remember that the attorneys have a job to do and sometimes they have to make objections or request bench conferences. Uh, that's part of their job. Don't hold it against them. If they do that, they're doing their job. Uh, and do not uh, read anything improper into any of my rulings in terms of, oh, the judge must like this side better or the judge must be going for that side. I'm neutral. I'm not for either side. I'm not going with either side. I'm just doing my best to apply the rules of evidence and all their applicable rules of law. All those advisements are extremely important. I know I said that to you the first day you were here and I repeated it three times and I did it for a reason. They are extremely important and I wanted to emphasize it to you. So you need to follow each and every single one of these advisements, all right? So with that, let's go ahead and give you a break for a half hour. I'm hoping that we can take a short lunch break uh, to make up for the lost time, but um, I wanted to let you know that we needed some time to work on some things outside your presence, uh, rather than just have you uh, there guessing what's going on, okay? So enjoy the break, but please follow all my advisements. Thank you. Cheryl? Yes.
The record should reflect that the jury has exited the courtroom. Please be seated, everyone. Uh, Mr. King, what I was going to propose is uh, planning to meet back here in about 15 minutes or so, and so we can chat. Would that give you enough time? And then we can decide where to go. Do you want 20 minutes? Judge, we, we can try. I thought the court was going to give us 30 minutes. Well, I'm giving the jury 30 minutes, but then we're going to have to figure out where we go from here. So can we, uh, why don't we go with 20 minutes then? 20 minutes. See if 20 minutes is enough. If it's not enough, then you can tell me that you need more, more time. But I'm hoping that 20 minutes will give you enough to tell me how you would like to proceed. And same with the people. And then we can figure out where to go. I, I will give this some thought as well. Mr. Orman. Your Honor, uh, this may help with uh, the court's research. I know counsel's going to do some research. I just looked on Westlaw very quickly. I did find one Colorado case. It's not exactly the same circumstance, obviously, but it seems to lay a framework for the court's inquiries in this, and it's People versus Moore, M-O-O-R-E, 321 Pacific 3rd, 510, from the Court of Appeals in 2010. Looks like it was reversed on other grounds by the Colorado Supreme Court, 321 Pacific 3rd, 5, um, actually I wrote the same citation down twice. Um, there's also an American Jurisprudence, uh, Section 1400, second edition, called Necessity or Discretion to Question Jurors, which seems to uh, bring in law from around the country on this question. Okay, thank you. Mr. King, uh, we'll see uh, you and the prosecutors back here in about 20. Okay, thank you. All right, the court will be in recess. Welcome back, everyone. So as court goes to recess, we want to go over these new developments. Obviously, some problems have arisen regarding members of the jury. Now, the juror, uh, juror number 673 in seat 16, a Caucasian woman, approximately 30 to 40 years of age, has made a complaint against another juror, and that's juror number 872 in seat 9. Juror 673 says juror 872 uh, may be reading news articles related to this trial. So the judge brought that juror in and uh, asked her some questions here. Uh, she said she believes uh, that this juror may have seen some items on Facebook related to this trial. And the irony of all of this is that the juror in seat nine at the face of these accusations is identified as someone that doesn't watch the news. So, for example, the juror says that this juror knew about mistrial motions, which were done while the jury was outside of the courtroom. She also heard that one of the attorneys had posted something on Twitter. She apparently made these statements according to this juror in front of other jurors. That is juror number 495 in seat eight. And that is someone that is described as, oh, it looks like this isn't working for us right now, but it was juror 495 in seat eight and juror 412 in seat 19, that they were present at the time that this other juror had made these statements. So the judge is also concerned that they have heard these statements, but didn't come forward with information that juror 673 was the only person that came forward, gave the note to the judge, and then the judge brought that juror in to make some statements. So we have a clip for you. We want to play that going over what uh, went down in the court. Uh, this is a note that I have marked as question form number 173. Uh, it's from juror number 673, and it reads as follows. I I'm not sure if this is something you need to know, but I think the juror in seat 9, who is juror number A72. I just added who is juror number A72. Uh, may or may not be reading the news on this case. She said it came up on her Facebook feed. She has said that they've tried to call a mistrial and also that the attorneys aren't allowed to have phones anymore. She said one of the attorneys posted on Twitter that he or she hoped the jury saw part of the video and the judge was mad. I don't know if this is information info. I don't know if this info is true or not and wasn't sure if you needed to know. Juror 673. So in light of that, I think what we have to do is, uh, or what I propose doing is bringing in juror 673 first, uh, having me ask her more questions about uh, when this happened, 
where it happened, and who else was present. And then we proceed from there. Is that, uh, does that sound uh, sensible to the people? Yes, sir. To the defense? Yes, Your Honor. All right, let's bring in juror number 673, please. Records to reflect that juror number 673 is not present in the courtroom. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. How are you? We'll see after this. Okay. Thank you for your note. I appreciate you letting me know about this. You did the right thing. That's the first thing I wanted to do. I have some questions for you about this. Uh, when did this happen? Yesterday. At what time? What part of the day? It was either late into, into the lunch break or the afternoon break. I'm not sure. And it was a one-time event? Yes. And it sounds like it's the you said that the juror in seat nine um, said some things that lead you to wonder whether she is reading the news or not. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so these are statements that you yourself heard juror number nine make? Yes. Do you know who else was present when she made those statements? Actually, before you tell me that, where where was this? In the juror assembly room on the, on the patio. On the patio? Mm -hmm. Okay. And how many, uh, in addition to you and in addition to her, what other jurors were present? There were two others. Two others? Without, the, without mentioning their names, because we don't want to mention their names, can you either tell me their juror numbers or their seat numbers, or can you describe them for me? Juror number eight, or in seat number eight. All the way at the top in the first row? Yes. And then third one over from here, so I don't know. Okay, so the third one over would be in seat number 19, and that would be juror number 412. And in juror number 8 would be juror number 495. And do you know whether they heard the comments? I think so. I believe so. You believe so? What makes you think so? Were they close to the juror who uh, made the statements? Yes, we were all standing around in a circle. Did anyone else say anything else? No. Did anyone respond to um, the juror sitting in seat number nine, who is juror number A72? Uh, not anything more than uh, O or something like that. What was it? Oh. Oh. Just something to respond to a statement. Did they both do that or just one of them? I'm not sure. You're not sure? No. But you're, um, you think that they both would have been within a short enough distance that they would have heard this? Yes. Okay. All right. Anything else? No. No? Let me have you step out for just a moment, okay? Actually, let, let's uh, bring her back one more time, please. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. The record should reflect that juror number 673 has returned again. Uh, did you take any action based on that uh, information that was said by that juror, juror number six, uh, juror number A72? No, I didn't say anything or do anything except for write that note this morning. Okay. 
and you didn't look anything up uh, on the internet or do any research or try to find out whether what she was saying was true or not? No. You took no action? No. Okay. Anything about what you heard that you think uh, affects your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in this trial? No. Um, as you sit here, are you still confident that you can be fair and impartial throughout this trial? Yes. And are, do you think you're going to feel um, um, curious about looking this, trying to find out if this information is true or not, and that that's going to lead you to, to violate one of my rulings? No, sir. Honestly, I'm not curious at all. I just feel really bad. But, but. You, know, you should you should not feel bad at all. You've done nothing wrong, and. In fact, I appreciate you telling me about this. You did the right thing. Um, but uh, you, you think you'll be able to comply with all my rulings? Yes. And have you complied with all my advisements and admonishments so far? Yes. And, and you're confident that you'll be able to continue to do that? Yes. Okay. All right. Let me have you step out for just a moment. Let me talk to the attorneys, and then I will come, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll come and get you in just a little bit. All right, we, we, it seems to me, based on what she's saying, and she comes across as very credible. I, I find her to be very credible. Uh, it, it seems to me that, um, that the juror sitting in seat number nine, juror number A72, appears to have violated uh, one, if not more, one of my advisements. Uh, it also, I'm also concerned to some extent that uh, jurors 495 and 412 didn't say anything about it. Uh, it appears that they heard something and didn't say anything. That's concerning as well. So the question is, what do we do at this point? So let's take juror number 673 first. Uh, is there any, are there any other questions that the prosecution is requesting that I ask juror number 673 at this time? The only question I can think of, Your Honor, would be to inquire as to whether the note that she gave you contained the complete amount of information that was disclosed in this, I'll call it a conversation. I think that's a good question. Any other question? I think Your Honor covered the other questions I would have wanted when you brought her back in. All right. Mr. King, any other questions that you think would be appropriate for me to ask juror number 673 at this time? Judge, I'm requesting a brief recess at this point so that we can discuss this amongst ourselves and, and um, make a, have a thoughtful response. This is too important to rush through, frankly. I, I agree, and I'll give you some time, but in terms of just asking the question that Mr. Orman requested, do you have any problem with me doing that? I have no objection to asking that question, though. No. Okay, I will ask that question, and then I'll give you a recess, okay? All right, let's bring her back, please. The record should reflect that juror number 673 is back in the courtroom. Um, I have an additional question for you. Is the information that you provided in your note complete in terms of everything you heard from juror, uh, the juror sitting in seat number 9, juror number 872 yesterday? Can I look at it again? Yes. Could you please give her the note back? It has my name on it now and the date, and I have marked it at, with a number, um, the question form number. Okay. But you can ignore that, okay? Okay. And take your time reviewing it, and then let me know whether there's anything you need to add or change. Uh, it's... In terms of uh, the Twitter comment or whatever... Um, she had said that one of the attorneys had posted onto Twitter that, um, did you see that part? I hope the jury saw that part of the video. And then I guess she had said that, um, he, he or she, I'm not sure got in trouble for that and said that they meant it as a text message but that's as that's as far as it goes
Anything else? No. She did not identify the attorney? No. And she did not identify whether it was a he or she? No. Did she identify which side or which party? No. No? She did not identify whether it was a prosecution or defense attorney? No. No? Okay. Any other information that you can remember? No. Does the additional information that you just provided change your answer in terms of whether you're still confident that you can be a fair and impartial juror in this trial? No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all? No. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to have you go back to the jury room, uh, but would you promise me that you will not discuss with any jurors anything about the note or anything about my questions or anything about the discussion that we've had here just now? Will you promise me that? Yes. Okay. Do not discuss it with any of the other jurors. Do you understand? I understand. Okay. And, and you're saying that the other two jurors were two jurors that you believe were present when, when these statements were made? They were. And th this was yesterday? Yes. I think, let me change it. I think the mistrial one was about a week ago. And who made that statement? Same one. I'm not sure, though. I, I mean, the, the... And when was that made? During one of the breaks or lunch? I'm not. Last week? I think so. And do you remember where? Same place. Same place. And do you remember who was present? Same people. Same people. And do you remember what it is that she said? Um, just that they, I'm not sure who they, she was referring to. We're trying to call a mistrial. I'm, I mean, I honestly can't expand because I don't know what's going on in any of it. I just can only tell you what I heard. And that's all I'm asking. And will you promise me that, again, you will not discuss this with any other juror? Yes. And will you promise me that you will not attempt to look any information uh, on, on the Internet or through any means to try to find out whether any of this is accurate or not? Yes. Okay. And you haven't done that, right? No. So you don't know at this time whether what she has said is accurate or not? I have no idea. Okay. All right. Let me have you step out again, okay? Thank you. Okay. The record should reflect that juror number uh, 673 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Um, I, I, you, Mr. King has asked for a break, and, and I said that I would give him a recess, and I'm going to do that. Uh, does anybody have, have an objection to me bringing the jury back in and just letting them know that there's something I need to talk to counsel about outside their presence, and then go over the advisements again to make sure that they're not talking to each other about the case or anything related to the case? We don't object to that, Your Honor. Mr. King? I don't have an objection to that, Your Honor. All right. Approximately how long do you think I... Um, should tell them a half hour? I think a half hour would be sufficient, Your Honor. Sufficient? Okay. Thank you. All right, let's bring the jury back in, please. And welcome back. Court is still in recess right now, so we want to review all of this obviously some pretty big developments here the juror in seat 16 a woman described in her 30s and 40s has come forward with information about the juror in seat 9 she says that uh, the juror in seat 9 someone that is identified as a non-news watcher 
may have been looking at articles related to this trial. For example, the juror made uh, statements about mistrial motions, which were done while the jury was outside of the courtroom. Additionally, the juror knew the text of an accidental tweet by an attorney related to the trial, after which the judge had banned texting and the use of social media by the attorneys in the courtroom. Now, juror 16 says two other jurors were present during all of this. The juror in seat, um, seat eight, and that is someone that is a Caucasian woman about 30 years old. In addition to the juror in seat 19, these are two that may have witnessed um, juror nine making these statements, but they also did not come forward with information to the courtroom. So the judge is pretty concerned about that as well. So pretty big developments here. Uh, we also want to mention that uh, the judge did grant a recess for 20 minutes to determine where to go from here. We actually have a tweet um, back from the attorney uh, statement that the juror um, had said that she had seen an accidental tweet by the attorney that had sent it out. We want to play that for you now. Ms. Brady. Yes, Your Honor. Um, as the court's aware, the court issued an order to the parties that the parties are not to tweet via Twitter uh, during the trial in court. And it came to our attention last night that Mr. Brockler issued a tweet at 4.51 p.m., which would have been during the cross-examination of Dr. Reed. If I can approach, I'd like to give the court a copy of that tweet. Yes, have you shown it to Mr. Brockler? I'll give him a copy. Okay. If we could mark that as a court's exhibit, please. Yes. What number are we up to? 46. 46, thank you. And Your Honor, uh, you know, I assume the court issued this order uh, for a good reason, so I will leave it up to the court's discretion uh, what sanction to impose for this violation. Um, I would state, though, that if the prosecution is seeking the execution of a man, uh, perhaps the district attorney should pay attention to the cross-examination of the mental health expert instead of chatting on social media. Do you, do you want to read for the record what the message or the tweet states? It states, on June 4th, uh, 2015, at 4.51 p.m., I agree on the video. I hope the jury thinks so, too. All right, Mr. Brockler. Your Honor, first, um, I uh, apologize for how this happened, but I want to explain it was not, I was not on social media at the time. Um, I, I'm not sure how it all connects in, but I got a, a text. It was from a direct message, and this has happened to me accidentally before. And someone had just simply made a comment that I thought I was replying to on text. And as soon as we left court, um, Mr. Orman told me, hey, that reply went out all over Twitter. And then I quickly deleted it, and it doesn't exist anymore. I think it was on there for less than 20 minutes. Having said that, um, and again, it was not, I was not attempting to be on social media or do anything on social media, and I haven't violated the court's order um, since it came up. Um, but having said that, the steps that I've taken are to turn off my phones and just instruct people that if I need to do any business while I'm in court that they would let me know through other means. Um, and Judge, it's, a, it's an embarrassing mistake, but one that I think I corrected quickly and, and have put myself in a position to not violate again, and I'm sorry. Ms. Brady. Judge, I would note that it, before the correction, it was retweeted at least three times. We have found at least three times that that tweet went out from other people. So as the court knows, once it gets out there, um, it spreads exponentially, and um, I, I just think, you know, Dr. Reed was a pretty important witness, and uh, the prosecution should be paying attention to the cross-examination of the witness. And that's the problem with tweeting something, is that you don't know who's going to retweet it, and even if you tweet it, uh, or you think you're only tweeting it to one person, that person can then retweet it to everyone else. I did call the parties, uh, the attorneys, I should say, to the bench, 
Uh, it was about four weeks ago. I'm just estimating. And I specifically said I don't want anyone uh, sending tweets from the courtroom about anything. Um, but obviously much less about the case. Uh, although I didn't specify about the case, I just said about anything. And I think I explained to counsel at the bench that I have prohibited the media from tweeting from the courtroom. And I didn't think it was uh, appropriate then for attorneys to be doing it, especially when proceedings are ongoing. Uh, we're not even talking about during breaks, but during actual court proceedings, there's nothing that can't wait until a break or until after court to be tweeted. Uh, and sometimes people um, develop habits and um, sometimes they tweet things. Uh, I don't have any reason to disbelieve what Mr. Brockler is saying, and so I'm going to take him on his word that he didn't intend to uh, send this as a, uh, on Twitter and that he thought it was a text and that this was an inadvertent mistake. Uh, but, and I appreciate him apologizing to the court, uh, but even texting, uh, it seems to me it's something that really should wait until um, the proceedings are not ongoing. Uh, I don't know why uh, email or text can't wait until a break, especially when it's your witness who's testifying and he's being cross-examined. So um, the, the, uh, I'm going to prohibit the parties from texting from the courtroom during proceedings. Uh, while proceedings are ongoing, counsel should not text. So uh, they should be paying attention to what's happening here. Nobody should be texting. Nobody should be emailing. Nobody should be reading any electronic communications or sending electronic communications. If you're bored, and I realize that there are five attorneys on each side, and sometimes attorneys don't have uh, any witnesses to question, um, if you're bored um, and don't want to pay attention to the proceedings, then you're welcome to leave. You don't have to be here. I don't need five attorneys on each side. I think I've, I've uh, talked about this before. I don't know that you need five attorneys on each side. So if there are attorneys who feel bored, then you don't have to be here. You're welcome to leave. But I think out of respect for the court, uh, when you're in here, you should not be texting or tweeting or doing anything like that. You should be paying attention to what's happening here. So I'm not going to take any action at this time. No action has been requested of the court. Um, Ms. Brady wanted to bring it to the court's attention. We've marked the uh, uh, communication as an exhibit, as a court exhibit, uh, and so it has been marked. Uh, I have accepted Mr. Brockler's apology, and I appreciate his candor, but uh, let's avoid it from here on out. All right? Yes, Ms. Tish McGuire. Your Honor, I was just going to ask for an exception, both for the defense and the prosecution, for the sole purpose of just getting witnesses outside the courtroom, um, just because some of the advocates that are bringing witnesses here only have access to texting on a cell phone. I just wanted to ask for that one exception. That's fine. Thank you, Your Honor. If it's related to that, uh, I understand, uh, and I, I get that there are a lot of witnesses in this trial. I get that the magnitude of this case requires a lot of uh, logistical um, arrangements and planning and so if it's related to that and you have to email someone or text someone and it's related to scheduling or related to witnesses or related to something you need I understand that but that shouldn't take very much time and it shouldn't be with uh, a whole lot of frequency so but if you're just texting or emailing about uh, what you think or uh, what's going on or other things that are unrelated to the case, um, that's different. And I, I understand Mr. Bruckler is the elected district attorney of this judicial district. I get it. I'm the chief judge of this judicial district. But, you know, I managed to stay off email uh, and, and text, certainly text. I don't even have my phone here with me on the bench. So uh, if I can stay off of um, electronic communications for the most part, uh, then so can you, so can everybody here. Uh, again, there are exceptions. There may be situations where for logistical reasons or scheduling reasons or reasons related to witnesses or an emergency, you need to do that. And I, I've done that a couple of times, but uh, it, is, it has to be rare, extremely rare. So, okay. May I supplement the record one thing? Yes. Uh, and I did apologize to the court, but I think in light of what the court has said too, I probably owe Mr. King an apology too, and I meant no disrespect, Dan, in doing that, and I apologize to you. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure Mr. King appreciates that.
So again, juror 16 has come forward and said the juror in C9 knew about this aspect of the trial here when the DA was scolded for tweeting during the shooting trial. District Attorney George Brockler was reprimanded by the judge for tweeting about the trial during the court proceedings in Aurora. Now we also know that the juror in C9 is also accused of making statements about mistrial motions which were done while the jury was outside of the courtroom. The defense had argued in one of those cases that playing the video interview with Dr. William Reed was a violation of the shooter's rights. The judge turned that down and said that the video will be played. As you know, it was played last week in the courtroom. Now, the juror in seat 16 says two other jurors were present during all of this. The juror in seat 8 in addition to the juror in seat 19. And they also didn't mention this to the court, for which the judge expressed some obvious concerns. The judge said the juror in seat 16 does seem credible in all of this. He granted a recess for about 20 minutes. We are still waiting for court to get back in session at this point. Now, in an unofficial poll on our online live chat room, more than 90% of you said that you believe the juror in seat nine should be released if this is in fact confirmed. Should the other two jurors that may have witnessed this and didn't come forward be released? 70% of you said you thought that to be the case. Now, we want to go back to the beginning of all of this big developments in the courtroom. Uh, when the judge was uh, asking the juror that was making these statements questions. We'll play that clip for you now. Thank you for coming back. The record should reflect that juror number 673 has returned again. Uh, did you take any action based on that uh, information that was said by that juror, juror number six, uh, juror number 872? No, I didn't say anything or do anything except for write that note this morning. Okay. And you didn't look anything up uh, on the internet or do any research or try to find out whether what she was saying was true or not? No. You took no action? No. Okay. Anything about what you heard that you think uh, affects your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in this trial? No. Um, as you sit here, are you still confident that you can be fair and impartial throughout this trial? Yes. And are, do you think you're going to feel um, um, curious about looking this, trying to find out if this information is true or not, and that that's going to lead you to, to violate one of my rulings? No, sir. Honestly, I'm not curious at all. I just feel really bad. But, but. You, know, you should you should not feel bad at all. You've done nothing wrong. And, in fact, I appreciate you telling me about this. You did the right thing. Um, but... Uh, you, you think you'll be able to comply with all my rulings? Yes. And have you complied with all my advisements and admonishments so far? Yes. And, and you're confident that you'll be able to continue to do that? Yes. Okay. All right. Let me have you step out for just a moment. Let me talk to the attorneys, and then uh, we'll, come, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll come and get you in just a little bit. All right, we, we, it seems to me, based on what she's saying, and she comes across as very credible. I, I find her to be very credible. Uh, it, it seems to me that, um, that the juror sitting in seat number nine, juror number A72, appears to have violated uh, one, if not more, one of my advisements. Uh, it also, I'm also concerned to some extent that uh, jurors 495 and 412 didn't say anything about it. Uh, it appears that they heard something and didn't say anything. That's concerning as well. So the question is, what do we do at this point? So let's take juror number 673 first. Uh, is there any, are there any other questions that the prosecution is requesting that I ask juror number 673 at this time? The only question I can think of, Your Honor, would be to inquire as to whether the note that she gave you contained the complete amount of information that was disclosed in this, I'll call it a conversation. I think that's a good question. Any other question? I think Your Honor covered the other questions I would have wanted when you brought her back in. All right. Mr. King, any other questions that you think would be appropriate for me to ask juror number 673 at this time? 
Judge, I'm requesting a brief recess at this point so that we can discuss this amongst ourselves and, and um, make a, have a thoughtful response. This is too important to rush through, frankly. I, I agree, and I'll give you some time, but in terms of just asking the question that Mr. Orman requested, do you have any problem with me doing that? I have no objection to asking that question, no. Okay, I will ask that question, and then I'll give you a recess, okay? All right, let's bring her back, please. The record should reflect that juror number 673 is back in the courtroom. Um, I have an additional question for you. Is the information that you provided in your note complete in terms of everything you heard from juror, uh, the juror sitting in seat number nine, juror number 872 yesterday? Can I look at it again? Yes, could you please give her the note back? It has my name on it now and the date, and I have marked it at, with a number, um, the question form number, okay. but you can ignore that, okay? Okay. And take your time reviewing it, and then let me know whether there's anything you need to add or change. Uh, it's... In terms of uh, the Twitter comment or whatever, um... She had said that one of the attorneys had posted onto Twitter that, um, did you see that part? I hope the jury saw that part of the video. And then I guess she had said that um, he, he or she, I'm not sure, got in trouble for that and said that they meant it as a text message, but that says... That's as far as it goes. Anything else? No. She did not identify the attorney? No. And she did not identify whether it was a he or she? No. Did she identify which side or which party? No. No? She did not identify whether it was a prosecution or defense attorney? No. No? Okay. Any other information that you can remember? No. Does the additional information that you just provided change your answer in terms of whether you're still confident that you can be a fair and impartial juror in this trial? No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all? No. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to have you go back to the jury room, uh, but would you promise me that you will not discuss with any jurors anything about the note or anything about my questions or anything about the discussion that we've had here just now? Will you promise me that? Yes. Okay. Do not discuss it with any of the other jurors. Do you understand? I understand. Okay. And, and you're saying that the other two jurors were two jurors that you believe were present when, when these statements were made? They were. And th this was yesterday? Yes. I think, let me change it. I think the mistrial one was about a week ago. And who made that statement? Same one. I'm not sure, though. I, I mean, the, the... And when was that made? During one of the breaks or lunch, I'm not... Last week? I think so. And do you remember where? Same place. Same place. And do you remember who was present? Same people. Same people. And do you remember what it is that she said? Um, just that they, I'm not sure who they, she was referring to. We're trying to call a mistrial. I'm, I mean, I honestly can't expand because I don't know what's going on in any of it. I just can only tell you what I heard. And that's all I'm asking. And will you promise me that, again, you will not discuss this with any other juror? Yes. And will you promise me that you will not attempt to look any information uh, on, on the Internet or through any means to try to find out whether any of this is accurate or not? 
Yes. Okay, and you haven't done that, right? No. So you don't know at this time whether what she has said is accurate or not? I have no idea. Okay. All right, let me have you step out again, okay? Thank you. Okay, the record should reflect that juror number uh, 673 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Um, I, I, you, Mr. King has asked for a break, and, and I said that I would give him a recess, and I'm going to do that. Uh, does anybody have, have an objection to me bringing the jury back in and just letting them know that there's something I need to talk to counsel about outside their presence, and then go over the advisements again to make sure that they're not talking to each other about the case or anything related to the case. We don't object to that, Your Honor. Mr. King? I don't have an objection to that, Your Honor. All right. Approximately how long do you think I um, should tell them? A half hour? I think a half hour would be sufficient, Your Honor. Sufficient. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's bring the jury back in, please. And I want to bring in my colleague, Marshall Zellinger. He's been following this trial from the beginning. Marshall, what are the options here? Obviously, some pretty serious allegations. Well, I, this is uh, we've sp spoke off uh, on the phone with uh, Seven News Legal Analyst Dan Recht. I don't know why that was so hard to get out. Um, there's multiple options here. One would be you do nothing, which I don't think is really an option right now. You could start dismissing individual jurors, and right now we know there are four impacted in this, one who's sharing information, two others who heard the information and didn't say anything, and this juror who, who turned everyone in, um, and then all the way to a mistrial. And I, I, listen, we've, we've heard two other mistrial requests for less than this so far, so I guess those would be the three options, and then, and then Dan Recht warns us that no matter what happens, this is going to be a huge portion of any potential appeal. So no matter, so you look at it like two columns. One is what do we do? It's like choose your own adventure. What do we do here? And how is that going to impact what happens in the appeal? Right. So clearly they wanted to take a half hour and it's been 45 minutes. Long time. The Both parties probably looking through case law to find examples of something like this happening and court that have already ruled on this and the judge probably doing the exact same thing because he's been very accurate and very detailed of how he's made his rulings so that if this ever goes to appeal there is no question as to what his decision and why he made that decision so did the legal analyst give any kind of perspective as to what was more likely be that a mistrial or removing one or all of these jurors no but I from from what we've observed and Erica and Brian if, if you want to tell me differently this if, if we've had two other mistrial requests uh, this would I mean we're lay people and we think oh wow this is clearly a reason to ask for a mistrial so I mean that that to me seems like what the defense start big and come backwards I guess defense can ask for the mistrial and then if they're denied the mistrial say okay well we can't continue this way, so let's get rid of these specific jurors. And I, I don't know if you heard it in the judge's voice when he, when he found out there, he, well, he was disappointed clearly that two right. other jurors knew about this and didn't come forward. But I don't know if you heard, I, I mean, I, I kind of heard a, something like that when she revealed this juror that was telling the judge all this, that their, the mistrial reference was actually from last week and not now. So. The judge is baffled by this, and I think that was a, an audible tone of, oh boy. So she's coming forward now. Why didn't she come forward then? That also leaves her role in all this in question. Right, and but as the judge said, he does not fault her for anything. Mm -hmm. She did the right thing. She should right. not be nervous. There was a little contradictory, and we were hearing back in the replay, where first he did ask her, did this all happen yesterday? And she said yes. And then later in the questioning, it, it seemed like the, the question of the mistrial um, that she knew about or that she, this other juror thinks they know about seemed to be from last week. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's funny, every day they spend, if you add it together, the judge probably gives those admonitions for 10, 15 minutes total over the course of saying it every break. Mm -hmm. And here we have a juror who not only didn't listen perhaps, but flauntly, or I don't know what that word is, uh, but, but flaunted it and, uh, and, and talked with other people about stuff that they shouldn't even know about and yeah. then these jurors didn't do anything until today so it was well, the interesting thing about the juror in question too is she is described as someone that doesn't watch the news right and 
it, you know, in one of the earlier weeks, I think we were talking with Rick Kornfeld, one of the legal analysts, about a previous case in Grand Junction where a juror today, after five years, is now being, has charges brought against them because they either lied or didn't give accurate information on their juror questionnaire. Mm -hmm. And so here you may have a juror who on, in voir dire said, I don't watch, generally watch the news, and now they do. I don't know if that would be considered, you Did know. you talk to the legal analyst about that? Is that a possibility in this case? No, but we can bring that up. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, would you, this, this could go back and forth. Do you consider Twitter news? Or is True. that just a social media outlet? And so I don't know how in depth with that juror they got into, mm -hmm. well, what do you consider news? Do you consider that what you see on TV at five, six, and 10? Do you consider it cable news or do you consider it Facebook and well, Twitter? Well, and this is the second problem with social media in this case. You had the district attorney accidentally tweeting earlier, the judge reprimanded him for that, and now you have a juror that may have gone on Facebook and gotten information. Obviously, social media not uh, helping in this trial. And if we take a, a complete step back, it, forget that what this juror may know and that uh, other jurors now may know that, the fact that a group of jurors are sitting during a recess talking about the case is like the ultimate thing that they are told not to do. The judge is very specific and when we were in er late April and early May and it was bad weather and the Rockies weren't doing too well, he would make jokes, talk about the snow, talk about the Rockies, okay maybe not the Rockies, talk about the, you know, he would, he doesn't want anybody talking about the case because you don't want that temptation to do exactly what we're dealing with right now. and. You know, this is where it would be great if I had a law background where I could, hey, I'm gonna cite you this case from 2005, and that's probably what these attorneys are doing. They're trying to find that case that says, this happened 10 years ago, and here's what that judge did, so now you have to do the same thing. Yeah, the um, defense did bring up Colorado, um, the people versus Moore. I did want to look that up, too. Um, but I, wasn't, I didn't have time to look up the details of that case. Let's see if I can find that. Well, while he's looking that up, we can go into our unofficial poll uh, in our live chat room. More than 90% of you said that you believe the jury, in, a juror, excuse me, in seat nine should be released if this is confirmed. We also asked about the two other jurors that may have been present during all of this and didn't come forward. And 70% of you in our chat room um, have said that you think that they should be removed as well. This may take longer than I thought. Okay. That's all right. So. We're at 50 minutes now, and the judge has been pretty darn good with his uh, timing. And mm -hmm. we've checked our feeds, just so you know, we're not, uh, we're not miss you guys aren't missing anything. We've, we've checked around, our feed is good, they're still on that slate. Uh, this is a pivotal moment in this case, because I mean, the, the prosecution has one more week. This mm -hmm. is the, this week and one more week, and then the defense was gonna go for two weeks, and then it was gonna be in the jury's hands. And if we talk, the idea of a potential mistrial. Mm -hmm. You've just gone through the bulk of your evidence, emotional testimony, a doctor who was flown in and had to give six days of his testimony after we watched 22 hours of video. You, that could all have to happen again. Yeah. In essence, and all because I don't know what I would do as a juror. It's unfair given what we do for a living. I don't think I could serve on a jury like this and avoid information but Challenging. all of these jurors had the opportunity to tell the attorneys and the judge through individual voir dire and group voir dire and even on their questionnaire they all had the opportunity to tell the judge I, I can't avoid this or this is a hardship because I I can't get off Twitter on a daily basis so these these people made a promise basically that they could do this mm -hmm. and so it's I'm not trying to call it out any jurors because it's a very difficult thing but it's just you know I, it, this is tough so right now, could the judge be talking to the other jurors involved in this and kind of gathering no. the information or everything, not at all? Everything has to happen in, in open court. And mm -hmm. that's interesting too. So, so far we've only heard from the one juror who's making the accusations. What's next? Is it the other juror who was saying everything? Is it the two jurors who we haven't revealed, uh, who didn't reveal the information to the judge? Uh, everything that happens has to happen in open court. Uh, with the judge hearing from both sides. It's basically, the judge can't do anything on his own as he, f he first has to ask, and you heard this at the beginning, what do you want me to do? Would, what if I brought this juror in first and we ask her cl to clarify her note? How about that? And then both sides, yes, let's do that. Um, so the judge kind of prompts both sides, but he can't do anything on his own. He's, he's researching case law mm -hmm. so that whatever decision he has to make, he can say, 
I'm making this decision, and this isn't the first time any judge has had to make this decision, and I'm citing this case as for why I'm making the decision. Right, right. So let's bring it back to the beginning for those of you that are just joining us. Um, court is still in recess right now. We've had some major developments regarding the jury. The juror in seat 16 has said the juror in seat 9, someone that's identified as a non-news watcher, may have been looking at articles related to this trial on Facebook. Um, the juror in seat 9 also accused of making statements about mistrial motions, which were done while the jury was outside of the courtroom. Um, and additionally, the juror knew the text of an accidental tweet that was sent out by the DA related to this trial, after which the judge had banned texting and social media from attorneys inside of the courtroom. So big developments here could lead to a mistrial, could lead to the removal of some of these jurors, and we are just waiting for court to get back in session. It was supposed to be a 20 minute recess. And nothing has happened today in terms of testimony. The, the day started with a late juror and uh, for about 45 minutes or so, the both sides went over emails that need to be mm -hmm. redacted or not redacted. And then there was one moment where we discovered that the defendant's sister is in court and she was not supposed to be sitting in court um, because she's not part of the list of people that um, are excluded from the uh, uh, sequestration list of people who are allowed to be in court while their testimony is going on. So that started the day. Mm -hmm. Then the juror finally got there. All the jurors came in and as soon as the jurors got there, um, I guess one of them had handed the bailiff a note, gave it to the judge, and as soon as they sat down, the judge said, I hate to do this to you, but there's many times we have to do stuff outside your presence, and I was just handed a note, and I need to ask you guys to leave again. Right. And so there's been nothing done so far except what we're talking about right now. Well, it, is court back in session now? or? All right, we will go ahead and take a short break. We'll uh, assess some of the information that we have. We've talked to a legal analyst, trying to go over all of that for you guys, so we'll take a break. S stick around with us.
All right, welcome back. Amanda Zitzman along with my colleague Marshall Zellinger. Court is still in recess going on an hour now. Yeah, and this is unusual because the judge said he gave the jury half an hour, which meant the attorneys would have 20 minutes, mm -hmm. possibly half an hour, and we're at 11.25 Denver time, and that, was supposed, that started at about 10.25 Denver time. So. Right, right. So obviously the background of all of this, a juror has come forward claiming another juror may have re read uh, news articles about this trial on Facebook and that two other jurors may have been present during all of that. And because this is un unanticipated and unexpected, we don't necessarily want to keep rambling or replaying you know, other sound that is not relevant to what's going on. So we're going to replay one more time what brought us to this point and hopefully we'll be able to cut it off and take you into the live courtroom again we've checked our feed nothing's wrong with the feed nothing's happening in court but again this is as soon as the jurors entered the courtroom this morning this is a note handed to the bailiff then given to the judge and this is why we're in this recess and why there is a dilemma with up to four jurors in the Aurora Theater shooting trial jury panel Uh, this is a note that I have marked as question form number 173. Uh, it's from juror number 673, and it reads as follows. I I'm not sure if this is something you need to know, but I think the juror in seat 9, who is juror number A72. I just added who is juror number A72. Uh, may or may not be reading the news on this case. She said it came up on her Facebook feed. She has said that they've tried to call a mistrial and also that the attorneys aren't allowed to have phones anymore. She said one of the attorneys posted on Twitter that he or she hoped the jury saw part of the video and the judge was mad. I don't know if this is information info. I don't know if this info is true or not and wasn't sure if you needed to know. Juror 673. So in light of that, I think what we have to do is, uh, or what I propose doing is bringing in juror 673 first, uh, having me ask her more questions about uh, when this happened, where it happened, and who else was present and then we proceed from there. Is that, uh, does that sound uh, sensible to the people? Yes, sir. To the defense? Yes, Your Honor. All right, let's bring in juror number 673, please. Records should reflect that juror number 673 is now present in the courtroom. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. How are you? We'll see after this. Okay. Thank you for your note. I appreciate you letting me know about this. You did the right thing. That's the first thing I wanted to do. I have some questions for you about this. Uh, when did this happen? Yesterday. At what time? What part of the day? It was either late into, into the lunch break or the afternoon break. I'm not sure. And it was a one-time event? Yes. And it sounds like it's the, you said that the juror in seat nine um, said some things that lead you to wonder whether she is reading the news or not. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so these are statements that you yourself heard juror number nine make? Yes. Do you know who else was present when she made those statements? Actually, before you tell me that, where where was this? In the juror assembly room on the, on the patio. On the patio? Mm -hmm. Okay. And how many, uh, in addition to you and in addition to her, what other jurors were present? There were two others. Two others? Without, na without mentioning their names, because we don't want to mention their names, can you either tell me their juror numbers or their seat numbers, or can you describe them for me? Juror number eight, or in seat number eight. All the way at the top in the first row? Yes. And then third one over from here, so I don't know. 
Okay, so the third one over would be in seat number 19, and that would be juror number 412. And in juror number 8 would be juror number 495. And do you know whether they heard the comments? I think so. I believe so. You believe so? What makes you think so? Were they close to the juror who uh, made the statements? Yes, we were all standing around in a circle. Did anyone else say anything else? No. Did anyone respond to um, the juror sitting in seat number 9, who is juror number A72? Uh, not anything more than, uh, O, or something like that. What was it? O. O? Just something to respond to a statement. Did they both do that, or just one of them? I'm not sure. You're not sure? No. But you're, um, you think that they both would have been within a short enough distance that they would have heard this? Yes. Okay. All right, anything else? No. No? Let me have you step out for just a moment, okay? Actually, let, let's uh, bring her back one more time, please. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. The record should reflect that juror number 673 has returned again. Uh, did you take any action based on that uh, information that was said by that juror, juror number six, uh, juror number A72? No, I didn't say anything or do anything except for write that note this morning. Okay, and you didn't look anything up uh, on the internet or do any research or try to find out whether what she was saying was true or not? No. You took no action? No. Okay. Anything about what you heard that you think... Uh, affects your ability to be a fair and impartial juror in this trial? No. Um, as you sit here, are you still confident that you can be fair and impartial throughout this trial? Yes. And are, do you think you're going to feel um, um, curious about looking this, trying to find out if this information is true or not and that that's going to lead you to, to violate one of my rulings? No, sir. Honestly, I'm not curious at all. I just feel really bad. But, but. No, you should you should not feel bad at all. You've done nothing wrong. And, in fact, I appreciate you telling me about this. You did the right thing. Um, but uh, you, you think you'll be able to comply with all my rulings? Yes. And have you complied with all my advisements and admonishments so far? Yes. And, and you're confident that you'll be able to continue to do that? Yes. Okay. All right, let me have you step out for just a moment. Let me talk to the attorneys, and then uh, we'll, come, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll come and get you in just a little bit. All right, we, we, it seems to me, based on what she's saying, and she comes across as very credible. I, I find her to be very credible. Uh, it, it seems to me that... Um, that the juror sitting in seat number nine, juror number A72, appears to have violated uh, one, if not more, one of my advisements. Uh, it also, I'm also concerned to some extent that uh, jurors 495 and 412 didn't say anything about it. Uh, it appears that they heard something and didn't say anything. That's concerning as well. So. The question is, what do we do at this point? So let's take juror number 673 first. Uh, is there any, are there any other questions that the prosecution is requesting that I ask juror number 673 at this time? 
The only question I can think of, Your Honor, would be to inquire as to whether the <laughs> note that she gave you contained the complete amount of information that was disclosed in this, I'll call it a conversation. I think that's a good question. Any other question? I think Your Honor covered the other questions I would have wanted when you brought her back in. All right. Mr. King, any other questions that you think would be appropriate for me to ask juror number 673 at this time? Judge, I'm requesting a brief recess at this point so that we can discuss this amongst ourselves and, and um, make a, have a thoughtful response. This is too important to rush through, frankly. I, I agree, and I'll give you some time, but in terms of just asking the question that Mr. Orman requested, do you have any problem with me doing that? I have no objection to asking that question, no. Okay, I will ask that question, and then I'll give you a recess, okay? All right, let's bring her back, please. The record should reflect that juror number 673 is back in the courtroom. Um, I have an additional question for you. Is the information that you provided in your note complete in terms of everything you heard from juror, uh, the juror sitting in seat number 9, juror number 872 yesterday? Can I look at it again? Yes. Could you please give her the note back? It has my name on it now and the date, and I have marked it at, with a number, um, the question form number. Okay. But you can ignore that, okay? Okay. And take your time reviewing it, and then let me know whether there's anything you need to add or change. Uh, it's... In terms of uh, the Twitter comment or whatever... Um, she had said that one of the attorneys had posted onto Twitter that, um, did you see that part? I hope the jury saw that part of the video. And then I guess she had said that, um, he, he or she, I'm not sure got in trouble for that and said that they meant it as a text message but that's as that's as far as it goes anything else no She did not identify the attorney? No. And she did not identify whether it was a he or she? No. Did she identify which side or which party? No. No? She didn't identify whether it was a prosecution or a defense attorney? No. No? Okay. Any other information that you can remember? No. Does the additional information that you just provided change your answer in terms of whether you're still confident that you can be a fair and impartial juror in this trial? No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all? No. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to have you go back to the jury room, uh, but would you promise me that you will not discuss with any jurors anything about the note or anything about my questions or anything about the discussion that we've had here just now? Will you promise me that? Yes. Okay. Do not discuss it with any of the other jurors. you understand? I understand. Okay. And, and you're saying that the other two jurors were two jurors that you believe were present when, when these statements were made? They were. And th this was yesterday? Yes. I think, let me change it. I think the mistrial one was about a week ago. And who made that statement? Same one. I'm not sure, though. I, I mean, the, the... And when was that made? During one of the breaks or lunch, I'm not... Last week? I think so. And do you remember where? Same place. Same place. And do you remember who was present? Same people. Same people. And do you remember what it is that she said? Um, just that they, I'm not sure who they 
she was referring to were trying to call a mistrial. I'm, I mean, I honestly can't expand because I don't know what's going on in any of it. I just can only tell you what I heard. And that's all I'm asking. And will you promise me that, again, you will not discuss this with any other juror? Yes. And will you promise me that you will not attempt to look any information uh, on, on the Internet or through any means to try to find out whether any of this is accurate or not? Yes. Okay. And you haven't done that, right? No. So you don't know at this time whether what she has said is accurate or not? I have no idea. Okay. All right. Let me have you step out again, okay? Thank you. Okay, the record should reflect that juror number uh, 673 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Um, I, I, you, Mr. King has asked for a break, and, and I said that I would give him a recess, and I'm going to do that. Uh, does anybody have, have an objection to me bringing the jury back in and just letting them know that there is something I need to talk to counsel about outside their presence, and then go over the advisements again to make sure that they're not talking to each other about the case or anything related to the case. We don't object to that, Your Honor. Mr. King? I don't have an objection to that, Your Honor. All right. Approximately how long do you think I um, should tell them? A half hour? I think a half hour would be sufficient, Your Honor. Sufficient. Okay. Thank you. All right. Let's bring the jury back in, please. All right, we are now going on more than an hour and 20 minutes since this recess began. I do want to let you know that the Denver Post, our partner, is reporting that sources are saying the trial could resume by 1145 right now, 114230. So coming up on that, but we still have some time to go. So to reiterate everything that we know so far, juror number 673 in seat 16 has come forward and said that juror number 872 in seat 9 may have seen news articles related to the trial on her Facebook page. Now, the uh, juror number 63, the one making these allegations, has also said that two other jurors, juror 495 in seat 8 and juror 412 in seat 19, may have been present while juror, uh, no, juror 872 Two was making these statements that she had seen these new news articles and they did not come forward with information to the court. So the judge is concerned about that as well as the juror that um, allegedly was reviewing news articles related to this case. So a lot of questions remaining here, some pretty big developments as far as could the court grant a mistrial? Could uh, the court remove one or more or all of these jurors that are involved in this incident? Uh, I want to point to a couple of our online polls in our online chat room right now. Thank you for chatting with us about this. Should the jurors in this trial be sequestered? About 51% of you said yes, 33% saying no, and the rest at this point are undecided. Now, again, we're going on an hour and 20 minutes or more since this recess began. We'll go a little more in depth about uh, exactly what the juror may have seen on Facebook. So the juror that's making these allegations in seat 16 says the juror in seat nine made statements about some mistrial motions that uh, were done while the jury was outside of the courtroom. One of those being that the defense had argued playing the video interview with Dr. William Reed violated the shooter's rights. Now that interview with Dr. William Reed played out in court all last week over the course of several days. The jury watched this video and the doctor ultimately concluded that he believed the shooter was sane at the time of the shooting. Today we were expecting, before all of this happened, to hear more from another doctor, another state-appointed psychiatrist, Dr. Jeffrey Metzner. He uh, took the stand yesterday and also stated that he felt the shooter was sane at the time of the shooting. Of course, ultimately it is up to the jury to decide the decision of sanity in this case. Despite those two psychiatrists' opinions, and uh, we are on day 28 of this, and this is a big revelation that just came about. And if you're just joining us, we'll go through it again. One juror came forward to the judge, said that another juror made statements that she had seen news articles on Facebook related to this trial. One being the uh, mistrial motions, the other that... Um, 
She knew that an accidental tweet had been sent out by the district attorney related to the trial, uh, during which the judge reprimanded the district attorney and banned texting and the use of social media in the courtroom. So somehow this juror came across this information. This other juror saying she saw it on Facebook, uh, which obviously they are not allowed to do. So will a mistrial be granted? Will one or more of these jurors be removed from the trial? That remains to be seen. That's exactly what we're waiting for at this point. So again, the Denver Post is reporting that sources say the trial could resume at 1145, although right now it's going on 1146. So it looks like our live feed is still not up, so we still do not have court in session at this point. So we are still trying to wait and see what's going to happen here. We've spoke to some legal analysts about this, going over some of the options. Uh, Marshall Zellinger, my colleague who joined me earlier, he is actually on his way to the courtroom right now to track all of this for you. You can follow him on Twitter, follow us on Twitter at Denver Channel for the latest developments. Now again, regarding the um, mistrial motions which were done with the jury outside of the courtroom that one of these jurors may have heard that was related to the video interview interviews with uh, Dr. William Reed that the defense had argued that violated the shooter's rights. We want to play some uh, footage here now from that uh, when that was playing out in the courtroom. You have a discussion with him about a guy sitting in the front row of the theater and he talk about him, he talks about him being a, a guy that's smiling at him. And there's a conversation you have with him about whether he shoots him or not. Do you remember that? Yes. I remember you mentioned looking back and there was a guy in the front row smiling. Right, yeah. Any thoughts, other thoughts about his smiling? I don't know why he was smiling. Do you think he might have been grimacing rather than smiling? No, I'm pretty positive he was a smile. So you don't think he was grimacing because he was hurt? No, he wasn't like uh, holding his leg or arm or anything that would suggest that. Was he sitting in the seat or crouching or hunkering down behind it? He was sitting in front of his seat. So he was quite exposed? Because he, he was in the front row too. Do you recall whether he was sitting on his seat or not? He wasn't on the seat, no. Nobody oh. was on their seat at the end. There. Do I understand that he was on the floor in front of his seat? Right. Can you describe how he was sitting? Um, just with his legs to the side, uh, kind of leaning against the seat. What makes you think that he wasn't wounded? Um, he wasn't, it didn't look like he was in pain at all. But he was pretty exposed. Right, yeah. Um, did you think about shooting him? No. What do you make of that? It, that it probably would have been really personal to shoot a person who's smiling at you. Tell us why that's psychiatrically significant. First of all, it, it tells me that, at least according to him, he was paying attention. Uh, he was able to report that detail, assuming it's accurate. He was able to report that he wasn't uh, such an automaton, if you will, that he didn't, uh, that he wasn't aware of lots of things around him. Um, Second, I was interested in uh all right, you've been listening in to the videotaped interview with Dr. William Reed, a state appointed psychiatrist from last week. Major developments today, though, the trial just got underway related to the uh, jury allegations. So let's listen in. And the prosecutors are present as well. And we are outside the presence of the jury at this time. Would counsel please approach?
All right, Mr. Uh, King, have you had an opportunity to think about uh, the issue that came up earlier today with respect to the note that I have marked as question form number 173? Yes, Your Honor. And, and how would you like to, and for the record, I think we actually were on break for more than an hour, as it turns out, uh, although I don't know how much of that time you actually had to think about this or to work on this, but um, how would you like the court to proceed? At this point in time, to begin with, we think we need to question individually the three jurors that were mentioned by juror number 673 as being present um, w when these comments were made. Uh, we think we should do that individually. Um, we understand that the court will probably want to ask questions of the jurors first. Our request would be that we allow be allowed to ask follow-up questions, um, possibly uh, with the court's uh, approval. Um, and then we are prepared to make some decisions about what we think needs to happen after that based upon the responses that these jurors give. Do you have a preference uh, or a position as to which of the three jurors should be questioned first? No, we'll leave that to the court's discretion. All right. Uh, the people, Mr. Orman? Your Honor, I agree with what counsel suggested, although I think that in the middle of a trial, under these circumstances, all the questioning should be done by the court. I don't think attorneys should be questioning these jurors at this point. That, that's my position as well. However, I will give counsel an opportunity to suggest questions that they think I should ask. And so we will proceed as we have been doing throughout the trial in terms of questioning jurors individually about any issues. I will ask the questions. I will then ask the juror to step out and I will ask counsel if there are any additional questions that they think are appropriate or that they would like me to ask and then we'll proceed in that fashion, okay? Understood. All right. Which juror is the court considering beginning with? I'm gonna bring in uh, juror number 495 first. That's the juror sitting in seat number eight. So let's have juror 495, please. Good morning. It's still morning. It's 5 till 12. So good morning. <laughs> good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. All right. Uh, I brought you in because uh, I have been informed that um, a juror may have made statements uh, about this case last week and this week, and that you that may have happened in your presence during one of the breaks or during a couple of breaks. Uh, have you, do you recall any jurors making any statements related to anything with respect to this case um, in the last couple of weeks during one of the breaks? Um, and it was last week? Last week and, and um, yesterday and it would have been in the lounge area downstairs. Not that I can immediately recall, no. Okay. Um, you don't remember anybody making any statements with respect to this case or anybody saying anything related to hearing things about this case?
there was mention of maybe looking at something on a phone. Okay, tell me about that. Um, who, who did you hear make the statement? I was Danielle. Without using any Oh, I'm names, sorry, please. I don't know a juror. Do you know where she sits in the courtroom? Uh, in the middle row. The middle row. Yeah. Um, do you know towards where... the end or the end? All the way at the end of the middle row. Oh, on this end. Right. Okay. All right. And what did you hear her say? It was. And for the record, she's pointing at seat number nine, where juror number A seventy two sits. Sits. Okay. Go ahead. I can't remember what had happened that day. It was something. I don't know, we'd had a long break or something unusual had happened. And in my, what I heard was just jokingly, well, we can go check the news to see what's going on. But I did not see her actually get her phone out. Did you hear her say anything more no. with respect to that? No. Did, did you hear her make any other statements related to... Uh, the case in any way? No. And have you heard her at any point before make any statements about the case? Not before that, no. And not since that. And not prior to that and not since that? Right. So at any point you haven't heard any uh, her say anything with respect to this case? No. Or information she may have um, claimed to have about the case or anything like that? No. Uh, how about, have you heard any other juror make those statements? No. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and um, do you sometimes go to the lounge area downstairs? I do. And and who else? Uh, is there a group of you who usually goes there or does it vary? Um, on our breaks, yes. there's um, a constant group of people. During lunch, there's more people that tend to, to go out there. But during the breaks, it's just a few of you? Right. And and who would those few be? You, um, the juror in seat number nine, juror 872, and who else? Um, I could not tell you their numbers. <laughs> okay. And do you know their seat numbers? Um, I know one's in the back row middle, maybe? Maybe fourth over there. And then I think the third seat right here. Okay. All right. I'm bad enough with names, so that's throwing okay. numbers on top of it and is too much. When, that's okay. I'm sorry. And the third seat, she's pointing to seat number 19 where juror number 412 sits. I it, think that's where she sits. Okay. And then in the top row, you don't know exactly where you said somewhere in the top row. I want to say it's the fourth row or fourth seat from on the, the top. From the from right. From the left. From your right. Yes. And so that would be seat number five. And then. Are these. Oh, sorry. Go sorry. On. One more person I just thought of at the very end of the middle row to your right. And that would be in seat number 16, juror number 673. All right. That tends to be, to the best of your recollection, the group of folks who who, who is uh, there during the breaks is what, from what you can remember, correct? Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay. Let me have you step out for just a moment, okay. please. Thank you. Give us just a moment. All right, the record should reflect that uh, juror number 495 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Are there any other questions that the prosecution uh, would request that I ask of this juror? I think you covered it, Your Honor. All right, any other questions, Mr. King? Judge, um, my colleagues may have a suggestion, but my one suggestion is my recollection is that juror 673 indicated that this conversation, at least the conversation that took place yesterday, took place on the patio. Okay. Um, 
And so I didn't know, I know that you referred to the lounge area. I'm unfamiliar with any of these areas, but maybe it would jog her memory if you were to mention the patio area. And um, I, I will do that. I thought that she had referred to the lounge, but I'll ask the patio. I was, that's what I was referring to. And it sounds like that's where the group of folks tends to hang out during the breaks. The only one she added that um, juror number 673 had not mentioned is possibly juror 535 who sits in seat number five. So, but I'm happy to bring her back and make sure that she understood that as the patio. It might, my understanding or my thought was that perhaps they were taking a smoke break out there. That's um, possible, yeah. The other okay. question that I'm being asked is um, whether or not this juror has heard anything ab about media reports on the case from any source. I will ask that. All right, let's bring her back, please. Although I think the last question is covered by some of my other questions, but I'll ask it anyway. The record should reflect that juror number 495 is back in the courtroom. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I want to follow up on, on some of the discussion we had because I want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. When I refer to the lounge area, mm -hmm. um, did you understand that as the patio as well downstairs outside yes. it? Okay. Where sometimes, uh, do jurors smoke there sometimes? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so that's what you were referring to. Right. All right. And is that, that's the place that you were referring to when you were talking about uh, those few of you who during the breaks go there to smoke and hang out. Right. Okay. Um, and the uh, other follow-up question I had is, have you heard any media reports about the case since the trial started? I have not, no. Um, okay, have you heard anything reported about the case in the media through any means, whether it's TV, radio, newspaper, magazines, internet, social media, through any means, have you heard or seen any uh, reports about the case from the media? Not, I mean, if I see something, then I just turn the page or scroll past it really quick. I have not read anything or heard anything. Okay, so you've been following all of my advisements. Yes. And have you complied with each and every single one of my advisements since we started this trial? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Let me have you step out again. Okay. Thank you for your patience. All right, uh, I'm gonna bring in um, the next juror, who is juror number 412. Unless there are any other questions that the parties want me to ask of juror number 495. Any other questions? The only other question, Judge, and I apologize for not thinking of this earlier, is to ask her why she did not inform the court of this previously. Um, my understanding is that you've instructed this jury very, very clearly over and over again that if there's any violation in any way of the court's orders uh, by themselves or by other jurors um, from any source that they're to notify the court. And that's potentially a violation of the court order that could affect this juror's uh, future service. Well, what she said was that there was mention of maybe looking something on a phone. And then she said that she thought that the person was joking. So it didn't sound like what she heard was that someone actually looked something up on the phone, um, but that she said she could to try to find out what was going on because the, it, this was a long break. Uh, and then she said that she thought he was joking. I will bring her back and clarify that just to be sure, okay? Let's bring her back, please. All right, the record should reflect that juror number 495 is now back in the courtroom. Let me follow up on this statement that you think you heard. Okay. Uh, I, what I heard you say is that you heard during one of the breaks that there was mention of maybe looking something on a phone. Right. 
And when do you think that happened? Um... doesn't have to be the exact day if you can remember this week or last week or before last week or something along those lines it wasn't it wasn't this week so not yesterday or today no okay um early last week you think maybe early last week yeah and what exactly is it that you heard this person say um, just, you know, there was, like I said, there was a long break or something. Um, and so we were excited, an extra break or something. So we were excited to go outside and was just mentioned, well, let me get out my phone and check the news. And, and did you actually see her check? I did not see okay. her check the news. Did no. you believe that she had violated one of the court's orders? I took it as her jokingly saying it. Um, and you didn't actually see her. And I did not actually see her at that time do it. After she said that, did she start using her phone, or do you know whether she started using her phone for any purpose? I, I don't specifically remember. I mean, all of us take our phones out there, and we're on them pretty much constantly while we're out there. So, you know, she could have even said it while being on her phone. Um, but mm -hmm. I didn't put any... I, I took it as her saying it jokingly. Okay, you didn't believe that she was in violation of one right. of my advisements that Correct. I have been that I have been giving you. Correct. Okay. All right. Do you remember anything else about that event? No, I mean it was just a a fleeting passing comment, and then we all just carried on with what we were what we were doing. And do you know who else was present? When she made the comment it would have been the people that i mentioned before um with the exception of maybe the person in the very back row um the, she doesn't tend to stay out as long as we do okay the person that you said four seats in from the right hand looking at the at the jury box right it would be my right hand side four right. seats in that would be the person sitting in seat number five juror number 535 okay. right that would be the only person that you know like i said we go out there and she doesn't tend to stay out there as long so she you think she wasn't there i i can't say for sure but but you don't know she if, may have been right okay you don't know if she was or not right okay all right great let me have you step out again please thank you thanks for your patience Okay, the records reflect that juror number 495 has now exited the courtroom. Are there any other questions, Mr. King? No, Judge. All right, let's bring the next juror in. Let's bring the juror in seat number 19, juror number 412, please. Judge, I noted that the court didn't instruct that juror not to discuss this with any of the other jurors. I, I didn't know if the court wanted to do that or to remind the court to do that with the future. I, I, let's do that. Hold on. Hold on just a second. Sorry. Could you bring 495 back, please, and have her go back to, the, to her room for that? Have 412 go back to her room and bring back 495, please. Thank you for reminding me. Sorry about that, Juror. No, that's okay. Thank you.
The record should reflect that juror number 495 is now back in the courtroom. Thank you again. I just uh, wanted to um, instruct you not to discuss anything that we've talked about here with you alone with any okay. other jurors. Will you promise that you will do that? Absolutely. Okay, so do not discuss um, what I've asked you about. Do not discuss the information you've given me in response to my questions or that the fact that we called you in here. Do not discuss any of this with the other jurors. Will, okay. you, will you promise to do that? I promise. That? Okay. All right. And All right. will you promise to continue to follow each and every one of my advisements? I will. I promise. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. The record should reflect that juror number 412 is now present in the courtroom. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, I brought you in because I wanted to ask you whether you've heard any juror make a statement of any kind about the case during one of the breaks, uh, and specifically last week and yesterday, and uh, in terms of location, specifically in the patio downstairs or in the lounge area. Um, not that I'm aware of. I okay. don't. You don't. You don't recall hearing anything. No. Sometimes we talk about like quotes and clothes and shoes, but I don't remember hearing anything about the case. Okay, clothes and shoes. The clothes you may be wearing and shoes you may be wearing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. When you say quotes, what does that mean? Um, like air quotes. Oh, okay. Air quotes, but not related to this case. No. And not related to anything happening in these proceedings. No. All right. And uh, let's expand it to before last week. Have you heard at any time any juror make a statement anywhere, whether in the patio or anywhere else, about this case? I've heard people talk about the length, uh, going over, mm, 5 o'clock, past 5, 5.30, 6. Okay, so scheduling, and, scheduling. And, my, and my staff talks to you folks about that uh, often in terms of how late you can stay and that kind of thing as well. Right. But what about anything else in terms of the case or in terms of my what might be reported in the media or in any media reports? Have you heard anyone comment about what, uh, you know, information related to the case or information uh, reported by the media related to the case? Have you heard anyone make a comment about that? And when I say anyone, I'm referring to one of the jurors. No. No? And uh, my understanding is sometimes during the breaks you go to the patio with a few other jurors, is that right? I do. H have you heard any, any such comments while you're there at the patio made by any juror statements um, of related to the case or what may have been reported about the case in the media or anything like that? Specifically talking about the media? Any, anything related to the case? No. just. Just talking about schedules and stuff. And, okay. Uh, I tend to play my phone. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Uh, so, That's all right. All right. Um, um, no. 
Have you received any information or seen or heard or read any information about the case in any media report since the case started? Um, I look at Huffington Post, but I scroll past anything that has to do with anything. Related to the case? Yes. And so you, you're following my advice then to avoid any stories about the case? Yes, I don't look at the news. I don't watch the news with my family. We okay. don't even watch it anymore. I watch Rachel Maddow. <laughs> okay. That's and it. you've been following my advisements, each and every one of my advisements, uh, since you, since we started this trial? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, and I, I want to make sure that I open it up because initially I asked you questions about uh, during one of the breaks in the patio downstairs, and I said last week or maybe yesterday, but let's open it up without any restrictions as to location and without any restrictions as to time. Have you ever heard a juror make a statement or make a comment about the case or about information uh, from the media related to the case? I can't think of any that I've like heard and uh, like processed, I guess. I can't think of any that I've paid any attention to anything okay. about the even, media. All right. Just, even if you weren't paying attention um, and processing it, have you heard any juror make any statements about the case or information in the media about the case, whether you happen to be part of the conversation or whether you happen to not be specifically talking to the juror but happen to overhear what the juror said. Have you heard a juror uh, make any statements in any way related to the case, uh, including information in the media about the case? trying to recollect anything I may have heard and, and I just specifically the media nothing or even if it's not specifically related to the media related to anything in any way related to the case that's not scheduling you know anything related to the proceedings or what's happening here in the courtroom uh, related to the case in that way have you heard anyone make a statement like that that comes to mind No, just like I said, the scheduling, uh, sometimes shoes that people wear, clothes, outfits, okay, hairstyles. All right, got it. All right, thank you. Let me have you step out for just a moment, please. All right, the record should reflect that juror number 412 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Are there any other questions that the people would like me to ask this juror, Mr. Orman? No, Your Honor, thank you. Any, any other questions from you, Mr. King? No, thank you. All right, thank you. Let's bring her back one more time, please. The record should reflect that juror number 412 is back in the courtroom. Ma'am, thank you for your time. Um, please don't discuss with anyone what we've talked about here, okay? Yes. Will you promise me to do that? that you Absolutely. Will... Okay, thank you. Uh, so don't discuss anything I asked you. Don't discuss anything you said. Don't discuss any, any of this conversation that I've had with you one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Yes. All right, and will you promise that you will continue to follow each and every one of my advisements throughout the trial? Yes. And I should also tell you, don't infer anything from this discussion, okay? Don't try to speculate. I wonder why he's asking me the question. Uh, you shouldn't do that at all. Will you promise me that you will not do that? Yes. All right, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The record should reflect that juror number 412 has now exited the courtroom. Let's bring in, finally, juror number 872, please.
And Judge, before this juror comes in, I believe that 673 said specifically that there was something that came up on her Facebook feed, and I, maybe the court wants to inquire about that. Okay, thank you. The record should reflect that juror number 872 is now present in the courtroom. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, I wanted to bring you in because I wanted to um, ask you if um, you have uh, been exposed to information about the case from a media report or any media reports, whether it's uh, through the internet, newspaper, or social media, including Facebook your Facebook feed? No. I mean, my last, I think it was Thursday or Friday, my husband called me and he had asked me a question regarding something he's seen on Facebook, um, something about Twitter or something. And he was on speaker and I told him, look, I don't know anything about it. And that was basically the gist of it. Um, other than that, I haven't. What, what did he say to you about Twitter? Well, he asked me if I knew who the uh, the lawyer was, and I said, no, why? And he was like, well, that idiot's tweeting on Facebook, and that was pretty much how it goes on. He knows that I'm not supposed to talk about it, and I, I don't read the newspaper, and I, you know, when I watch TV, it's not the news. Um, so, I mean, him and I got into a really big argument about it because he knows and it just so happened to be when we were on lunch and have you heard any other information about uh, related to the case whether through your husband or anyone else or whether through uh, the internet or um, any media reports from any source have you heard any information about the case no and even if I if I'm on Facebook or something, if I do see like the headlines of it, I I don't click the link. I I specifically stay away for that reason. And have you have you seen any of the headlines and read any of the headlines? Um, not I mean not knowingly. You know, you just skim over them. But other than that, I I don't like pick them out to find them. Have you discussed? Um some of the, um, the this Twitter information that you received from your husband with other jurors? No. No, there, I don't know what her juror number was, but she was sitting right next to me when my husband had called me, and then when I hung up the phone with him, it was just kind of like, oh, what was that about? And I was like, well, you know, I, I don't know. What you said, I don't know. Or yeah. That? Well, I said. Well, I told her. I was like, well, apparently this is what happened on Twitter. And what did you tell her happened? On Twitter? Just that one of the lawyers had tweeted about. I don't even know what the tweet was about. I just know that he tweeted about the case during a testimony. I don't. I didn't read the tweet. I don't know what the tweet was about. And when? When was this? Um. I think it was sometime last week. I honestly, I don't remember. And did your husband provide any other information to you about? No, no, I, I basically that was it. And then I got off the phone with him. Did he say uh, anything else related to the attorney or the party, uh, which side it was or anything like that, that he was referring to? No, he just asked, no, he asked me who who George Brockler was or who Brockler was and I said well he's he's one of the the um, uh, one of the lawyers and he was like like I said he said well that idiot tweeted during the the, the uh, testimony and that was it I didn't ask what he tweeted or anything like that during the breaks do you usually hang out in the patio downstairs in the lounge area with a few of the jurors occasionally 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 and if I don't I'm out for lunch Okay. 
All right. And do you remember talking to the other jurors about any of this conversation you had with your husband? I don't. Right. I mean, if it was, if this happened yesterday, maybe, but honestly, I don't, I don't remember. I don't think I did because I didn't have a conversation with anybody about it specifically. We didn't sit down. We didn't talk about it in conversation. It was just more of a in passing kind of thing. What, why didn't you bring it up to my attention? I, I've been telling jurors throughout that even if despite their best efforts, they inadvertently come upon any information related to the case, whether it's accurate or not, or whether uh, it's um, directly from the media or not, if they inadvertently come up on, or hear or overhear any information about the case, they should tell my staff that they need to talk to me. Right. You know, I mean, I, there's no excuse for me not telling you. It was more so I just really don't pay attention to my husband most of the time. So it 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 wasn't really that important I, at that time. I didn't expect, you know, anything out of it. So it was just kind of pushed under the rug and forgot about. Okay, let me have you step out for just a moment, please. Thank you. The record should reflect that uh, juror number 872 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Are there any other questions that the people want me to ask this juror? Well, Your Honor, I, I, I think that the original juror number um, 673, it also indicated a statement about a motion for a mistrial. I mean, that's awfully a specific question to ask, though. Right, that's um, why I didn't ask so it. I'm not asking anything about that. I just thought I would mention that that was not discussed with her. Right. Mr. King, any other questions that you want me to ask? I, I agree with Mr. Uh, Orman's comment about that. I, I noted that as well. I also noted that <clears throat> the information from Juror 673 is rather specific about the information contained in the Twitter or tweet or whatever it is itself right. um, pertaining to the the video and it seemed to match very closely what the actual tweet was. Um, I would ask, um, she, I, if I re recollect correctly, Juror 872 said that she, this phone call with her husband was on speaker. Uh, so perhaps we should ask if the others were there. It sounds like the others were there and overheard it and that's why they had a conversation about it. I'm pretty unclear about that. but. I will follow up with uh, juror number 872 about that. And, and perhaps we should also ask her if there was a second incident. I, I suppose you have asked if there are any other incidents. So. I have, and I just didn't want to ask, you know, did you hear anything about a mistrial? Um, that would um, be improper. So I'll bring her back and ask her about whether there was a second incident. And I'll ask her if um, when she had her husband on speaker, uh, if there were other jurors around uh, within distance to hear what was being said. Um, but um, regardless, um, I have some concerns about this juror and uh, if the parties are in agreement, and maybe this will make the additional questions, um, although I think it makes sense to ask the additional questions, so I will ask them, but if the parties are in agreement, uh, I am inclined to let her go, to excuse her. So, is there any objection? Can I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. I mean, clearly, there has been a violation of my advisements. My advisements say you cannot obtain any information about the case, and if you obtain information about the case, even inadvertently, you have to tell me about it. You have to tell my staff that you need to talk to me. Furthermore, uh, between her and juror 673, I find juror 673 to be the more credible juror. And so I don't know that we're getting the full story from this particular juror. Not object, Your Honor. All right, Mr. King. We don't object to her being excused, Judge. We have additional concerns, though. Um, we, I have concerns, very serious concerns, about juror 412 and the way she responded to the court's questions. Um, so, so my thought is that we may need to go back and re-question these other jurors again about the information related by um, Juror 872 to determine whether that's the case. And we, we may be asking Judge to, to poll the panel um, individually well, about whether they anyone has any had any contact with this juror or, or received any information. 
let's take it one step at a time. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, Understood. Understood. I have some concerns about your 412 as well, Mr. King. So I, um, I, she took her time answering questions. She paused. Uh, she used words that suggested at times that she was holding something back or might be holding something back, such as saying, uh, not that I heard and processed. I, I don't know who answers questions that way when they are asked, did you hear something about this? Usually people tell you, no, I haven't heard anything. Uh, I, I didn't have concerns with juror number 495. Um, I thought juror 495 was being forthcoming and it may well be that she just didn't hear uh, a whole lot other than she overheard um, juror number 872 say something along the lines of um, maybe looking something on a, on a phone and she thought it was a joke and there, therefore didn't report it to the court. Um, but uh, I do have some concerns about juror number 412 as well in terms of her demeanor uh, and how credible she was with me or, or perhaps the better word is how forthcoming she was with me. So. If the parties are asking me to release 412, um, I, I uh, would grant that request. Judge, may we have a moment, and, we'll, and while we're thinking about that, I, we have some concerns about 495 as well. Um, there were some long periods of silence when the court was asking its questions, um, and, and her statements are in direct contradiction of juror 673, um, and so that I mean, it sounded better when she said it, but it's contradicted by the very credible statements of Juror 673, so, who specifically identified her. So I, our request is, is that you dismiss all three of them at this point in time, Judge. And um, we have 12 alternate jurors in this case, and that's why we have 12 alternate jurors. And we're, we're well into the case. We're more than halfway through the case. Um, and any kind of um, discrepancy should be resolved in, in favor of making sure that this is a, an impartial juror. And there's no harm in, in excusing these, these jurors. Essentially, we believe all four jurors should be excused, Judge. We believe that 673 has been tainted by her, what she's heard about the case. And we're, I'm willing to deal with that argument, too, when it comes, but I don't want to jump ahead of myself here. I'm yeah, sorry. I think we're jumping around a little bit. Uh, so let's deal one by one. Uh, first, there has been no objection already with respect to 872, and so I will release 872. The next question is 412. The defense is asking me to release number 412. And is there any objection to me releasing 412? Yes. We don't object, Your Honor. Okay, 412 will be released. I, I, I agree with Mr. King. I had some concerns about her credibility when she was in here talking to me. 495, Mr. King is right that she her statement is inconsistent with what 673 said. However, it's possible that she just didn't hear it. It's possible that this is not an inconsistency. It's possible that 673... Um, thought that 495 would have heard this comment, but that 495, in fact, did not hear the comment. And so unless um, there's an agreement to release her as well, I'm inclined to follow up with her or actually follow up with perhaps 673 and see whether 673 thinks if um, that 495 was in a position where she would have been able to hear this conversation. I mean, this is not... Um, you know, one war we're talking about. This, these are a couple of comments, uh, two or three comments uh, that we're talking about. And so I think 673 may be able to shed further light on, as to whether she thinks 495 would have been close enough to, to have been able to hear this. Mr. Orman? Your Honor, I don't object to that. I, I, the only thing I think that should be noted is very often people are around things that are said and don't pay attention or don't remember. And it's possible that 495 was there whenever this conversation occurred, but it just didn't listen to it. And um, so I, I, I agree that there were some pauses with 495, but I think they were very different than the pauses with 412. It seemed to me the pauses with 495 where she was really thinking about trying to give an accurate answer to the court. That's the way it looked to me. 
So. Yeah, uh, that's how it looked to me as well. I, but I, I will follow up with 673 before I have, uh, before I make a determination with respect to 495, unless you have an objection to that. No, Judge, I do not. And, and I, I don't disagree with Mr. Orman that it's possible that she just didn't hear. Right. It's also possible that she did hear, and she doesn't want to tell us to get one of her fellow jurors in trouble. And my position is we should err on the side of caution. Okay, I got you. I will bring 673 back. In light of the decision to release A72 and 412, do you have any problem with me um, not following up with A72 as to the sec whether there was a second incident and as to whether she thinks anyone was around within a short distance when she had her husband on, on her speaker phone? Or do you still want me to follow up? With I her? think we need to follow up on that, John. All right, I will follow up on those two questions. Let's bring A72 back, please. All right, the record should reflect that uh, number A72 is now back in the courtroom. Uh, thank you for your patience. A couple of follow-up questions. Was there a second incident um, where you discussed uh, something related to the case or someone discussed it with you? No. The, the only one that I can think of is, is the Twitter. And you said you had your husband on the speakerphone. Uh, do you know whether there were other jurors uh, within a close distance or a short distance who would have been able would have been in position to hear what was being said um, Well, there's usually four of us that all eat lunch in the same area and I don't know of the other two that heard um, But I'm sure the one sitting right next to me Heard it and who was sitting next to you? I don't know her juror number. Where, do, where does she sit? Right here Okay, so that would have been juror number 412. Yeah. You think she would have heard it? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, if she heard it, she didn't say anything to but, me about it. But she was sitting right next to you? Yes. Who are the other people who usually eat lunch with you? Who would have been who would have been there during that time when you had your husband on the speakerphone? Um, I don't know. But I know she sits up in the back corner, and then the other one, I don't know where she sits. And the woman who sits in the back corner, it's the top row all the way at the end? Yes. And how close would she have been, was she, to, to you? Um, well, she was on the other side. I was sitting on the on the far end of, of the, um, the patio in the shade, and she was over walking in the sun. Yeah, uh, can you estimate for me how many steps she would have been away from you? Maybe about 25 feet. She was pretty far. 25 feet? Yeah. So she was pretty far. Yeah. And so, but uh, juror number, f uh, the other juror, juror number 412 was sitting right next to you. Yeah. So, okay. All right. All right. Give me just a second. I'm going to ask you to step out one more time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. All right, uh, the record should reflect that A72 has now stepped out of the courtroom. That confirms it for me that 412 was not being completely honest with us or perhaps without the completely. And I think that's what all, all of us thought, the parties and I, the attorneys and I all thought that, and that corroborates what I had concluded. So at this time, I'm going to bring A72 back and I'm going to excuse her. Then I'm going to bring 412 back and I'm going to excuse her. Neither one of them is going to be allowed to enter the any of the jury rooms uh, while the other jurors are in there. They're going to be taken downstairs, and then when the jurors are not around, they'll be escorted so that they can get their uh, possessions and they can and they will be escorted out of the building. Okay, and then we'll proceed from there. Any objection? I, I don't object to that, Your Honor. My question is: Is the court going to give any type of advisement? I will. I will. Okay, let's bring A72 in. Thank you. You say 72 coming, jury 72.
Okay, the record should reflect that juror number 872 is back in the courtroom. Uh, Ma'am, I'm going to go ahead and excuse you at this time. Uh, so you are uh, discharged from uh, jury um, service in this case. I want to advise you that you are prohibited from talking to any of the other jurors in the case. I know that you may have um, made acquaintanceships or friendships with some of the other jurors. You cannot talk to them. Uh, while they remain on the jury. Do you understand that? Yes. And you also cannot talk to the members of the media. I'm prohibiting you from talking to the members of the media until the trial is completed. Okay. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. The record should reflect that juror number A72 has now exited the courtroom. Uh, just for the record, I have also entered an order in this case which prohibits the media from talking to any jurors, even if they are discharged from the trial until the trial is completed. So, just as a reminder. All right, let's bring juror number 412 in at this time, please. The record should reflect that juror number 412 is back in the courtroom at this time. Ma'am, I'm going to go ahead and excuse you at this time. You're excused and discharged from uh, jury duty in this case. Um, you are not allowed to talk to any of the other jurors as long as the trial is pending, as long as the trial is continuing. You also are prohibited from talking to any, any members of the media until the trial is completed. And when I say trial, I mean the entire thing, including any proceedings that may be had in this case. Do you understand? I do. All right. Thank you. You're discharged. All right. Uh, next, I propose bringing in uh, juror number 673 and following up with her. Is that okay with everyone? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Let's bring 673 back, please. The record should reflect that juror number 673 is back in the courtroom. Uh, Ma'am, I want to thank you again uh, for doing the right thing. You did the right thing, and I very much appreciate you doing this. I brought you back in because I want to follow up on the discussion we had earlier. You indicated that at the time that um, you heard uh, these statements by uh, the juror who sits in seat number um, nine, juror number A72, 
that there were a couple of people present, a few people present, and one of the people that you identified is the person who sits in the top row all the way at the end, uh, which is seat number eight. That's uh, juror number um, 495. And my question is, do you remember how close she was in terms of distance uh, to the person making the statements? In other words, I'm trying to figure out what is it that made you believe that she may have heard these statements? Honestly, it's because it's usually the four of us talking. And so, I mean, maybe she was farther away from the group that was talking. I, I, but usually we're close enough to where it's easy to hear. So usually you're close enough to each other that you'd be able to hear. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if she didn't hear it, she didn't hear it. I just, I know that all four of us were standing around. And juror number um, 872, the juror who sits in seat number nine, didn't make the statement just to you. No. She just made the statement. Yes. Did you see her at any point speaking on her phone, on speaker phone with anyone? No. No, you didn't see that part? No. And you didn't hear her talking to her husband on speaker phone about anything? No. But you remember her making the statements that you said she made both last week and also yesterday? Yes. And do uh, you think in both the incidents, the uh, person who sits in seat number eight, juror number 495, was in the area, the, the vicinity? Yes, I, I know yesterday for sure. For sure yesterday she was in the vicinity? Yes. Okay. And then I'm pretty sure, almost positive, that the other time as well. Okay. What about the uh, person who sits in the fourth seat from the end in the top row? I understand that sometimes she uh, goes on break with you folks in the patio, juror number 535. Do you know whether she was there? I don't. That's why I didn't mention her. Okay. Do you do you recall her not being there or her being there or do you just not remember? I don't remember. You don't remember. Okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Let me have you step out again. Thank you very much. Okay. The record should reflect that uh, juror number 673 has now stepped out of the courtroom again. Given that record, I'm inclined to grant the defense's request to release number 495. I think uh, 673, juror number 673 is the most honest of all these jurors that I've spoken to today. And I believe what she says. I think she's being very candid with the court. I think this was a hard thing for her. Uh, she's not looking like she's getting any pleasure out of this at all. This is uh, actually uh, seemingly painful for her, but I think she's doing it because she felt it was the right thing to do, and I appreciate her doing that. But I find her to be the most honest of all the jurors. And if she's telling me that uh, juror number 495 was in the vicinity, um, then I believe her. And uh, again, you know, this isn't a, a um, one word type of thing. There are multiple comments, um, and I think it's likely that four juror number 495 would have heard uh, some, if not all, of these comments. So um, I'm inclined to grant the request. Is there any objection? I don't object, Your Honor. All right, I will release number 495. So um, before we take 673 back to the jury room, she's just, she's still, she's waiting in the hallway, right? Yes. Um, Mr. King, I think you had said that you wanted. Uh, you might have a request to excuse her, or perhaps you actually made the request to excuse 673. Um, do you want to make that request still? Yes, please. Okay. And, and, and I could not agree with the court more. I, I think that she's doing the right thing. I think that she's being very honest. Um, I'm just very concerned about the nature of the information that she's been revealed to. She now knows about a mistrial. Uh, she you know, a request for a mistrial that was denied. That's likely could have a prejudicial effect. She's like she knows about uh, the tweeting thing and um, uh, and and Lord knows what else. So I, I just think we I'm requesting that we dismiss her as well. Well, what what she has heard number one, she didn't hear from 
the media directly uh, or from any news source directly. She heard it from another juror who claimed that she got it from her Facebook feed. So for one thing, she doesn't know uh, if this is accurate or not, and, and she said that when she was in here. Um, number two, um, she heard that they they have tried to call a mistrial, but she said she didn't know which side, and that the attorneys have now been prohibited from using or from having phones uh, in the courtroom, and that one of the attorneys posted on Twitter that he or she hoped the jury saw part of the video and the judge was mad, uh, but she didn't know which attorney it was, and she didn't know if it was a female or male attorney, and she didn't know if it was a prosecutor or a defense attorney, um, and she didn't know what came of the, uh, if anything, of the attempt by anyone to call a mistrial. Um, so, I, I, you know, I read the People versus Moore case, 321 Pacific 3rd, 310, a Colorado Court of Appeals case from 2010, and uh, that case is not on point, but that's a case in which it um, was revealed to the court that there had been, uh, that the jury has, had been exposed to a newspaper article containing prejudicial information about the defendant, uh, and the court set forth the analysis that trial court judges should engage in if this situation arises. And what the Court of Appeals said is that uh, a trial court should deal with juror exposure to prejudicial publicity during the trial as follows. Number one, the trial court must determine whether the publicity is inherently prejudicial. Number two, if so, the court should canvass the jury to determine whether the jury learned of the prejudicial publicity. And number three, the trial court should individually examine exposed jurors to determine how much they know of the publicity and what effect, if any, the publicity publicity will have on their deliberations. Now, I have questioned um, multiple jurors now, including juror number 673. Uh, this information that juror 673 heard, in my view, is not inherently prejudicial information uh, to the defendant. Um, she doesn't know who it was related to. She only knows vague or general uh, details. Uh, and Mr. King said, who knows what else she has heard? You know, we can't have it both ways. We can't on the one hand say, boy, she's really honest and really candid with the court. And on the other hand say, who knows what else she heard that she's not telling us. I think we either trust her and rely on her or we don't. And I find her very reliable and trustworthy. I think she's being very candid with the court. And so when she tells me, this is what I've heard, I believe her completely. And so if this is all she's heard, I don't see how this is inherently prejudicial to the defendant. And then um, I have examined her individually, and I will examine her further, but I have examined her about what effect, if any, the publicity will have on her deliberations, or actually I asked on her ability to be fair and impartial, and she said none. I can still be fair and impartial. I will still be fair and impartial. I will bring her back and ask her uh, about what effect, if any, uh, this information may have on her deliberations or what effect, if any, it will have on any decision she makes in this trial and whether this information will at any point um, influence her in any way or affect her uh, decision making or be in the back of her mind at any point during the trial. Do the people have a position on, on the defense's request, Mr. Orman? If the I agree with you. I would just contrast it with uh, the information would be prejudicial. And um, this is Perry versus People. It's an old case. 163rd Pacific, not second, third, 844 from the Supreme Court of Colorado, 1917. But in that case, Your Honor, the, apparently the jury had been exposed to information that the defendant in the criminal case had attempted to escape from custody in the course of the trial. That's the type of information that I think might be inherently prejudicial for a juror to hear. This is, at best, procedural information. It's not even factual information about any defendant in particular. So I completely agree with what the court said. Okay, let me bring her back. Let's bring back six, uh, number 673, please, so I can follow up. Okay, thank you.
the record should reflect that juror number 673 is back in the courtroom. Uh, thank you again. I want to follow up on the discussions that we've had and the questions we've had. As you sit here, can you remember anything else that you heard related to the case that you haven't told me about yet? No. If at any point you happen to remember something else, will you please tell me that? Yes. And again, will you promise not to discuss it with any other jurors? Yes. And will you promise not to discuss what you and I have talked about here today, throughout today, with any other jurors? Yes. I asked you earlier whether the information you heard um, was going to affect your ability to be fair and impartial in this case. And you told me that it would not. And, and you seemed confident in your answer. Are you confident that this will not affect you in your ability to be fair and impartial throughout these proceedings? Yes, I am. Will you promise me as you're, as you're sitting here that you will be fair and impartial throughout these proceedings? Yes. Does this information, uh, do you think, make you um, um, biased in any way against one side or the other? No, because I have no idea which side did what. Okay. And you have no idea whether this information is even accurate that you heard, correct? Right. Okay. Uh, do you think this, this is information that's going to uh, affect you in any way throughout this trial? No. Will it influence you in any way throughout this trial? No. Will it be in the back of your mind as we move on throughout this trial or at, or at any point in this trial? In terms of... Is that going to be something that's going to be in the back of your mind that you're going to be considering as you're hearing evidence, as you're hearing my instructions, or as the trial goes on? No. Will this information affect any of the decisions that you make in this case? No. Will it affect, will, will any part of this information affect your deliberations? No. Do you have any concerns as you sit here about your ability and willingness to be a fair and impartial juror in this trial? No. And how about any concerns with respect to um, being a fair, um, making sure that this is a fair trial, fair to both parties, and that it is an impartial trial? In other words, that it is not partial or biased to one side or the other? No, I'm not biased or partial to one side at all. And this doesn't change any of that? No. Any other concerns at all that you want to talk to me about? No. Okay. And you, and you have told me that you will promise not to talk to any of the jurors about any of this at any point, including during deliberations? Correct. And if at any point you happen to remember something else, will you promise me that you will tell my staff that you need to talk to me? Yes. And so even if it's two weeks from now, uh, someone something happens that triggers part of the memory that you have of this conversation that perhaps you're not remembering right now, will you tell my staff that you need to talk to me so that you can tell me about other information that you have remembered about the incidents that we've talked about today? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me have you step out. Thank you. All right. The record should reflect that uh, juror number 673 has stepped out of the courtroom at this time. Based on that additional record, Mr. King, I'm gonna deny your request. I understand the request, but uh, I am comfortable that this juror can and will be fair and impartial and will not be affected in any way by this information throughout the trial, including in her deliberations and in any decisions that she makes in this case. I also uh, am 100% comfortable that if she remembers something else from any of the conversations that we've been talking about today in terms of juror number 872 and things juror 872 said uh, that she will tell me about it. I have no doubt that this, that this juror will, will tell me about it. So I believe her when she commits to me that if something else comes to, to mind, she will tell me. And I believe her when she says that she will follow all my instructions and my advisements. And I believe her when she says that she will not discuss any of this with the other jurors and that she will be fair and impartial throughout this trial. I understand the court's ruling. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. King, uh, that takes care of, I think, um, your request with respect to 872, 472. I gotta bring 495 in so I can excuse her, so please bring her in.
The record should reflect that juror number 495 is now present in the courtroom. Ma'am, I'm going to go ahead and excuse you at this time. So okay. you are released. You're discharged from your jury service in this case. I'm going to admonish you that you cannot talk to any of the jurors while these trial court proceedings are pending. You also cannot talk to any members of the media about this case while okay. these trial court proceedings are pending. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. The record should reflect that juror number 495 has now exited the courtroom. All right, Mr. King, I have addressed your request with respect to jurors a72, 412, and 495, and also with respect to 673. So, what's the next request that you have? Would you like me to um, have juror 535 questioned? That was going to be my request, Your Honor. All right, and I think that request is a reasonable one. Let's bring uh, juror number 535 in, please. The record should reflect that juror number 535 is now present in the courtroom. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Okay. All right. Thanks for coming in. Uh, I, wanna, I wanted to ask you whether you've heard any juror make any statements related to this case in the last couple of weeks, either last week or this week or both, like during one of the breaks. Uh, when we go outside, I really don't pay that much attention. I just kind of do my thing and I leave. Okay. You know, I, I, they may, but to tell you what or who, I don't pay attention to it. And my understanding is that you usually go to the patio on break. And you, uh huh. And the, is that is that a right? Yes, that's and right. You, and you hang out with, I think you don't know juror numbers, but no, I don't. I think it's the juror who sits in seat number nine there. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. And you're pointing to it. The juror who sits all the way at up top. The very end. The very. Oh, end. The, yeah, the very top, and then the very end here. And then on one of these seats here. And the third seat right there, right? Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. And then uh, who did you say uh, you're talking about when you said the very top, you're talking about at the very end? The very end. Right. At the top, the very end on this second row. Oh, okay. That's She's uh, there too. Oh, okay. Seat number 16, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Right. I got you. Sorry. All right. And so during those times when you were in the patio, did you hear uh, anyone say something about the case or something about the news that may have been reported about the case or something that may have been reported on, on social media about the case? You know what? I did hear something. Um, and I, like I said, I just don't pay any attention to it because I'm so clued to doing that. Uh, I remember hearing something said about a mistrial. Okay, when, that's but I don't I don't remember it was. Who do you remember saying that? Okay, and she's pointing to seat number nine, uh, so that would be juror. Yeah, number and I when well, as soon as that I turned around and walked out, what? and then went went into the jury assembly room. What What did you hear her say? I just heard the word mistrial, and that was it. I remember hearing that, but that's, honest to goodness, that's all I heard. Uh, how about yesterday? Did you hear her say something else yesterday? No. I really, uh, I wasn't out there, like during lunchtime, I wasn't out there when she was out there. What What made you think uh, when she said the word mistrial that she was talking about this case? I didn't know. You I didn't know she was talking about this case. I just heard when you said that, it jarred my memory. I remember hearing that word. I don't know what context it was in. I just remember hearing that word, and I came inside. Do you remember hearing anything else? No, sir. A any other part of that statement? You just remember hearing? I just remember hearing the word mistrial. And and was that in the patio? Yes, it was. Okay. And I, I can't tell you the date. It was a few days ago. 
Did you, Woodhood. Did you tell my staff that you needed to talk to me about no, something? No, because I, I really wasn't, it didn't even click until you just said that to me just now. I, I didn't even, I don't know what she was talking about, what context it was in, but I do remember hearing that word. Okay, let, okay. Me, have you, let me have you step out. Okay. All right, the record should reflect that juror number 535 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Any other questions that the parties want me to ask her? Mr. Orman? No, Your Honor. Mr. King? Thank you, Your Honor. All right, any requests with respect to this juror, Mr. Orman? No, Your Honor. Mr. King? No, Your Honor. I, I, I believe this juror, and it seems to comport with what 673 said as well. Yes, I agree. And I will bring her back and just make sure... Uh, I advise her that she's not to uh, speculate about any of this and that she's not to uh, talk to any of the other jurors about it. So let's bring her back, please. The record should reflect that juror number 535 is back in the courtroom. Uh, welcome back. I want to thank you for your time and um, um, I, I want to ask you to not discuss any of this with the other jurors. Yes, Will you sir. promise me? I promise you. Okay. I give you so don't discuss, don't discuss any of my questions to you here today. And okay. don't discuss any of your answers, okay? Okay. Don't tell you them go. why I asked, I asked you to come in here alone. You got it. Will you promise that? I promise, I swear. And also, please don't speculate into why I'm asking you these questions. All right? Okay. Okay. Uh, can you promise me that you will put put it out of your mind and not speculate about this? I promise. All right. And will you promise, have you been following all my advisements from the beginning of the trial? Yes, sir. And will you continue to follow each and every one of my advisements related to your conduct when you're not here in the courtroom? You betcha. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. King, any other requests? Which I have one other request, and I, I frankly think I already know what the court's response is going to be. If, okay. If, uh, I'm going to request that, that we individually poll the remaining jurors to see if they've had any inadvertent contact to, to any of this or any other media contact. I, I would acknowledge what I expect the court is going to say is that we looks like we've identified a discrete group of folks that got together for – um, because of one of their to smoke and and we've questioned all the folks that 673 has said were part of that group um, I'm just requesting in an abundance of caution that we individually poll the rest of the jurors uh, and that's all your honor all right do the people have a position well I think it's clear at least from reading the the law from the other states that was in quoted in the Amjur article that I mentioned to the court that this is a matter completely within your honor's discretion and I think that if Your Honor has a discretion to do that if you want, but I don't think it's necessary. First of all, I think, frankly, doing that might have a chilling effect on the remainder of the jurors if something else happens in the future of, if, of the sort of being brought in and interrogated. I, so I think that there's a, a negative aspect to it. But frankly, there's just no rationale for it at this point. As Mr. King acknowledged, we have a group of jurors who are out there smoking. They've all sort of indicated who that group is. We've questioned all of them. Uh, none of them have indicated that, that this was conveyed to other people or anything like that. There's just no need to go through all the other jurors when we know the group of people that were involved. So I, I object to the proposed procedure for those reasons. Yeah, and I don't think that there's any basis at this time for it. I, I am satisfied that we have um, identified the group of folks who were involved or who were around at the time that the statements were made, the improper statements were made by juror number 872. Um, and we've addressed all of the folks who were present uh, during both incidents. Uh, I, I will add during my advisements that if they at any point overhear anyone talking about the case, including another juror, uh, that they need to let my staff know. Uh, and that should take care of it. I mean, if they have heard another juror talk about the case, then that should do it. Um, so at this time, the request is denied. Would counsel please approach so that we can talk about the alternates?
All right. Okay, that, that takes care of the juror issues for now. Uh, so we can get back to the normal course of business. I have to give you all a lunch break. Um, well, I don't have to, but I would like to. So I will do that. Uh, you should know that we had lunch brought to the jurors, and so the jurors are having lunch already, and so that'll save us some time. I have to make sure that uh, the sheriff has enough time to give Mr. Holmes his lunch. And so what if we took um, until uh, 2 o'clock, and then we start again at 2 o'clock and try to get Dr. Metzner done so that he doesn't miss his flight tomorrow? Does that sound reasonable to everyone? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, great. Enjoy your lunch. I'll see you back here at 2 o'clock. The court will be in recess. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Amanda Zitzman joining you alongside my colleagues, Erica Tinsley and Brian Hernandez. Some major developments here with the jury. The judge has excused three jurors in the Aurora Theater shooting trial. Now, this all stems from allegations by juror number 673 in seat 16. She says another juror made statements about seeing news articles related to the trial on Facebook and that two other jurors, number 495 and 412, may have been present at that time. These are allegations against juror number 872 in seat 9. So to get to the bottom of this, the judge questioned the jurors that may have been involved. Juror number 495 in seat 8 was called in first. She referenced the juror in seat 9 as jokingly making statements about checking news online, possibly during a recess. She said she took it as a joke, didn't hear anything with regards to the actual news coverage of the trial. Now, Juror number 412 in seat 19 was called in next. She told the judge that she didn't recall seeing or hearing anything related to media coverage of this case. And then they called in juror number 872 in seat 9, the one at the center of these allegations. She says her husband had called her and asked her if she knew about the attorney that had tweeted during the trial. She said she didn't, and she says they didn't discuss it any further. She also goes on to say that she scrolls through Facebook but scrolls past any articles related to the trial. The judge asked why she didn't come forward about her husband's comments. She apologized at that time, said there was really no excuse for it. So the judge ruled to release jurors number 872 and 412 and later to release juror number 495. That juror had mentioned another juror, juror number 593. She was called in, said she remembered hearing something about a mistrial, but walked away after that, didn't hear anything further, so she will stay. The defense had actually argued um, in relation to the juror that brought all of this forward, juror number 673, that she had been a tainted juror because she was exposed to the information about the tw uh, mistrial in addition to the district attorney's tweet that was leaked. Uh, the judge denied that. He believes that that juror will be fair and impartial. So big developments here. We have three jurors that have been released from this trial. We want to bring in Seven News legal analyst Dan Recht. Oh, he isn't ready for us yet, but we are working to get Seven News legal analyst Dan Recht for you to discuss exactly what this all means. So there was some speculation that there would actually be a mistrial here. Clearly, that is not the case. They have just released these three jurors in this trial the ones that were exposed to the information. The only one that is still here that was also exposed to the information is the whistleblower, juror number 673. And the judge repeatedly thanked her for coming forward, repeatedly called her an honest juror, and uh, said that he believes that she will be fair and impartial as this trial goes on. So to reiterate, again, major de developments here with the jury. The judge has excused three jurors in the Aurora Theater shooting trial. Uh, this stems from allegations by juror number 673. She had said another juror made statements about seeing news articles related to the trial on Facebook and that two other jurors, number 495 and 412, may have been present at the time. These are allegations that were against juror number 872 in seat 9. So to get to the bottom of it, the judge questioned 
everyone involved. He ultimately decided to release juror number 872 in addition to juror number 495 and juror number 412. The only one that had information related to this is juror number 673. She will still stay. She's in seat 16. Uh, the judge says that he believes she will be impartial despite the defense arguing that she was exposed to the same information as the other jurors that had been released. So we are still waiting to hear from our legal analyst Dan Recht. We're trying to set that up right now. Erica looks like she is dialing in with Dan Recht. So as soon as we get him, we can talk to him about, you know, where do we go from here? What does this mean uh, going forward in this trial? Right now, the uh, judge has allowed everyone to be released for a lunch break. So court is not in session as soon as it resumes. Of course, you can count on us to carry that live. Those of you that have been following along uh, with us on our live chat. If we can go over the poll, a lot of you had actually said that you thought the juror in question should be released uh, once this information was brought to light if it was in fact found to be truthful. Uh, I think it was about 90% had said that they felt that way. I do, I'm hearing that Dan Recht is available, so we wanna bring in Seven News legal analyst, uh, Dan Recht. And Dan, let's go ahead and start with, you know, obviously big developments in the trial, three jurors that have been dismissed. Where do we go from here? Well, the judge was pretty prudent and he took a lot of time, obviously, um, dealing with the jurors, talking to the jurors, trying to weed out if there was any problem. Um, and where we go from here is we continue the trial and now instead of uh, a total of 24 jurors, 12 jurors and 12 alternates. We will have 21 jurors, um, nine of whom um, are alternates. And keep in mind, importantly, no one knows, we don't know, and certainly those jurors don't know which of them are alternates and which of them are gonna be real jurors when it comes to deliberating concerns that there might be a mistrial in this case. Obviously, it didn't play out that way. The three jurors were released instead. What do you think about that? Why didn't it turn out that way? Is that something that normally would have happened? No, um, these are always judgment calls. It depends on the level of contamination of the jury. Um, and here, the judge and seemingly the attorneys as well agreed that it was um, innocent enough that if they got rid of those few jurors that he heard uh, the comments, that the rest of the uh, jury was not contaminated, was not prejudiced, and that they could go on. But that's not always the case. It really is fact specific. It, it depends on the level of problem within the jury and those, the level of problem is determined by the very process they just went through, questioning the jurors one by one. So the defense had argued that uh, the whistleblower in all this, juror number 673, was a, quote, tainted juror. But the judge denied that, said that he believes she will be fair and impartial. What are your thoughts on that? Because she was exposed to the same information as the other jurors that were released. Yeah, that, that was curious. Um, I, it was almost as if the judge was awarding her, to the extent it's an, it's an award to stay on the jury, for being um, the person that came forward. Uh, you'll recall the judge said she seemed to be the most credible. Uh, it was agonizing for her to even disclose this. She didn't, you know, she was pained by having to do it, but she was trying to do the right thing. And I had the sense that the judge um, didn't want to get rid of her as a juror because she had done the right thing. Sounds good. So going forward, what do you think uh, is the mindset of the jury? Do you think that there may have been more jurors involved in this? Will they look into that further or will they just, you know, move on from here? Well, I think we um, will move on from here. It, there's no indication that there were other jurors, but who knows? The one thing that was um, interesting and maybe remains interesting is that there certainly was a divisiveness um, among the jurors, and, and then, I mean, that's by definition. One juror was um, telling the judge about misconduct of another juror. Um, and divisiveness is uh, a very problematic thing for the prosecution. 
because keep in mind the prosecution has to prove their case so that there's a unanimous verdict and if they can't be unanimous it's a mistrial and so I would think the uh, prosecution is a, maybe a bit troubled by the notion that this jury is divisive in some way. All right, Dan Reck, thank you so much for joining us and for providing your insight. Again, three jurors have been released in the Aurora Theater shooting trial. We want to go ahead and replay for you exactly what went down in the courtroom as it unfolded. to reflect that juror number A72 is now present in the courtroom. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, I wanted to bring you in because I wanted to um, ask you if um, you have uh, been exposed to information about the case from a media report or any media reports, whether it's uh, through the internet, newspaper, or social media, including Facebook, your Facebook feed. No. I mean, my last, I think it was Thursday or Friday, my husband called me and he had asked me a question regarding something he's seen on Facebook, um, something about Twitter or something. And he was on speaker and I told him, look, I don't know anything about it. And that was basically the gist of it. Um, other than that, I haven't. What did, what did he say to you about Twitter? Well, he asked me if I knew who the... Uh, the lawyer was and I said no why and he was like well that idiot's tweeting on Facebook and that was pretty much how it goes on and he knows that I'm not supposed to talk about it and I, I don't read the newspaper and I you know when I watch TV it's not the news um, so I mean him and I got into a really big argument about it because he knows and it just so happened to be when we were on lunch and have you heard any other information about uh, related to the case, whether through your husband or anyone else, or whether through uh, the internet or um, any media reports from any source? Have you heard any information about the case? No. And even if I if I'm on Facebook or something, if I do see like the headlines of it, I I don't click the link. I I specifically stay away for that reason. And have you have you seen any of the headlines and read any of the headlines? Um, not, I mean, not knowingly. You know, you just skim over them. But other than that, I I don't like pick them out to find them. Have you discussed um, some of the, um, the this Twitter information that you received from your husband with other jurors? No, no, there. I don't know what her juror number was, but she was sitting right next to me when my husband had called me. And then when I hung up the phone with him, it was just kind of like, oh, what was that about? And I was like, well, you know, I, I don't know. What did you said? I don't know. Yeah. That... Well, I said, well, I told her, I was like, well, apparently this is what happened on Twitter. And what did you tell her happened? On Twitter? Just that one of the lawyers had tweeted about, I don't even. I don't even know what the tweet was about. I just know that he tweeted about the case during a testimony. I don't. I didn't read the tweet. I don't know what the tweet was about. And when when was this? Um, I think it was sometime last week. I honestly, I don't remember. And did your husband provide any other information to you about? No, no, I. I, basically, that was it, and then I got off the phone with him. Did he say uh, anything else related to the attorney or the party, uh, which side it was, or anything like that that he was referring to? No, he just asked. Well, he asked me who who George Brockler was, or who Brockler was, and I said, "Well, he's he's one of the the um, uh, one of the lawyers." And he was like, "Like I said, he said, well, that idiot tweeted during the the." the uh, testimony and that was it. I didn't ask what he tweeted or anything like that. During the breaks, do you usually hang out in the patio downstairs in the lounge area with a few of the jurors? Occasionally. Occasionally? Occasionally and if I don't, I'm out for lunch. Okay. All right. And do you remember talking to the other jurors about any of this conversation you had with your husband? I don't. 
Um, I mean, if it was, if this happened yesterday, maybe, but honestly, I don't, I don't remember. I don't think I did because I didn't have a conversation with anybody about it specifically. We didn't sit down. We didn't talk about it in conversation. It was just more of a in passing kind of thing. What, why didn't you bring it up to my attention? I, I've been telling jurors throughout that even if despite their best efforts, they inadvertently come upon any information related to the case, whether it's accurate or not, or whether uh, it's um, directly from the media or not, if they inadvertently come up on, or hear or overhear any information about the case, they should tell my staff that they need to talk to me. Right. You know, I mean, I, there's no excuse for me not telling you. It was more so I just really don't pay attention to my husband most of the time. So it 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 wasn't really that important I, at that time. I didn't expect, you know, anything out of it. So it was just kind of pushed under the rug and forgot about. Okay, let me have you step out for just a moment, please. Thank you. The record should reflect that uh, juror number 872 has now stepped out of the courtroom. Are there any other questions that the people want me to ask this juror? Well, Your Honor, I, I, I think that the original juror number um, 673, it also indicated a statement about a motion for a mistrial. I mean, that's awfully a specific question to ask, though. Right, that's um, why I didn't ask so it. I'm not asking anything about that. I just thought I would mention that that was not discussed with me. Right. Mr. King, any other questions that you want me to ask? I, I agree with Mr. Um, Orman's comment about that. I, I noted that as well. I also noted that <clears throat> the information from Juror 673 is rather specific about the information contained in the Twitter or tweet or whatever it is itself right. um, pertaining to the the video and it seemed to match very closely what the actual tweet was um, I would ask um, she I, if I re recollect correctly juror 872 said that she this phone call with her husband was on speaker uh, so perhaps we should ask if the others were there it sounds like the others were there and overheard it and that's why they had a conversation about it I'm pretty unclear about that but I will follow up with uh, juror number 872 about that. And, and perhaps we should also ask her if there was a second incident. I, I suppose you have asked if there are any other incidents. So. I have, and I just didn't want to ask, you know, did you hear anything about a mistrial? Um, that would um, be improper. So I'll bring her back and ask her about whether there was a second incident, and I'll ask her if um, when she had her husband on speaker, uh, if there were other jurors around uh, within distance to hear what was being said. Um, but um, regardless, um, I have some concerns about this juror and uh, if the parties are in agreement, and maybe this will make the additional questions, um, although I think it makes sense to ask the additional questions, so I will ask them, but if the parties are in agreement, uh, I am inclined to let her go to excuse her. So, is there any objection? Can I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. I mean, clearly, there has been a violation of my advisements. My advisements say you cannot obtain any information about the case, and if you obtain information about the case, even inadvertently, you have to tell me about it. You have to tell my staff that you need to talk to me. Furthermore, uh, between her and juror 673, I find juror 673 to be the more credible juror. And so I don't know that we're getting the full story from this particular juror. Not object, Your Honor. All right, Mr. King. We don't object to her being excused, Judge. We have additional concerns, though. Um, we, I have concerns, very serious concerns, about juror 412 and the way she responded to the court's questions. Um, so, so my thought is that we may need to go back and re-question these other jurors again about the information related by um, Juror 872 to determine whether that's the case. And we, we may be asking Judge to, to poll the panel um, individually well, about whether they anyone has any, had any contact with this juror or, or received any information. Let's take it one step at a time. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, Good. Understood. I have some concerns about Juror 412 as well, Mr. King. So I, um, I 
she took her time answering questions. She paused. Uh, she used words that suggested at times that she was holding something back or might be holding something back, such as saying, uh, not that I heard and processed. I, I don't know who answers questions that way when they are asked, did you hear something about this? Usually people tell you, no, I haven't heard anything. Uh, I, I didn't have concerns with juror number 495. Um, I thought juror 495 was being forthcoming, and it may well be that she just didn't hear uh, a whole lot other than she overheard um, juror number 872 say something along the lines of um, maybe looking something on a, on a phone, and she thought it was a joke and there, therefore didn't report it to the court. Um, but uh, I do have some concerns about juror number 412 as well in terms of her demeanor uh, and how credible she was with me, or, or perhaps the better word is how forthcoming she was with me. So. If the parties are asking me to release 412, um, I, I uh, would grant that request. Judge, may we have a moment, and, we'll, and while we're thinking about that, I, we have some concerns about 495 as well. Um, there were some long periods of silence when the court was asking its questions, um, and, and her statements are in direct contradiction of juror 673, um, and so that I mean, it sounded better when she said it, but it's contradicted by the very credible statements of Juror 673, so who specifically identified her. So I, our request is, is that you dismiss all three of them at this point in time, Judge. And um, we have 12 alternate jurors in this case, and that's why we have 12 alternate jurors. And we're, we're well into the case. We're more than halfway through the case. Um, and any kind of um, discrepancy should be resolved in, in favor of making sure that this is a, an impartial juror. And there's no harm in, in excusing these, these jurors. Essentially, we believe all four jurors should be excused, Judge. We believe that 673 has been tainted by her, what she's heard about the case. And we're, I'm willing to deal with that argument, too, when it comes, but I don't want to jump ahead of myself here. I'm yeah, sorry. I think we're jumping around a little bit. Uh, so let's deal one by one. Uh, first, there has been no objection already with respect to 872, and so I will release 872. The next question is 412. The defense is asking me to release number 412. And is there any objection to me releasing 412? Yes. Okay, 412 will be released. I, I, I agree with Mr. King. I had some concerns about her credibility when she was in here talking to me. 495, Mr. King is right that she her statement is inconsistent with what 673 said. However, it's possible that she just didn't hear it. It's possible that this is not an inconsistency. It's possible that 673... Um, thought that 495 would have heard this comment, but that 495, in fact, did not hear the comment. And so unless um, there's an agreement to release her as well, I'm inclined to follow up with her or actually follow up with perhaps 673 and see whether 673 thinks if um, that 495 was in a position where she would have been able to hear this conversation. I mean, this is not... Um, you know, one war we're talking about. This, these are a couple of comments, uh, two or three comments uh, that we're talking about. And so I think 673 may be able to shed further light on, as to whether she thinks 495 would have been close enough to, to have been able to hear this. Mr. Orman? Your Honor, I don't object to that. I, I, the only thing I think that should be noted is very often people are around things that are said and don't pay attention or don't remember. And it's possible that 495 was there whenever this conversation occurred, but it just didn't listen to it. And um, so I, I, I agree that there were some pauses with 495, but I think they were very different than the pauses with 412. It seemed to me the pauses with 495 where she was really thinking about trying to give an accurate answer to the court. That's the way it looked to me. So, yeah, that's how it looked to me as well. I, but. I will follow up with 673 before I have 
uh, before I make a determination with respect to 495 unless you have an objection to that. No, Judge, I do not. And, and I, I don't disagree with Mr. Orman that it's possible that she just didn't hear. Right. It's also possible that she did hear, and she doesn't want to tell us to get one of her fellow jurors in trouble. And my position is we should err on the side of caution. Okay, I got you. I will bring 673 back. In light of the decision to release A72 and 412, do you have any problem with me um, not following up with A72 as to the sec whether there was a second incident and as to whether she thinks anyone was around within a short distance when she had her husband on, on her speaker phone? Or do you still want me to follow up? I think her? we need to follow up on that, John. All right, I will follow up on those two questions. Let's bring A72 back, please. All right, the record should reflect that uh, number A72 is now back in the courtroom. Uh, thank you for your patience. A couple of follow-up questions. Was there a second incident um, where you discussed uh, something related to the case or someone discussed it with you? No. The, the only one that I can think of is, is the Twitter. And you said you had your husband on the speakerphone. Uh, do you know whether there were other jurors uh, within a close distance or a short distance, who would have been able, who would have been in position to hear what was being said? Um, well, there's usually four of us that all eat lunch in the same area, and I don't know of the other two that heard, um, but I'm sure the one sitting right next to me heard it. And who was sitting next to you? I don't know her juror number. Where, do, where does she sit? Right here. Okay, so that would have been juror number 412. Yeah. You think she would have heard it? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, if she heard it, she didn't say anything to but, me about it. But she was sitting right next to you? Yes. Who are the other people who usually eat lunch with you? Who would have been who would have been there during that time when you had your husband on the speakerphone? Um, I don't know. But I know she sits up in the back corner, and then the other one, I don't know where she sits. And the woman who sits in the back corner, it's the top row all the way at the end? Yes. And how close would she have been, was she, to, to you? Um, well, she was on the other side. I was sitting on the on the far end of, of the, um, the patio in the shade, and she was over walking in the sun. Yeah, uh, can you estimate for me how many steps she would have been away from you? Maybe about 25 feet. She was pretty far. 25 feet? Yeah. So she was pretty far. Yeah. And so, but uh, juror number, f uh, the other juror, juror number 412 was sitting right next to you. Yeah. So, okay. All right. All right. Give me just a second. I'm going to ask you to step out one more time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. All right, uh, the record should reflect that A72 has now stepped out of the courtroom. That confirms it for me that 412 was not being completely honest with us or perhaps without the completely. And I think that's what all, all, all of us thought, the parties and I, the attorneys and I all thought that, and that corroborates what I had concluded. So at this time, I'm going to bring A72 back, and I'm going to excuse her. Then I'm going to bring 412 back, and I'm going to excuse her. Neither one of them is going to be allowed to enter the jury, any of the jury rooms uh, while the other jurors are in there. They're going to be taken downstairs, and then when the jurors are not around, they'll be escorted so that they can get their uh, possessions and they, can, and they will be escorted out of the building. Okay? Okay, the records should reflect that juror number 872 is back in the courtroom. Uh, Ma'am, I'm going to go ahead and excuse you at this time. Uh, so you are uh, discharged from uh, jury um, service in this case. I want to advise you that you are prohibited from talking to any of the other jurors in the case. I know that you may have um, made acquaintanceships or friendships with some of the other jurors. You cannot talk to them uh, while they remain on the jury. Do you understand that? Yes. And you also cannot talk to the members of the media. I'm prohibiting you from talking to the members of the media until the trial is completed. Okay. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. The record should reflect that juror number 412 is back in the courtroom at this time. Ma'am, I'm going to go ahead and excuse you at this time. You're excused and discharged from 
uh, jury duty in this case. Um, you are not allowed to talk to any of the other jurors as long as the trial is pending, as long as the trial is continuing. You also are prohibited from talking to any, any members of the media until the trial is completed. And when I say trial, I mean the entire thing, including any proceedings that may be had in this case. Do you understand? I do. All right. Thank you. You're discharged. All right. Uh, next, I propose bringing in uh, juror number 673 and following up with her. Is that okay with everyone? Yes, sir. All right. Let's bring 673 back, please. The record should reflect that juror number 673 is back in the courtroom. Uh, Ma'am, I want to thank you again uh, for doing the right thing. You did the right thing, and I very much appreciate you doing this. I brought you back in because I want to follow up on the discussion we had earlier. You indicated that at the time that um, you heard um, these statements by uh, the juror who sits in seat number um, nine, juror number A72, that there were a couple of people present, a few people present, and one of the people that you identified is the person who sits in the top row all the way at the end, uh, which is seat number eight. That's uh, juror number um, 495. And my question is, do you remember how close she was in terms of distance uh, to the person making the statements? In other words, I'm trying to figure out what is it that made you believe that she may have heard these statements? Honestly, it's because it's usually the four of us talking. And so, I mean, maybe she was farther away from the group that was talking. I, I But usually we're close enough to where it's easy to hear. So usually you're close enough to each other that you'd be able to hear. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if she didn't hear it, she didn't hear it. I just, I know that all four of us were standing around. In juror number um, 872, the juror who sits in seat number nine, didn't make the statement just to you. No. She just made the statement. Yes. Did you see her at any point speaking on her phone, on speaker phone with anyone? No. No, you didn't see that part? No. And you didn't hear her talking to her husband on speaker phone about anything? No. But you remember her making the statements that you said she made both last week and also yesterday? Yes. And do uh, you think in both incidents, the uh, person who sits in seat number eight, juror number 495, was in the area, the, the vicinity? Yes, I, I know yesterday for sure. For sure yesterday she was in the vicinity? Yes. Okay. And then I'm pretty sure, almost positive, that the other time as well. Okay. What about the uh, person who sits in the fourth seat from the end in the top row? I understand that sometimes she uh, goes on break with you folks in the patio, juror number 535. Do you know whether she was there? I don't. That's why I didn't mention her. 
Okay. Do you do you recall her not being there or her being there or do you just not remember? I don't remember. You don't remember. Okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Let me have you step out again. Thank you very much. Okay, the record should reflect that uh, juror number 673 has now stepped out of the courtroom again. Given that record, I'm inclined to grant the defense's request to release number 495. I think uh, 673, juror number 673 is the most honest of all these jurors that I've spoken to today. And I believe what she says. I think she's being very candid with the court. I think this was a hard thing for her. Uh, she's not looking like she's getting any pleasure out of this at all. This is uh, actually uh, seemingly painful for her, but I think she's doing it because she felt it was the right thing to do, and I appreciate her doing that. But I find her to be the most honest of all the jurors. And if she's telling me that uh, juror number 495 was in the vicinity, um, then I believe her. And uh, again, you know, this isn't a... a um, one word type of thing. There are multiple comments, um, and I think it's likely that four night, juror number 495 would have heard uh, some, if not all, of these comments. So um, I'm inclined to grant the request. Is there any objection? I don't object, Your Honor. All right, I will release number 495. So um, before we take 673 back, to the jury room she's just she's still she's waiting in the hallway right yes um mr king i think you had said that you wanted uh you might have a request to excuse her or perhaps you actually made the request to excuse 673 um do you want to make that request still yes please okay and, and, and i could not agree with the court more I, I think that she's doing the right thing i think that she's being very honest um, I'm just very concerned about the nature of the information that she's been revealed to. She now knows about a mistrial, uh, she know, a request for a mistrial that was denied. That's likely could have a prejudicial effect. She's like, she knows about uh, the tweeting thing and, um, uh, and, and Lord knows what else. So I, I just think we, uh, I'm requesting that we dismiss her as well. Well, what, what she has heard, number one, she didn't hear from the media directly uh, or from any news source directly, she heard it from another juror who claimed that she got it from her Facebook feed. So for one thing, she doesn't know uh, if this is accurate or not, and she said that when she was in here. Um, number two, um, she heard that they, they have tried to call a mistrial, but she said she didn't know which side and that the attorneys have now been prohibited from using or from having phones uh, in the courtroom, and that one of the attorneys posted on Twitter that he or she hoped the jury saw part of the video, and the judge was mad, uh, but she didn't know which attorney it was, and she didn't know if it was a female or male attorney, and she didn't know if it was a prosecutor or a defense attorney, um, and she didn't know what came of the, uh, if anything, of the attempt by anyone to call a mistrial. Um, so, I, I, you know, I read the People versus Moore case, 321 Pacific 3rd, 310, a Colorado Court of Appeals case from 2010. And uh, that case is not on point, but that's a case in which it um, was revealed to the court that there had been, uh, that the jury has, had been exposed to a newspaper article containing prejudicial information about the defendant. Uh, and the court set forth the analysis that trial court judges should engage in if this situation arises. And what the Court of Appeals said is that uh, a trial court should deal with juror exposure to prejudicial publicity during the trial as follows. Number one, the trial court must determine whether the publicity is inherently prejudicial. Number two, if so, the court should canvass the jury to determine whether the jury learned of the prejudicial publicity and number three, the trial court should individually examine exposed jurors to determine how much they know of the publicity and what effect, if any, the publicity, publicity will have on their deliberations. Now, I have questioned um, multiple jurors now, including juror number 673. Uh, this information that juror 673 heard, in my view, is not inherently prejudicial information uh, to the defendant. 
Um, she doesn't know who it was related to. She only knows vague or general uh, details. Uh, and Mr. King said, who knows what else she has heard? You know, we can't have it both ways. We can't on the one hand say, boy, she's really honest and really candid with the court. And on the other hand, say, who knows what else she heard that she's not telling us. I think we either trust her and rely on her or we don't. And I find her very reliable and trustworthy. I think she's being very candid with the court. And so when she tells me, this is what I've heard, I believe her completely. And so if this is all she's heard, I don't see how this is inherently prejudicial to the defendant. And then um, I have examined her individually, and I will examine her further, but I have examined her about what effect, if any, the publicity will have on her deliberations, or actually I asked on her ability to be fair and impartial, and she said none. I can still be fair and impartial. I will still be fair and impartial. I will bring her back and ask her uh, about what effect, if any, uh, this information may have on her deliberations or what effect, if any, it will have on any decision she makes in this trial and whether this information will at any point um, influence her in any way or affect her uh, decision making or be in the back of her mind at any point during the trial. Well, good afternoon. I want to say hello and uh, welcome you all to joining us if you're just joining us during this lunch break. But I also want to give a really powerful shout out to Amanda Zitzman, who did an absolutely incredible job anchoring this coverage all the way through the morning. She has departed now for home because she started, was on our morning shows if you're in the Colorado area and we're, we're able to watch 7 News this morning. Um, she was on that all throughout the morning, had a 3 a.m. wake up call, and so we have let her go home to get some sleep and we'll be seeing more of her. She did such an exceptional job, so I'm sure we'll try to steal her more for this coverage as it goes on. Uh, what you were just listening to, what Erica Tinsley played for you there during that segment of our recess, here our lunch recess, which has just a little bit while left to go, we heard from jurors 872 and 673. 673, of course, is the juror who brought up the issue that we've spent the day on, the, the, the fact that a juror, juror 872, um, received a phone call that told her about media coverage of the, of the trial, a tweet from District Attorney George Brockler uh, and the mistrial request. Now what we'd like to do is replay for you the other two jurors who are dismissed, their questioning and then the decision to dismiss them. And this should take us through the afternoon. This afternoon, of course, we expect to hear the end of the redirect examination of Dr. Metzner, but in the meantime, we are going to listen again to the highlights uh, and the decision of the questioning from jurors 412 and 495. All right, Mr. Uh, King, have you had an opportunity to think about uh, the issue that came up earlier today with respect to the note that I have marked as question form number 173? Yes, Your Honor. And, and how would you like to, and for the record, I think we actually were on break for more than an hour, as it turns out, uh, although I don't know how much of that time you actually had to think about this or to work on this, but um, how would you like the court to proceed? At this point in time, to begin with, we think we need to question individually the three jurors that were mentioned by juror number 673 as being present um, w when these comments were made. Uh, we think we should do that individually. Um, we understand that the court will probably want to ask questions of the jurors first. Our request would be that we allow, be allowed to ask follow-up questions, um, possibly uh, with the court's uh, approval, um, and then we are, are prepared to make some decisions about what we think needs to happen after that based upon the responses that these jurors give. Do you have a preference uh, or a position as to which of the three jurors should be questioned first? No, we'll leave that to the court's discretion. All right. Uh, the people, Mr. Orman? Your Honor, I agree with what counsel suggested, although I think that in the middle of a trial, under these circumstances, all the questions should be done by the court. I don't think attorneys should be questioning these jurors at this point. That, that's my position as well. However, I will give counsel an opportunity to suggest questions that they think I should ask. And so 
we will proceed as we have been doing throughout the trial in terms of questioning jurors individually about any issues. I will ask the questions. I will then ask the juror to step out and I will ask counsel if there are any additional questions that they think are appropriate or that they would like me to ask and then we'll proceed in that fashion, okay? Understood. All right. Which juror is the court considering beginning with? I'm going to bring in uh, juror number 495 first. That's the juror sitting in seat number 8. So let's have juror 495, please. Good morning. It's still morning. It's 5 till 12. So good morning. <laughs> good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. All right. Uh, I brought you in because uh, I, I have been informed that um, a juror may have made statements. Attorneys, uh, Ms. Brady, Mr. King, Ms. Nelson, Ms. Higgs, and Ms. Spengler, and the prosecution is represented by uh, Mr. Proctor, Mr. Orman, Ms. Pearson, Ms. Stitch McGuire, and Mr. Edson. We are outside the presence of the jury. I, uh, I think it makes sense to have the parties not contact any of these dismissed jurors until the proceedings are over. If the parties are intending to, to contact them, um, um, we can have, I can hear argument on that. Do the parties know at this time what they're intending to do that before the proceedings are over? It hadn't crossed our mind to do it, and we don't have any intention to do so, Your Honor. All right, Mr. King. Uh, Judge, if, if we um, decide that we need to do that for some reason, we can bring it to the court's attention. Please, thank you. All right. Uh, let's bring the jury in, please. Yes, please.
Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom. Good afternoon, folks. I want to thank you for your patience today. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. I know we had lunch brought in. Uh, we figure we, we would do that given um, how long you had to wait for us. But I, I very much appreciate how patient you've been. You may have noticed or you may be noticing now that uh, there are three of you missing. We've lost three jurors. Please don't speculate about that. Uh, don't think about uh, why that happened or, or what happened. You should not speculate about any of that. I have prohibited those three jurors from having any contact with you related to this case. And I am prohibiting you from having any contact whatsoever with them. I say whatsoever because, frankly, um, given that this is where you met, uh, if one of them contacts you, it, it seems to me uh, almost impossible that something about this case is not going to come up. So, um, so don't you, you are, as one of the advisements that I have been giving you with respect to your conduct when you're not here in the courtroom, there's one that I'm adding, and that is you cannot have any contact of any kind with any of these three jurors who have been released, whether it's by phone, whether it's through email, whether it's in person, uh, social media, through any means, no contact about anything, whether related to the case or not. Does everybody understand that? Yes. And everybody's nodding their head yes and saying yes. Okay, great, thank you. At the end of the day yesterday, Dr. Reed was on the witness stand. Dr. Reed, excuse me, Dr. Metzner, this is what happens when you say it so many times. Dr. Metzner was on the witness stand, and now Dr. Metzner has resumed the witness stand. And I remind you, Dr. Metzner, that you're still under oath. And before I allow Mr. Brockler to proceed with the rest of his redirect examination, I want to remind you, members of the jury, that the court has admitted the testimony of Dr. Metzner only for a limited purpose. You may consider this testimony only as to the issues raised by the defendant's plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. You shall not consider this evidence for any other purpose. Please remember that whenever I refer in this trial to the issues raised by the defendant's plea of not guilty by reason of insanity, and I have referred to that before, I mean two questions, and that is issues related to two questions. Number one, whether the defendant was so diseased or defective in mind at the time of the commission of the act as to be incapable of distinguishing right from wrong with respect to that act. And number two, whether the defendant suffered from a condition of mind caused by a mental disease or defect that prevented him from forming a culpable mental state that is an element of a crime charged. Um, I mentioned yesterday uh, that I have told you in the past about the elements that make up each of the crimes charged in this case. One of the elements of each of the crimes charged in this case is sanity. The prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt each and every element of each crime charged, and one of those elements is that the defendant was not insane at the time of the commission of the act. And so um, when I talk about um, evidence being admitted only for the limited purposes, uh, purpose of the issues raised by the defendant's plea of not guilty by insanity, not guilty by reason of insanity, I mean only related to that one element. Okay, so you cannot consider it with respect to any other element of any crime charge. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Everybody understands that and everybody's nodding their head yes and saying yes. Okay, with that, Mr. Brockler, you may proceed with the rest of your redirect examination of Dr. Metzner. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Metzner, yesterday uh, there was some conversation during cross-examination about uh, malingering and the tests that were um, validity tests and tests for maling malingering. Do you remember that? I do. I want to make sure that we're clear on what those tests and your opinions about malingering are and what they are not. Are those validity tests and those, um, those tests for malingering, are those guarantees of accuracy or trustworthiness for all the statements that the defendant makes? No. What is it that they're talking about when you talk about malingering? What, what those tests talk about, and my opinions when I'm talking about malingering, 
I think the tests are very consistent with my opinion that Mr. Holmes wasn't faking a mental illness. And that's what those tests say. What those tests don't say is that every statement that Mr. Holmes has said, has told me at least, is either accurate or reliable. But that, that's, that's different than malingering. Give us some examples of some of the reliability issues that you came across that are not dispelled by these malingering tests. Well, for example, there's, as I've testified before, there's certain information that I received from Mr. Holmes that was different around the same event that, say, Dr. Gurr received from Mr. Holmes. And so both of those statements one of those statements is probably not accurate. And so malingering doesn't say, malingering test doesn't say anything about that. And the fact that they're not accurate just means that's an example of a statement that may not be reliable, despite him not malingering. There's no question he has an illness. Let's talk about the, the unreliable statements then. What statement did he make to you that differs from what he told Dr. Gurr regarding what he'd have thought, he thought he'd accomplish inside the theater? So, for, well, so he it's all been asked and answered and gone over. Overruled. Go ahead, sir. So, so he told me the goal of going to the theater was to shoot as many people as he could, and he told Dr. Gurr um, that. I'm going to object as to what he told Dr. Gurr. Overruled. Go ahead, sir. What was in Dr. Gurr's report was that he told Dr. Gurr that. He, um, he didn't think that he, that he would kill people, that it would harm people. That's a pretty big difference. And so that's an example. There was some question by Mr. King on cross-examination about trying to suggest an alternate explanation for a call for action and his reference to needing to take action. Do you recall that? Yes. I want to ask you, and again, under the, the caption here, reliability, did you specifically ask the defendant about a quoted phrase from Dr. Gurr's report? I did. And it appears how many times do you think in that report? Multiple? Yes. And when you ask the defendant specifically about that phrase in quotes in Dr. Gurr's report, tell us what he told you. Okay, I, I just want to be accurate. I'm, yes, sir. I'm going to I'll give you the page number in a minute. I'm looking at my report. And I'm objecting, Judge. This has been asked and answered very clearly. Overruled, and uh, it's overruled under Rule 611A. Well, Specifically with, I'm referring to page seven, specifically with regards to the quotes call for action, he just made it clear to me that he had not used that phrase call for action. Now, did you follow up with Dr. Gurr about that to see if maybe there had been a mistake or if she'd misheard it? I did. What'd she say? And she said that he had used the term call for action. Did you... Confront the defendant about that? Objection. Asked and answered. Overruled. Yes, and he didn't have an explanation for the discrepancy. Now, uh, Mr. King had asked you before uh, on cross-examination about whether delusions have the ability to change over time. Do you remember that? Yes. Is this what we're talking about right here, in your opinion, the result of some sort of change delusion? I, no, I don't think th th that is an example of that. Another one, uh, another area that you touched upon. He told you why he didn't study for those prelims. Do you remember that? Yes. What was it he told you? What he told me was that he had always studied in the past due to fear of not doing well and not pleasing others, and he decided he was going to be himself. and and not do it because of fear. Now, did you find a statement to, that he made to Dr. Reed to be in contrast to that, calling into question the reliability of that statement? Objection. Leading. 
uh, sustain us to leading. Uh, you can rephrase the question, and that ruling is pursuant to Rule uh, 611C. It's also beyond the scope of my cross-examination. I didn't ask about it, this doctor about any statements made to Dr. Reed. The objection as to beyond the scope is overruled under Rule 611D. Did he give an answer about why he didn't study to Dr. Reed? Yes. Was that answer consistent with what he gave you? It was different than the answer that he gave me. Do you remember what he gave Dr. Reed? I believe that the answer that he gave Dr. Reed was... <coughs> Judge, I'm going to object to any speculation about what the statement was. All right. Uh, why don't you establish foundation with respect to the statement made to Dr. Reed and this witness's knowledge of that statement, yes, if sir. any? Yes, sir. Did you review the uh, videotape? the 22 hours of videotape that Dr. Reed uh, took of his assessment of the defendant? I reviewed that and the transcript of the videotape. And based on that, do you know what it was that the defendant gave as a reason why he didn't study with Dr. Reed? I can tell you what my memory is of what that was. Yes, sir. And my memory of what that was is it had to do with um, it would be suspicious if he just dropped out of school and that by failing, that wouldn't raise suspicions. There was some conversation, do uh, you recall, in cross-examination about um, the defendant's interactions with Drs. Fenton and Feinstein. Do you recall that? Yes. One of the things that Mr. King asked you about was about possible uh, manic impacts caused by uh, some of the drugs that were prescribed by Dr. Fenton. Do you recall that conversation? Yes. To your knowledge, based on what you reviewed from Drs. Fenton and Feinstein, as well as your conversations with them, did the defendant ever report to them feeling manic? He did not. Did they ever observe him displaying manic symptoms? They did not. How about um, depression? Did he ever express to them that he was depressed? He told me on at least one occasion that he did. They said that he had not. And that's borne out, too, by their notes? Correct. Did he ever display to them any symptoms of seeming depressed? They didn't observe that. How about suicide? Did they ask him whether or not he was feeling suicidal or had suicidal thoughts? I'm sorry. We're doing real time looking at the transcript. I just want to make sure the last answer to the question about did they observe any signs of depression with the defendant, you said what? I said I did, do not think that they did. Okay. In terms of um, feeling suicidal, did they ask the defendant, in fact, when I say they, I mean Ms. Roth, Dr. Fenton, Dr. Feinstein, did they ask him whether he was uh, feeling suicidal? Yes. And what did he tell them? And he denied suicidal thinking. Every time? Correct. In fact, did he uh, answer a question about whether or not he'd ever attempted suicide with them? I believe so, and, and there wasn't a history of past suicide attempts that was elicited. Thank you. One of the other things that was talked about in cross-examination was this idea of someone believing that something was illegally wrong, but could they then believe that it was still socially acceptable? Do you recall that exchange? Yes. Can you, and I should have done this in direct. But in light of cross, can you give us an example of something that someone could do in terms of a crime that is illegal, and they'd know it was illegal, but they would believe that it was socially acceptable or within the societal standards of morality? Objection is to relevance. Um, overruled? Go ahead, sir. A, a person could have a paranoid delusion in which the delusion was that Joe Smith is going to kill my family, and and Joe Smith could come to come to the house, and the person could shoot Joe Smith because he thought what he was doing was morally right within societal standards because he was defending his family, but it was all based on a delusional concept, even though he knew that killing someone was illegal. Any that would be an example. Thank you. Anything like that applicable here to these facts? Objection. Calls for speculation. Overruled? Well, that, that was, the, that was the, the assessment that I had to make because, as I've said before, Mr. Holmes had a delusion 
he acted on the delusion, which was related to everything that he did. But in my opinion, for the reasons I've already given, I thought that he had the capacity to distinguish the difference between right from wrong at the time of the commission of the alleged acts. Let's go even farther. Did the defendant at any time during your 25 and a half hours with him ever express to you that he believed that what he did was either socially acceptable or that society would accept and agree with what he did? No. Are there any actions that you have seen in the now 90,000 plus pages of discovery, the videos, the audio, the pictures, everything, that suggest that the defendant believed that what he had done in that theater by murdering those people and trying to kill the others would have been socially acceptable or that society would understand and approve of it? No. Again, in terms of talking about the capacity to know right from wrong based on societal standards of morality, is being delusional and, and thus having a psychosis, does that mean automatically you lack the capacity to know right from wrong? Objection. Asked and answered. Um, overruled? It does not. The delusion here you have talked about really in two parts. Uh, is that true? Yes. Is one of those parts that the defendant believed he would increase his self-worth by murdering people? Correct. And the other part is that he would uh, feel better? Objection. Asked and answered. Sustained. Doctor, is the part of the delusion uh, about increasing his self-worth also in part about making himself feel better because of the increased self-worth? Objection. Asked and answered. Sustained. When the defendant um, carried out his two and a half plus month plans uh, on the 19th and 20th of July, is it your opinion that he was doing that? that he intended to kill people to make himself feel better. Objection. Your Honor calls for the ultimate conclusion. Aiding the province of the jury. All right. Give me just a moment. It's invading the province of the jury. Um. The objection is overruled. Uh, doctor, if you can answer it uh, without speculating based on an opinion that you have or based on your expertise, then you're able to, you're um, permitted to answer it. Can I have the question repeated? Yes. Mr. Brocker, do you want to repeat the question? Can I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Um, I think, because I put a lot of words in it, I'm sorry. I think what I was asking you was, is it your opinion that the defendant's decision to carry out this, to execute this two and a half month plan on the 19th and 20th of July to include killing those people in that theater was to make himself feel better? Objection. Asked and answered. Overruled. Yes, that was part of his delusional belief, and it's my opinion that that's why he did that. Can we understand, in your opinion, that desire to increase his self worth? and that desire to feel better as his motivation for why he did what he did. Yes. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. All right, Mr. King, do you have any recross for Dr. Metzner? Yes, right. Very brief. Doctor, you were asked some questions about <laughs> some alleged inconsistencies in statements that were made by Mr. Holmes. Uh, suffice it to say, the fact that you find inconsistencies in what one person says over time when they're relating events that happened years before, before they were medicated, and when they were in a psychotic state, that doesn't mean that they're malingering, does it? No, it does not mean that the Merlingering. And those inconsistencies did not have a significant impact on your opinions, did they? That's correct. 
Very few evaluations, very few, with the kind of history and investigation that took place in this case, will you find no inconsistencies, correct? Correct. As a matter of fact, if someone were to be completely consistent when they recalled events to you over and over again, that would cause you concern that they might be malingering because that would suggest that they had planned it out or had been coached, correct? It would be concerning. So the fact that there are inconsistencies is not concerning in terms of your opinions. Fair to say? It doesn't change my opinions, and it depends on the nature of the inconsistencies. I would not say that none of those inconsistencies are not concerning, but I would agree with you that none of those inconsistencies changes my opinion. Now, Mr. Brockler just asked you about making himself feel better. Now, to be clear, is this making himself feel better in kind of a, um, a, a physical way? No. Is it making himself feel better, is that a, a psychotic concept for him to have, that killing other people would alleviate his depression and make him feel better? It was a psychotic concept. A psychotic delusion, and that's what the th shooting was based on. Is that correct? That's correct. I don't have any other questions. All right, thank you. Dr. Metzner, the jury may have questions for you. Could you give us a moment, please? Yes. Thank you. Would counsel please approach?
Members of the jury, um, I have a little bit of an unusual request. Uh, so just go along with me, if, if you would. Indulge me, please. Uh, I know that you submitted, um, there are three forms with questions. And I don't know who submitted the questions, and I don't need to know who submitted the questions. Uh, as you know, these are anonymous. But the folks who submitted these questions, and it appears to be uh, three different people based on the handwriting being different on the forms. If you would please resubmit the questions, um, I would appreciate that. So those of you who submitted questions for Dr. Metzner, uh, if you would write them again, and then my staff will come and collect them from you, okay? So I'll give you a moment. I'm not going to look your way because I don't want to know who's submitting questions. All right, we'll take, a, we'll take a moment to have you do that. Thank you. Thank you for indulging me. And Dr. Metzner, thank you for your patience. Thank you. Would counsel please approach? This is what they call um, deja vu all over again. <laughs>
Dr. Metzner, the jury has submitted um, three questions that are related, uh, and I have found uh, that these questions are appropriate based under the rules of evidence and other applicable rules of law. Uh, the first question, I'm going to read all three of them together, and if you need me to repeat any part of it, you let me know. The question is as follows. When was Zoloft prescribed? How long to start showing effects? How long until full effect? Let me give you the exact date. I want to, because it's in Dr. Fenton's notes, so I'm going to refer, I think it was the second session, but let me look it up and I'll give you the page number from my report. So, Dr. Fenton first saw Mr. Holmes on March 21st, and that's when Zoloft was initially prescribed. It was initially prescribed 50 milligrams a day with the plan to increase it to 100 to 200 milligrams. The and then the question was how long does it take effect? Let me answer it two ways. It's to remind the jury that Zoloft, despite it being called an antidepressant medication, it's used for other things, and it was specifically prescribed for his obsessive compulsive uh, symptoms. For depression, once you get a therapeutic dose and the fifty milligrams. Uh, most people would say it's not a therapeutic dose. What you tell a patient is this could take four to six weeks before it takes effect. Some people it works much faster, but you can't, you got to be on a therapeutic dose for at least four to six weeks before it takes effect. Now, that's for depression. I think for um, obsessive compulsive traits, you would say the same thing that some people will get an effect fairly soon, most people don't, and you'll tell them you got to be on it for at least four to six weeks. I don't think that, let me just look at a couple other records about the Zoloft. It was increased on April 17 to 150 milligrams. So that, that's the best. I think, was there a third part to that question? Uh, the second part was how long to start showing effects, which I think you've answered. The last part was how long till full effect. And you may have answered that as well. Y yes. It, it, you got to be on it for four to six. If, you, if you're not getting an, uh, an effect within six weeks, then you would say we have to try another medication. Any follow-up questions based on those questions and answers, Mr. Brockley? Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Okay. Hey, uh, Doctor, given when it was prescribed that you've testified to, during the time that the defendant was seeing Dr. Fenton and Feinstein, would there have been, uh, would we expect to see any effects from that sertraline, that Zoloft that had been prescribed during the period of time that he had been seen by them? It's possible, and again, remember the history that he gave me is that once he got on sertraline, that if you read his notebook, that's when he describes manic-like symptoms. That's also when he describes losing the fear. A and it's, it's conceivable that that was related to the medication. Now, is it, do you prescribe sertraline? Yes. A and you have for a long time? Yes. Um, in this particular case, you've already testified on redirect that there was no observed or reported manic symptoms. Uh, to Drs. Fenton and Feinstein, did the defendant ever report any uh, ill or otherwise side effects from the sertraline to Drs. Fenton and Feinstein that you're aware of? Objection. Asked and answered. Overruled? I don't think that he reported symptoms. 
uh, rec related to that. And you had also testified earlier, was it this drug or some other drug that you said he had discontinued on his own? I think that I had mentioned that he had stopped the Zoloft, the sertraline. I'm, I'm not sure of that, too. Uh, I, I can't, I'm not sure whether he, in fact, did that or not. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not, uh, for, for the point of this question, do you have an opinion as to whether or not the sertraline is what caused this uh, murderous conduct by the defendant? Judge, objection. Um, it's, this is way beyond the scope of the juror's question. The juror's question just related to the, when and how the effects take, take effect. Mr. Brockler? Well, Your Honor, I think the question is when would this reach full effect? And uh, I mean, I can rephrase the question to be would the full effect have caused him to. I'll move? sustain the objection. You can rephrase your question and we'll see if there's an objection. Doctor, for whatever is meant by the full effect of sertraline, do you have an opinion as to whether or not the full effect of sertraline, based on what was prescribed and when it was prescribed, would have caused the defendant to not have the capacity to know right from wrong based on societal standards of morality or to be able to form the culpable mental states related to the crimes in this case? Objection, Judge. Way beyond the scope of the juror's question. Overruled. I don't think the search lane had an impact on whether he did or did not have the capacity to distinguish the difference between right from wrong. Thank you. All right. Any follow-up questions from you, Mr. King? Uh, just one. Um, you do think that the sertraline may have um, made his the mental illness worse and I, may I, have contributed to the delusional um, beliefs that he ended up acting on. I don't think it. I don't think it contributed to delusional beliefs. He had the delusional beliefs before. I think it's for a short period of time. It's conceivable that. It could have made his condition worse. All right. May Dr. Metzner be released from his subpoena? Okay. All right. Dr. Metzner, you're subject to being called again, okay? But you're done for now. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your patience today. Thank you. Your All right, Mr. Orman, call your next witness, please. Before we do that, can I approach with counsel, Your Honor, just yes. to ask the question of the court? Yep. Pearson, your, your Honor, the people called Dale Higashi. Please tell us your full name for the record and spell your first, middle, and last names. Certainly. Dale Mikio Higashi, D-A-L-E. Middle name is M-I-K-I-O. Last name is H-I-G-A-S-H-I. -S All right, Ms. Pearson, you may proceed. Agent Higashi, would you tell us where you work, please? Okay, I am currently employed by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation. What does the Colorado Bureau of Investigation do? Uh, we have a forensic laboratory that supports uh, most of the um, local agencies throughout the state, other than the Denver Police Department and Colorado Springs. We service all of those agencies with our forensic services, and we also have an investigative staff that helps uh, regular investigations uh, throughout the state. 
Are there different disciplines at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and is that called CBI? Yes, uh, the CBI laboratory has um, probably six or seven different disciplines. I'd have to count. Which one do you work in? I work in the firearms and tool mark section. How long have you been employed at CBI? I've been there for uh, coming up on 11 years. What's your actual title at CBI? It's a laboratory agent. What do your duties consist of? My, my duties in the firearms section are to analyze uh, firearms and firearms related evidence. Uh, we help detectives determine uh, type and caliber of unknown uh, shootings, let's say, if we get fired bullets or fired casings submitted to the laboratory. If they happen to uh, recover a firearm involved, I'll go through that firearm, make sure that it functions uh, properly. I'll attempt to test fire that uh, firearm to generate um, exemplars of what that particular gun does to fired bullets and fired casings. I'll also determine if the gun is capable of inflicting serious injury or death, and ultimately make those comparisons between the fired ammunition evidence um, to the test fired, ev uh, test fired bullets and cartridge cases from that suspect firearm and make a determination if that is indeed the gun used uh, in the commission of that crime. Do you have other duties at CBI as well? Yes, I do. What are those? Um, I also serve as our department armorer, so I'm the one that helps uh, maintain the agent's uh, firearms, make sure that they're working properly, and I'm also one of the uh, firearms instructors. What kind of weapons do you maintain as an armorer at CBI? At CBI, our normal um, issued duty firearm is a Glock 23, a 40 Smith & Wesson caliber semi-automatic pistol. Uh, we also have some... Uh, a Colt semi-automatic AR-15s and uh, Remington 870 shotguns. Now, did you also say that you're a range officer? Yes, ma'am. And what do you do as a range officer? Uh, we help instruct our uh, field agents in the proper use of their firearms, um, pistols, rifles, and shotguns. Where did you work prior to joining CBI? Uh, prior to CBI, I was a uh, senior criminalist with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department Crime Lab. What did you do there in Los Angeles? Uh, for the first four years, I was a uh, narcotics uh, chemist where I analyzed uh, drugs. And then uh, from 1990 to 20, 2004, I worked in their firearms section. What's your educational background? I have a Bachelor of Science degree in uh, microbiology from California State University at Long Beach. Now, you indicated that you first became a firearms, or you worked as a firearms examiner beginning in 1990? Yes, ma'am. What kind of training did you have to become a firearms and tool mark examiner? I underwent a two-year training program. Um, I worked under the direct supervision of four other examiners in Los Angeles uh, who had in excess of 40 years' experience with firearms identification. So I underwent the two-year training program that's uh, laid out by an association that um, most firearms examiners belong to. It's called the Association of Firearms and Toolmark Examiners. Since that time, have you continued to have training in firearms and toolmark examination? Yes. How do you undergo additional training? Additional training can consist of uh, going to the, uh, the seminars that they put on and other uh, firearms-related um, information that I can gather. Sometimes I'll go to the... Um, the weapons manufacturers, they put on something in Las Vegas called the SHOT Show where they bring out new guns, new ammunition components that are available to the public. So that's, again, something that a firearms examiner wants to uh, be on top of. So uh, it, it varies, but there's always continuing education in, in my field. Do you belong to any professional associations that are related to firearms and tool mark examination? Yes, I am a regular member of the Association of Firearms and Toolmark Examiners. Do you stay up to date with new developments and changes in the, the field of firearms and toolmark examination? Yes, I do, and I'm on their website pretty much daily. Have you testified as an expert in the field of firearms and toolmark examination? Yes, I have. Could you tell us how many times and in what counties or what states? Okay. Uh, in the state of Colorado, in excess of 130 times, and I've been all over the state uh, from the south, uh, Werfano County, out in um, Durango. I've been out west and most of the metro area. And then in uh, the state of California, I would estimate 
probably close to 500 prior occasions in mostly Los Angeles County Superior Courts. Your Honor, I would move for the admittance of Dale Hagashi as an expert in the forensic examination of ballistics, firearms, and tool marks. Without objection. All right. Without objection and pursuant to Rule 702 of the Colorado Rules of Evidence, the Colorado Supreme Court's decision in People v. Shrek, uh, 22 Pacific 3rd, 68, Colorado 2001, and my previous ruling in this case, which is Order D110A, the court qualifies Agent Dale Higashi as an expert witness in the field of, did you say firearms? Your Honor, I asked for the forensic examination of ballistics, firearms, and tool marks. in the field of forensic examination of ballistics, firearms, and tool marks. And so, members of the jury, uh, what that means is that Agent Higashi has now uh, been accepted by the court as an expert witness, and he may now render expert opinions in the field of forensic, the forensic examination of ballistics, firearms, and tool marks. Please keep in mind that you're not bound by the testimony of a witness, who testifies as an expert. The credibility of an expert's testimony is to be considered as that of any other witness. You may believe all of an expert witness's testimony, part of it or none of it. The weight that you give the testimony is entirely your decision. Uh, before you proceed, would counsel please approach for just a moment. All right, Ms. Pearson, you may proceed. Uh, first of all, Agent Higashi, what are tool marks? Tool marks are any marks made, uh, a tool is considered a, a hard object. It's any mark that that would make on a softer object. So if you can imagine a screwdriver, a nut being used as a screwdriver, may, maybe as a pry tool against a, a metal strike plate, the harder surface of the tool, the screwdriver, can impart its own unique signature based on how it was made uh, onto the surface of the strike plate. If that were part of uh, my investigation, I might have the screwdriver, the, the marks on the strike plate, and it would be my task to look at t um, those particular marks on the strike plate <clears throat> um, versus the screwdriver. So I would take the screwdriver, make similar type marks in another type uh, strike plate or another medium and compare those marks to see if I could, uh, based on my training and education, uh, could render an opinion of those, uh, the interpretation of those marks. Now when we're talking about 
firearms and ammunition, how do tool marks come into play? Okay, uh, the firearm would just become a specialized tool. So the inside of the barrel uh, will have uh, rifling marks placed there by the manufacturer. Those will be the tools uh, that are going to impart their own little signature onto the surface of the bullets. So when the bullets are fired and they go down the barrel of the firearm, it can pick up the minute imperfections from the, the barrel making process, have those imparted onto the surface of the bullet and become interpretable, interpretable by a firearms examiner. Uh, the same thing goes with the other part of a round of ammunition called the cartridge case. This will come in contact with a part of a firearm called the slide. In that slide, there's uh, different tools or different areas that can mark cartridge cases. And those are the things that a firearms examiner would look at to help make a determination if that fired casing or that fired bullet was fired in a particular firearm. Does each firearm have a unique rifling characteristic to it? But they have uh, what we call general rifling characteristics. So a family of uh, weapons will have a class characteristic. These are put there uh, on purpose by the manufacturer. So let's say the, uh, the Smith & Wesson rifle that I um, looked at in this case would have five lands and grooves and a right hand twist. Every Smith & Wesson m and 15 would have those class characteristics. But each one would in would get its own set of individual characteristics based on the, the, the barrel being made, being finished, being assembled and, and put into a firearm. Those would, could all impart their own individual uh, signature on the inside of the barrel that would then translate to the surface of a bullet. What are lands and grooves and what's a right hand twist? Okay. Uh, lands and grooves. The lands are the raised portions. If you look down the barrel of an unloaded uh, rifle or pistol, it'll have raised portions and lowered portions. So the raised portions are the lands. Those are what will cut into the surface of the bullet and impart a spin. So the direction of twist, they have to go one way, right or left. So if you look down the surface of the barrel, and what I do is I follow the, the way the uh, lands curve, and that will give you the direction of twist. If you follow it and it goes to the right, my right arm, uh, that's a right-handed twist, and the bullet, as it comes out, will have a right-handed twist to it. If, you, if it goes the other way, a left-handed twist, it will impart a left-handed spin to the bullet and actually uh, cut um, so, uh, grooves into the surface of the bullet and will have a left-handed um, they'll let, lean to the left. At some point, were you asked to work on this case? Yes, I was. What were you asked to do? I was asked to uh, examine all the firearms uh, in this particular case, all the fired cartridge cases, shot shells, and um, pistol cartridge cases, and bullet fragments to determine um, if they came from any of the f uh, firearms that were submitted. And in what order did you do your examination? What did you do first? How did you go through looking at firearms, ammunition, et cetera? Okay. It, it, first of all, I would examine the firearms, one, to see if they function properly, see if their integrity uh, is um, sound enough for me to test fire them without uh, causing damage to me. Um, I'll then look at some of the uh, evidence in the case to see what I need to, um, to shoot. I want to shoot similar ammunition from our collection so I can get the best known exemplars uh, from these firearms that are, that are given to me that will be uh, suitable for comparison to all the evidence in this case. Um, then once I generate test fires and the, I know the uh, firearms function properly, then the task of comparing uh, like items to like items begin. Before we get to your results in this, taste, this case, I'd like to actually talk about firearms and ammunition in general and how guns work. Okay. Did you bring some firearms with you today? Yes, I did. And I see a couple of bags behind you. What did you bring with you? I brought a uh, Glock Model 22, a 40 Smith & Wesson caliber uh, semi-automatic pistol. I brought a Colt AR-15, uh, one of our, uh, our duty firearms. And I also brought in a Remington 12-gauge 870 shotgun. Also, that's one of our uh, duty firearms. Now, is that the, a Glock 22, is that the same model of Glock as we have that we've previously admitted and identified as being recovered in this case? Yes, ma'am. 
And the Remington 870 shotgun, is that like the Remington 870 shotgun that we collected in this case? Yes, it is. Now, the um, Colt AR-15, is that like the Smith & Wesson MP-15 that we recovered in this case? Yes, it is. It's very similar. The, the parts would interchange. It's just that uh, this is one that uh, we had that I was um, made available to me that I could actually remove the firing pin. Actually, all the guns, the firing pins have been removed for court safety. I also have uh, dummy ammunition that uh, incapable of being fired, so I could demonstrate this, uh, these different firearms uh, to the jury. I would ask you first if you could take the shotgun out, and I'm going to give you the uh, wireless mic so that you could have it, you can wear it, it'll okay. be easier. Judge, right. before we do this, can we approach? Yes.
Objection is overruled. Ms. Pearson, you may proceed. Your Honor, did you want to take the afternoon break before we begin? Let's do that. It's uh, 3.15. Maybe members of the jury, let's go ahead and take our afternoon break. Uh, please keep in mind all the advisements I've been giving you. Uh, they are extremely important. They all apply. They're not just suggestions. They are requirements, and each and every one of you must follow each and every one of those advisements, including the, the one that I added earlier today, which is you are to have no contact whatsoever with the three jurors who are no longer here. As much as you may wish to have contact with them or to perhaps find out what happened or to chat with them, uh, you must resist the temptation to do that. And again, understand that these are strict. And I expect each and every one of you to follow all of these advisements, okay? Enjoy the break. I'll see you back here in 20 minutes. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury has left the courtroom. Uh, is there anything we need to talk about before we go on break? No? No? Okay, enjoy the break. I'll see you in 20. The court will be in recess. Please rise. Well, good afternoon. As you heard there, Judge Samoa reminding the jurors not to fall to temptation to research or look for news coverage about this trial that we've been watching for so many weeks. Of course, that has been the big breaking news subject of the day. We heard three jurors dismissed earlier today because they were exposed to media information regarding previous stories that obviously we and all of our competitors have been covering during the course of this trial. And now the jurors coming back in for this afternoon's session on day 28 are realizing that three of their compatriots are not there. One, I believe, from each row of the juror box. Of course, we do have an interactive juror box on the DenverChannel.com and the 7 News app for you to look at, learn more about the jurors who were dismissed today. In the meantime, during the course of this recess, which should last about 20 minutes, bringing us to just before 3.40 Mountain Time, we'd like to replay again some of the questioning of those jurors who were in the end dismissed and some who were also retained during the course of this morning's debate. Good morning. It's still morning. It's 5 till 12. So good morning. <laughs> good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. All right. Uh, I brought you in because uh, I, I have been informed that um, a juror may have made statements uh, about this case last week and this week, and that you that may have happened in your presence during one of the breaks or during a couple of breaks. Uh, have you, do you recall any jurors making any statements related to anything with respect to this case um, in the last couple of weeks during one of the breaks? Um, and it was last week? Last week and, and um, yesterday and it would have been in the lounge area downstairs. Mm. 
Not that I can immediately recall, no. Okay. Um, you don't remember anybody making any statements with respect to this case or anybody saying anything related to hearing things about this case? There was mention of maybe looking at something on a phone. Okay, tell me about that. Um, who, who did you hear make the statement? I was Danielle. Without using any Oh, names, I'm sorry. Please. I don't know a juror. Do you know where she sits in the courtroom? Uh, in the middle row. The middle row. Yeah. Um, do you know Towards where... the end or the end. All the way at the end of the middle row? Oh, on this end. Okay. Right. All right. And what did you hear her say? It was... And for the record, she's pointing at seat number nine where juror number A72 sits. Okay, go ahead. I can't remember what had happened that day. It was something... I don't know, we'd had a long break or something unusual had happened. And in my, what I heard was just jokingly, well, we can go check the news to see what's going on. But I did not see her actually get her phone out. Did you hear her say anything more no. with respect to that? No. Did, did you hear her make any other statements related to... Uh, the case in any way? No. And have you heard her at any point before make any statements about the case? Not before that, no. And not since that. And not prior to that and not since that? Right. So at any point you haven't heard any uh, her say anything with respect to this case? No. Or information she may have um, claimed to have about the case or anything like that? No. Uh, how about, have you heard any other juror make those statements? No. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and um, do you sometimes go to the lounge area downstairs? I do. And, and who else? Uh, is there a group of you who usually goes there, or does it vary? Um, on our breaks, yes. there's um, a constant group of people. During lunch, there's more people that tend to, to go out there. But during the breaks, it's just a few of you? Right. And, and who would those few be? You, um, the juror in seat number nine, juror 872, and who else? Um, I could not tell you their numbers. <laughs> okay. And do you know their seat numbers? Um, I know one's in the back row middle, maybe? Maybe fourth over there. And then I think the third seat right here. Okay. All right. I'm bad enough with names, so that's throwing okay. numbers on top of it and is too much. You, that's okay. I'm sorry. And the third seat, she's pointing to seat number 19 where juror number 412 sits. I it, think that's where she sits. Okay. And then in the top row, you don't know exactly where you said somewhere in the top row. I want to say it's the fourth row or fourth seat. From the, the top, from the from right, the left. from your right, yes. And so that would be seat number five. And then are these? Oh, sorry. Go sorry, ahead. one more person. I just thought of at the very end of the middle row, to your right. And that would be in seat number sixteen, juror number six seventy three. All right, that tends to be. To the best of your recollection, the group of folks who, who, who is uh, there during the breaks is what from what you can remember, correct? Yes. All right. Yeah. Okay. Let me have you step out for just a moment, okay. please. Thank you. Give us just a moment. Okay. All right. The record should reflect that uh, juror number four ninety five has now stepped out of the courtroom. Are there any other questions that the prosecution uh, would request that I ask of this juror? I think you covered it, Your Honor. 
All right, any other questions, Mr. King? Judge, um, my colleagues may have a suggestion, but my one suggestion is my recollection is that Juror 673 indicated that this conversation, at least the conversation that took place yesterday, took place on the patio. Okay. Um, and so I didn't know, I know that you referred to the lounge area. I I'm unfamiliar with any of these areas, but maybe it would jog her memory if you were to mention the patio area. And um, I, I will do that. I thought that she had referred to the lounge, but I'll ask the patio. I was, that's what I was referring to, and it sounds like that's where the group of folks tends to hang out during the breaks. The only one she added that um, juror number 673 had not mentioned is possibly juror 535 who sits in seat number five. So, but I'm happy to bring her back and make sure that she understood that as the patio. It might, my understanding or my thought was that perhaps they were taking a smoke break out there. That's possible, yeah. The other okay. question that I'm being asked is um, whether or not this juror has heard anything ab about media reports on the case from any source. I will ask that. All right, let's bring her back, please. Although I think the last question is covered by some of my other questions, but I'll ask it anyway. The record should reflect that juror number 495 is back in the courtroom. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I want to follow up on, on some of the discussion we had because I want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. When I refer to the lounge area, mm -hmm. uh, did you understand that as the patio as well downstairs outside? Yes. The, okay. Where sometimes, uh, do jurors smoke there sometimes? Yes. yes. Okay. And so that's what you were referring to. Right. All right. And is that that's the place that you were referring to when you were talking about uh, those few of you who during the breaks go there to smoke and hang out. Right. Okay. Um, and the uh, other follow-up question I had is, have you heard any media reports about the case since the trial started? I have not, no. Um, okay, have you heard anything reported about the case in the media through any means, whether it's TV, radio, newspaper, magazines, internet, social media, through any means, have you heard or seen any uh, reports about the case from the media? Not, I mean, if I see something, then I just turn the page or scroll past it really quick. I have not read anything or heard anything. Okay, so you've been following all of my advisements. Yes. And have you complied with each and every single one of my advisements since we started this trial? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Let me have you step out again. Okay. Thank you for your patience. All right, uh, I'm going to bring in um, the next juror, who is juror number 412, unless there are any other questions that the parties want me to ask of juror number 495. Any other questions? The only other question, Judge, and I apologize for not thinking of this earlier, is to ask her why she did not inform the court of this previously. Um, my understanding is that you've instructed this jury very, very clearly over and over again that if there's any violation in any way of the court's orders uh, by themselves or by other jurors um, from any source that they're to notify the court, and that's potentially a violation of the court order that could affect this juror's uh, future service. Well, what she said was that there was mention of maybe looking something on a phone. And then she said that she thought that the person was joking. So it didn't sound like what she heard was that someone actually looked something up on the phone, um, but that she said she could to try to find out what was going on because the, if this was a long break. Uh, and then she said that she thought he was joking. I will bring her back and clarify that just to be sure, okay? Let's bring her back, please.
All right, the record should reflect that juror number 495 is now back in the courtroom. Let me follow up on this statement that you think you heard. Okay. Uh, I, what I heard you say is that you heard during one of the breaks that there was mention of maybe looking something on a phone. Right. And when do you think that happened? Um... doesn't have to be the exact day if you can remember this week or last week or before last week or something along those lines it wasn't it wasn't this week so not yesterday or today no okay um early last week you think maybe early last week yeah and what exactly is it that you heard this person say um, just, you know, there was, like I said, there was a long break or something. Um, and so we were excited, an extra break or something. So we were excited to go outside and was just mentioned, well, let me get out my phone and check the news. And, and did you actually see her check? I did not see her check the news. Did no. you believe that she had violated one of the court's orders? I took it as her jokingly saying it. Um, and you didn't actually see her. And I did not actually see her at that time do it. After she said that, did she start using her phone, or do you know whether she started using her phone for any purpose? I, I don't specifically remember. I mean, all of us take our phones out there, and we're on them pretty much constantly while we're out there. So, you know, she could have even said it while being on her phone. Um, but mm -hmm. I didn't put any... I, I took it as her saying it jokingly. Okay. You didn't believe that she was in violation of one right. of my advisements that right. I have been that I have been giving you. Correct. Okay. All right. Do you remember anything else about that event? No, I mean it was just a a fleeting passing comment and then we all just carried on with what we were what we were doing. And do you know who else was present? When she made the comment? It would have been the people that I mentioned before, um, with the exception of maybe the person in the very back row. Um, she the, doesn't tend to stay out as long as we do. Okay, the person that you said four seats in from the right hand looking at the, at the jury box. Right. It would be my right hand side, four right. seats in. That would be the person sitting in seat number five, juror number 535. Okay. Right, that would be the only person that, you know, like I said, we go out there and she doesn't tend to stay out there as long. So she, you think she wasn't there? I, I can't say for sure, but, but you don't know she if, may have been right. Okay, you don't know if she was or not. Right. Okay, all right, great. Let me have you step out again, please. Thank you, thanks for your patience. Okay, the records reflect that juror number 495 has now exited the courtroom. The records reflect that juror number 412 is now present in the courtroom. Good afternoon. Hello. Uh, I brought you in because I wanted to ask you whether you've heard any juror make a statement of any kind about the case during one of the breaks, uh, and specifically last week and yesterday. And uh, in terms of location, specifically, in the patio downstairs or in the lounge area. Um, not that I'm aware of. Okay. I don't. You don't. You don't recall hearing anything. No. Sometimes we talk about like quotes and clothes and shoes, but I don't remember hearing anything about the case okay clothes and shoes the clothes you may be wearing and shoes you may be wearing yeah okay when you say quotes what does that mean um like air quotes oh okay air quotes but not related to this case no and not related to anything happening in these proceedings no all right and uh let's expand it to before last week have you heard at any time any juror make a statement anywhere, whether in the patio or anywhere else, about this case?
I've heard people talk about the length, uh, going over mm, five o'clock, past five, five thirty, six. Okay, so scheduling and scheduling. And, my, and my staff talks to you folks about that uh, often in terms of how late you can stay and that kind of thing as well. Right. But what about anything else in terms of the case or in terms of my what might be reported in the media or in any media reports? Have you heard anyone comment about what, uh, you know, information related to the case or information uh, reported by the media related to the case? Have you heard anyone make a comment about that? And when I say anyone, I'm referring to one of the jurors. No. No? And uh, my understanding is sometimes during the breaks, you go to the patio with a few other jurors. Is that right? I do. Uh, have you heard any, any such comments while you're there at the patio made by any juror statements? Um, of related to the case or what may have been reported about the case in the media or anything like that? Specifically talking about the media? Any Anything related to the case? No, just just talking about schedules and stuff. Okay. And, uh, I tend to play my phone. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so, that's all right. All right. Um, um, no. Have you received any information or seen or heard or read any information about the case in any media report since the case started? Um, I look at Huffington Post, but I scroll past anything that has to do with anything. Related to the case? Yes. And so you've, you're following my advice then to avoid any stories about the case? Yes, I don't look at the news. I don't watch the news with my family. I don't even watch it anymore. I watch Rachel Maddow. <laughs> okay, yes. and you've been following my advisements, each and every one of my advisements, uh, since you since we started this trial. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, and I, I want to make sure that I open it up because initially I asked you questions about uh, during one of the breaks in the patio downstairs, and I said last week or maybe yesterday. But let's open it up without any restrictions as to location and without any restrictions as to time. Have you ever heard a juror make a statement or make a comment about the case or about information uh, from the media related to the case? I can't think of any that I've like heard and... Uh like processed, I guess. I can't think of any that I've paid any attention to anything okay. about the even, media. All right. Just even if you weren't paying attention um, and processing it, have you heard any juror make any statements about the case or information in the media about the case, whether you happen to be part of the conversation or whether you happen to not be specifically talking to the juror, but happen to overhear what the juror said. Have you heard a juror uh, make any statement? Back on the record, this is uh, the case of the people of the state of Colorado versus James Egan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The record should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys and the prosecutors are present as well. Uh, we are outside the presence of the jury. Are you ready for the jury, Ms. Pearson? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. King? Judge. All right, thank you. Let's bring the jury in, please.
Please be seated, everyone. <clears throat> the record should reflect that the jury is back in the courtroom. Right before the break, Ms. Pearson was direct examining Agent Higashi. And Agent, I will remind you that you are still under oath. Okay? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Ms. Pearson, you may proceed with your direct examination of Agent Higashi. Agent Higashi, before we get to your results in this case, we first, I would like to talk about firearms and ammunition and how firearms work. Okay. And if you could step down. And turn on the mic there. There's a little, there it is. There you go. Okay. Now, you, today you've brought with you some firearms that are either like what we recovered in this case or of the same type. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. So let's start with the shotgun first. And I, I want to show you first, did you examine uh, the shotgun that was seized in this case, which is People's Exhibit 277 that was previously admitted and identified? Previously admitted and identified as the shotgun seized in this case. Is that 870? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. And if you could hold that up, and then okay. just one for moment. For the jury? Or? Yeah, just for okay. the jury, just one moment. And then, and if you could then also hold up the one that you've brought with us today, which you've indicated you've made safe. It doesn't have a firing pin, so it can't fire. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. I removed the firing pin from this shotgun, so it is uh, incapable of firing. And would using the guns that you brought today help you to explain your testimony to the jury about how firearms work? Yes, it would. Now, looking at what we seized in this case is People's Exhibit 277 and the uh, Remington 870 that you brought with you today. Are these the same type of, of shotgun? Yes, they are. The, uh, the action mechanism here in the, in the receiver, they're the same, uh, have the same function, different, uh, slightly different furniture on it. And the one in the, that I was given to examine had a six round magazine, so the magazine extends a little further, but the everything else about it will function uh, very uh, the same. The way that it loads, fires, would all be the same? Yes, ma'am. Now, starting out with a, a shotgun, we've seen, obviously, magazines for some of our other firearms. We don't see a magazine that protrudes from a shotgun. Correct. Well, the, the, this is the magazine tube, so it's a tube under the barrel, serves as the, uh, the magazine. So what do you have to do to load a shotgun with ammunition? Okay, first of all, the, the pump has to be forward. That allows uh, access to the magazine tube here on the bottom. So in the bottom of the receiver, there's a cutout with a little uh, lifter. And some of you can probably see that. There's a bright orange uh, button there that shows the user that we have an unloaded shotgun. You've used the term receiver. What does that mean? That's the middle section of the... Uh, of the shotgun here that has the trigger group and it has some other mechanisms in here that allow um, its elevator mechanism so it will allow the shot shell from the magazine to go up into this little receiver area and then as you push the slide forward it'll take that round and put it in the chamber of the shotgun. Did you bring with you what are dummy rounds yes, for did. shotgun shells? Yes ma'am. And if you could show us then how you would load a shotgun. Okay. Now these, I can hold them for you if you like. These orange um, shells, is there anything in them? No, these are hollow plastic orange, but they're the same uh, outside diameter of a regular 12 gauge shot shell. And if you have, you have shot shells, you buy those separately. Yes, ma'am. And then how do you load them into a shotgun? Okay. So they're simply put in the bottom portion of the receiver here and into the, the magazine tube. This particular one will hold four in there. How many does exhibit 277, the shotgun seized in this case, how many shot shells did it hold? That one will hold six in the, in the tube here. Once you've loaded the shells into the uh, shotgun, what do you do next if you want okay. to, to fire a gun? Since the shotgun right now is uh, locked, one, you could pull the trigger that would help release the pump, or there's a little lever here on the left side of the trigger that will also release the slide. So you would pull it to the rear. That round from the magazine is now 
uh, in a position to where if the slide is closed, now this is, uh, has chambered around from the magazine, uh, the gun or the shotgun could then be fired. So to, the word chamber around, what does that mean? That just means taking a round from the magazine tube uh, and placing it in the chamber or the barrel end uh, of the shotgun and it is now ready to be fired. So you had to load the shells in, and then, into the magazine tube. And then you had to pull back the, yes. like the pump? Re retract the pump. That allowed it to come into this uh, area here and then the elevator would then make it pointing into the chamber of the barrel and then when the slide is pulled forward would, ch would chamber that. That round. So now a round is chambered. Is this shotgun ready to fire? Yes. And once you fire the first round, okay. uh, are you able to do that? Yes. Now, would under normal circumstances, would the shotgun shell uh, fall out of the shotgun? No, ma'am. It, it would be just like it is now. It would still be in the chamber. Uh, you would have to manually work the pump to extract and eject the, the fired casing if it had fired. So now let's say you fired it once. Okay. What do you do next? You pull the same pump to the rear, causes that shell to, to, fly, uh, to fall out. The next round is uh, in the elevator system, ready to be loaded into the chamber. So once the slide is pushed forward, it chambers the next round. And then you fire your second round? Fire the second round. Oops. And you have to pull back in order to eject right, you that have to case. Eject that back. And normally, you know, this would be shouldered or level and then uh, back forward. When you, a casing is ejected, a shotgun shell casing is ejected, how far does it go? It goes back as far as uh, one would operate the, the pump, but generally not very far because there's, it's uh, manually operated as, in, as differentiated from the, the rifle or the pistol where it's under uh, the force of the firing process. So this is a manual extraction, so it depends on the force you apply to it. So in the firearm in this case, the shotgun in this case, Exhibit 277, when you have this at shoulder level and the shotgun shell is being ejected, how far would you guess it would go? Where would it land? And well, what direction does it go to? Well, since the port is on the right side, it will probably go about five feet or so to the right. Okay. And if you could do this one more time, please. Okay. Now, shotgun shells, uh, we've seen previously admitted um, BBs that, yes. that are from shotgun shells. Yes. How many BBs were in the shotgun shells that were fired in this case? The loads that were fired, uh, I had to calculate it out because I couldn't find any of those at any of the local stores. So the calculated number was 100 separate uh, shot, BB shot, in each uh, round fired. Does that tend to be an accurate number, or is there a plus or minus on a uh, hundred shot round? I'm going to say that it's probably a hundred when they when they do that, um, because they load to a weight. It's that's how many 177 size BB shots are in that particular load. How fast does a shotgun round travel? Uh, that particular load is listed at 1,300 feet per second. And can you compare that to something like the speed of sound? Speed of sound is about almost 1,100 feet per second, so it's a little faster than that. Uh, the 40 Smith & Wesson typical bullet's about 1,100 feet per second. So again, the payload is traveling at a, a pretty high velocity. From the shotgun? From the shotgun. And uh, while you're still here, I'm going to show okay. you People's Exhibit 1228. Okay. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. Is that something that you created? Yes, it is. And is that a, a shotgun shell? Yes, this is a similar load, uh, something that I could find at one of the local stores. It was um, a little lighter in weight, so I think this one had 94 uh, pieces of shot in it, but it had a much higher velocity. So this one's rated at 1,700 feet per second. Would this be useful to help explain how a shotgun shell is, is made? <clears throat> Yeah, it just shows the uh, separate components that go into a shot shell. Um, not only the powder, but we have a wadding that holds the shot and protects the inside of the barrel. So when the payload is going down the barrel, it's this plastic wad that contains all of the 100 pieces of uh, steel shot. That goes out, out of the barrel of the shotgun, 
And, this and, and if, Your Honor, I would move to um, use Exhibit 1228 as a demonstrative exhibit. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, I wanted to mark it as that I want to show it then to the jury using it on the Elmo. So. And if you could, um, and for, I guess for just for this moment, maybe we can, I can have you either look at the screen. If we could pull up 1228 on the Elmo and show it. And is that with the light off? Okay. If you could tell us, what are we looking at um, in this exhibit. Okay, I'll use the pointer, sorry. In the exhibit, here's basically a window cutout of what, uh, how it looks uh, in real life. The, uh, the wadding is up here, takes up most of the, the green plastic area. Up here is where the, the loose wad is, and it's pretty sizable, and it's got a little plastic tail on the bottom. All the shot, uh, there's 94 pieces here. All that would be loaded into this area of the wad. That's the powder payload of what drives uh, the wad and the, and the shot out. So it, it just helps kind of give you in, the, in mind's eye what is going on inside of a, a shot shell. And to the left there, what we're looking at is gunpowder? Yes, the gray uh, pieces in the Ziploc bag is gunpowder. And if I could have up uh, previously admitted exhibit 2932, it's a photograph. Now, you were talking about shotgun wadding. Is this shotgun wadding? Yes. And is this what we saw in, the, uh, in that shell? And if you can explain now, looking at this picture, how does the shotgun wadding, how does it work? What okay. is it doing? Uh, so this is the, the bottom portion of this. The other one um, out of the one in the exhibit has a, a little tail, and that might be because it's a higher velocity load. So this one has basically just a flat uh, cup area. This acts as a, um, a piston. So when the gunpowder explodes, that will help fill the bore, seal the, uh, the gases, and help propel the, the payload down the barrel. You can see some of the imprints of the BB shot when it's uh, going down the barrel of the firearm and under this tremendous pressure, the BB shot will impress itself into the, the wad. So sometimes that's what we can use to help determine um, the type of shot that was fired in it based on the dimple that's left. Uh, in this case, we happen to have the dimples as well as uh, the fired shot itself. But this is what happens. It has, um, it's scored. Or, or has little fingers on it. So as soon as it clears the barrel, the fingers will start to open up. It's a much lighter weight than all the BBs. So the BBs have all the momentum. They will go forward. This thing will act kind of like a parachute where it'll open up. The fingers will cause it to stop, and it'll tend to go off target as you get away from, uh, the further away from the shotgun. It, it deviates from its target because these pedals don't open up uh, perfectly. So they will tend to rotate and deviate off the true flight path of all the pellets. And could we see 2934, please, which is also previously admitted? Does this show one that landed the opposite direction? Yes, this one shows with the base down and how wide the, uh, the fingers of the pedals have opened up. But again, you can still see the imprint of the, uh, the payload on the, on the base as well as the sides of the, uh, of the wad. And did you, in this case, look at People's Exhibit 277, the shotgun, and were you able to determine whether that shotgun was fully functional? Yes, it was a fully functional firearm and was capable of inflicting serious injury or death. Let's next talk about uh, the rifle. Did you bring a, a rifle today? Yes, I did. 
and I'm going to put this one on the floor for the moment. Now, did you also examine People's Exhibit 706, which is the Smith & Wesson MP15? Yes, I did. And did you bring a rifle today as well? There's the exhibit. And yes, I did bring a rifle. If you could uh, tell us how the rifle that you brought is the same and how it's different. Okay. And, and with the using the rifle will help you to illustrate how you load and, and fire a rifle. Yes, it would. So this is uh, one of our duty uh, rifles that we have at CBI. Similarly is uh, the collapsible stock. It's adjustable. Uh, this becomes important for our guys when they have their vest on. Usually you want it shorter because you have this football type pad on. So it has adjustability on that. Um, Let's see here. On this one, this one, the one that you brought looks like it's shorter than the yes, exhibit uh, 706? We also have a shorter barrel. This helps it fit in our vehicles versus uh, normally. So this is a 14 and a half inch barrel. Uh, the one I examined was a 16 inch barrel. The big difference is this one has a roll mark that says Colt. Uh, the evidence item was a Smith & Wesson. Same design, same exact everything, all the parts would interchange with each other. So there's um, more similarities and differences. The big difference is the roll mark. This is a different brand. But they all are designed similarly. Um, they all function very similarly also. Now, I presume that the first thing you'd have to do in order to fire this would be to insert a loaded magazine into it. Yes, that is correct. As it sits now, it is a, um, a very safe weapon. And it has no firing pin in it, no ammunition in it, it cannot fire in the square. That is correct, yes. Did you bring a, a magazine that would fit into this rifle with you today? Yes, I did, and I also brought uh, inert or dummy rounds that we use in training. Uh, the bright orange tip helps us know um, users as well as the instructors that we have some dummy ammunition. And the bright orange also helps when we have to pick them up at, at the range. I would first like for you to load a magazine, if you would, okay. so that we could see how that's done. Uh, so this magazine is a normal 30-round uh, capacity. It's uh, designed to hold 30 rounds of uh, 223 or 5.56 ammunition. Uh, and before you go any further, will you explain the difference between, you know, 223 and 556? The, the difference is very slight. The 556 is the military designation. The, the lead of the, the barrels are slightly different. Um, in all intent, for in all intents and purposes, they're the same thing. You can use 556 five, ammo in a, excuse me, you can use 223 Remington ammo, which would be commercial ammunition in either of these firearms. Uh, there is some issue possibly with using 556 five, ammunition in a 223 rifle. So generally use the 223 Remington. That's what we use in our training and most of our, our, uh, our as for duty ammunition, that's what our uh, specs have, but uh, 5.56 ammo in a 5.65, 5.56 rifle will work uh, perfectly also. In this case, was the ammunition seized uh, 223 or, or 5.56? It's 5.56. Okay. Now, looking at the top of this magazine, it looks like it has a, a bullet in it, but that's not? No, that's uh, part of the magazine part called the follower. This just helps. Um, there's a big spring in here that's all coiled up. And all this simply does is go up and down. So if you load a number of rounds in it, it'll compress the spring. And as the rifle or the user inserts ammunition into the gun, the spring will uncoil and, and move upward. There's also a part on here that will help um, lock the gun open when it's empty so the user knows I need to reload. Uh, but in this particular case, um, we'll, we'll just load some ammo, I guess, right? And did you, how many rounds does this magazine hold? This magazine with this follower is designed to hold 30 rounds of ammunition. Did you examine 30 round magazines in this case? There were, I think, three 30 round magazines that were submitted, but uh, quite a few of them were 40 rounders or 100 rounders. So if you would show us how you load 
ammunition into a magazine. All it is is simply placing it. Uh, there's some feed lips in the back half of the magazine, so you want to uh, put them down right there so they seat in the back. And this will be done. Just easily insert them. Now there's a spring in there. Is it hard to push the ammunition down onto the spring? No, not, not quite yet. When we get down to about 28 or 29, they'll get a little more difficult. But for now, it just goes in very simply. And you have to load it one bullet at a time? One bullet at a time, unless you have uh, stripper clips. that are, You can have 10 rounds on a stripper clip and this little tool that can help insert them rather quickly, but we don't have that here. Is loading a magazine something that is easier for you because you've been doing it for, I'm guessing, decades, as years. opposed to somebody who hasn't been doing it so long? Uh, this particular magazine loads rather easily. The pistol magazine is a little more challenging because of you're, you're fighting a, uh, a spring that compresses a lot quicker. So this one's actually fairly simple. Am I going all the way to capacity? Yes. Okay. I'll speed this up then. How many rounds do, now magazines this size are they used by law enforcement? Yes, ma'am. How many rounds does law enforcement load in a 30 round magazine? At our agency, we normally go with 28 because there's uh, sometimes a problem if there's uh, 30 rounds in the magazine, even though you load it to capacity. If you try and load it into your rifle when the bolt is forward or in a particular condition, I'll show you, the uh, magazine won't lock up uh, reliably. And that can be a big problem uh, that we have out on the range, which would translate to a really bad problem out in the field if uh, the agent had to reload his, his gun and was unable to seat the magazine. Can you load more than 30 rounds into a 30 round magazine? Uh, not with this particular follower. With um, There's a company that used to be in Colorado, Magpul. They make a follower that you can put into a normal 30 round magazine. And with those, you can fit 31 rounds. But just because you can fit 31 doesn't mean you should. I have failed because I wasn't counting. <laughs> and I'm getting close because. Uh, so it's I best to count out the bullets first. <laughs> yes. So I think we are at capacity now. So there you go. The 31st round will not okay. fit in the. Right. So now this magazine has 30 rounds in it, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that is correct. Okay. So now you've loaded your magazine. What do you do now to load your rifle? Okay, so this is intuitive to me, but you have to, bullets are going forward uh, towards the bad people. If you try and do this with the bolt is forward. So the bolt is. Of course it went in. So the bolt is this portion of the rifle. So right now, this is actually seated. And when you use the word seated, is it it's seat, S-E-A-T? S-E-A-T. So seated. when we load uh, our rifles, you insert the magazine, but you also give it a tug because if it's not fully seated, which sometimes it can be where it looks like it's seated, you may get the, the dreaded click and nothing. And then when you go to pull the charging handle back, the magazine usually falls out. So that's a good way to know if you're not fully seated. So I'll put it back in. Okay. So once you've gotten the magazine in, into, the, into the rifle, what do you do next? Uh, the best way to do it with this rifle is on the top here, there's a thing called the charging handle with a little latch here. So it, once you grab this, you pull it to the rear. That pulls the bolt, uh, the bolt carrier to the rear and then you just let it go. You slingshot it forward. That'll take the top round of ammunition from the magazine, load it into the chamber, and this gun has a safety lever here. Safe is uh, horizontal, vertical for, for the fire position. And the, the safety would prevent you from firing if it's on safety rather than fire? Correct. Uh, a lot of times if um, 
we are trying to engage a target and nothing's happening, the trigger's blocked, then training will kick in and know that we have to push the safety in the on position, or the fire so, position. So now is this ready to fire? Yes, it is. Um, and if you, when, when it, when it fires around, will it kick out a casing? Yes, uh, this is a semi-automatic design, so the uh, pressure that will push the bullet down the barrel of the firearm, the bullet will exit the barrel. Uh, in the front sight base, there's a little hole in the barrel. That's how the gas system operates. So the gas system will come up this tube that runs along the top portion of the rifle here and interact with the bolt carrier group where it will push, basically push the bolt to the rear. And on the bolt is what we call an extractor. So it still has the, so it has the rim of the cartridge case, the, the brass part, and it'll help pull the cartridge case out of the gun. And the ejector is also on the, on the bolt face. When it comes back to the rear, the bolt, the ejector will kick the cartridge case out of the firearm and these cartridge cases go a little further because that's a lot of powder. It's got quite a bit of energy, so this will probably go about 10 feet. So, ex to the right. so explain what we're looking at here. Where's the actual bullet? Okay, the actual bullet is the orange part. Um, the 5.56, five, this particular round in this case was a 62 grain, which is, um, oh gosh, the, the, um, like the 22 long rifle is about 40 grains. Just trying to give you kind of per, well, uh, the, perspective. Well, the, the 40 cal mass, but uh, these come out at a lot higher velocity. Well, because we, we've seen in this case injuries caused by caliber round that has Actually, more grains. The characterization would be more damaging. Same. Can you explain how this round differs in the speed it travels versus a 40 caliber round? Okay, uh, the. 62 grain bullet that is involved, or that I examined in uh, this particular case, it generally travels out of a 16 inch barrel at about 3,000 feet per second. The, um, the spear gold dot, it comes out of the 40, like the, the Glock 22 that I have to show you later, uh, it travels at about 1,100, 20, 1,130 feet per second. So it's, it's a, a relative thing. Smaller bullet, but traveling really fast versus a larger bullet going relatively slow compared to this. Now you said that the speed of sound was around 1,100 feet per second, roughly? Roughly. And this, the bullet is traveling at 3,000 feet per second? Yes, ma'am. So you would have heard the bullet, um, so you, would have, you wouldn't hear the bullet until after the bullet had traveled? Right, the bullet is gonna cover greater, the distance faster than the, uh, the sound. So now are you able to pull the trigger on this with these dummy rounds in it? Yes. So the, the gun is on fire, the safety lever is in that uh, vertical position, merely just pulling the trigger, which is about six and a half, seven pounds. That would cause, if this was a live round, cause the round to go down the barrel. The gases would work and would basically drive this bolt carrier. There's a big spring in the back of this uh, um, stock area. So this would cause it to go to the rear and eject out that cartridge case. Um, the carry handle doesn't go back and forth. The carry handle stays put, but I have to do that to manually work the bolt. So and now the bolt close forward on the next round of ammunition. And again, do the casings go to the right? Yes. How far can a casing from a, a rifle go? Does it normally go about 10 feet? Can yeah, they normally, go further? It, it can go further, but typically it's about 10 feet. That's usually how our guys are spaced apart, and usually the guys toward the right get the brass hit them on the back of the head or whatever. Now, if you fired the rifle the first time, what do you have to do to fire it a second time? Second time is um, release the trigger so the disconnector can reset itself and then pull the trigger again. And the same for each uh, consecutive round after that? Yes, ma'am. Do you have to do anything else uh, to, it, it'll continue to fire until it either right. is out of ammunition or jams, is that correct? That is correct. You have to pull and release the trigger each time. Now this is a large looking gun. 
is it harder to fire than a handgun? No, this is actually a pretty, pretty easy weapon to fire because you can uh, hold it up to your shoulder very easily. And uh, with a red dot sight, we normally have a red dot sight on here. So you just keep it both eyes open, look at the red dot, superimpose that on where you, you're going to shoot and pull the trigger until you stop pulling the trigger. Does it have a lot of recoil where it's you know hitting you in the shoulder as it's firing? No, this is a very soft recoiling system. And uh, other than the loud muzzle blast, it's, it's very easy, very simple to shoot. Based on your experience, is it easier to shoot than a handgun? Um, now, the when we're talking about the casings going 10 feet, that's not how far the, the bullets are going. No, no. And we've heard from some witnesses in this case uh, who've been in the military who have described M16s. How does this compare to an M16? Okay, uh, the M16 is, is the same, it's like the big brother to this, same parts, same size, same configuration. Some of the internal parts are different that will allow uh, the ability to turn this lever so the little arrows pointing to the back. That will allow the uh, trigger me mechanism to uh, override the disconnector and it, it's capable of full automatic fire. So if you pull the trigger to the rear and hold it, as long as you can hang on to this thing, it will uh, fire um, ammunition until you decide to let go of the trigger or run out of ammunition. Now, is this called an automatic weapon? No, this is a semi-automatic weapon. So one shot per pull of trigger. So you have to pull it and release for each time you fire a round. The M16, you'd be able to hold down to the rear and usually you try and control that burst because uh, even with this soft, easy to shoot, firearm, uh, you'll get muzzle rise after about six or seven rounds and probably be off target. So you want to control your burst. What do you mean by muzzle rise? Uh, the, the front end of the gun, no matter how hard you try or how much you lean into it, you really have to battle this and fully automatic to keep it on target. Because with the right, you mean the muzzle goes upwards? Yes, drifts the muzzle upwards? will tend to drift upward and I think to the left. The sound, how would the sound of an M16 compare to the sound of the rifle fired in this case? Oh, they would sound the same. They use the same ammunition. Uh, the ammunition in this particular case is military surplus, so it would be the same exact ammunition uh, fired by our troops. It's just that it has, the, the M16 has the ability to rapidly fire multiple rounds versus this one is as fast as you can pull the trigger. Were you able to determine whether People's Exhibit 706, the rifle in this case, is capable of functioning properly? Yes, that um, People's 706 does function properly and is capable of inflicting serious injury or death. Now, did you also examine handguns in this case? Yes, I did. And did you bring a handgun as well? Yes, I did. And again, is the handgun that you brought um, fully safe in this courtroom? Yes, it has a uh, firing pin in it that I broke the tip off of, so it is incapable of firing. And in this case, we had two Glock handguns, uh, People's Exhibits 704, which was previously admitted as the handgun found on the top of the defendant's car, okay. and 705, which was found in the pocket of the car. Um, how do they compare to the handgun that you brought today? Okay, uh, this is a uh, Glock Model 22, so it matches this particular one with the, I think it's a beam shot laser in the front of it. So it's uh, same design. Uh, they have 
different generations. So this one in the box is actually a newer generation or the latest generation where it has a different frame texture and uh, some other improvements. But for all intents and purposes, it's still a same block, uh, semi-automatic, 40 Smith & Wesson caliber firearm. So now you said Glock and Smith and & Wesson in the same sentence. Isn't, aren't those two different brands of handguns? Yes, they are two different brands, but the round, the 40 caliber round, uh, technically is called the 40 Smith & Wesson. Okay. So this, this is the, uh, the, the Glock that you brought today is the same as, as this exhibit, the one that was recovered from the top of the defendant's car. Yes, it is. It is with uh, a full-size frame and typically has a, a magazine that has 15 rounds of 40 uh, capacity. Did you bring a magazine? There was one in this when I brought it. I don't know where it's at now. But I also have a 22 round magazine. And in this case, did you look at some 22 round magazines? Yes, I did. That were seized in this case? Yes, I did. And uh, is this the kind of magazine that you examined from this case? Yes. If you could show us how you load one of these magazines. Okay. I'll have to. So I have more um, dummy rounds, bright orange plastic tips. These uh, are used to simulate live ammunition. Um, we also stick them in magazines when we're training because this will help uh, the shooters realize that sometimes they're anticipating the shot. So I'm trying to remember to count this time. These also have witness windows on the back, so it'll let you know how you're doing. But I don't have to count. Now you said that the spring loading these is harder than it is on the magazine for the assault rifle? Yes, when I get down towards the bottom, I'll really have to lean on this thing to get the last couple of rounds in. Two more to go. That's 22. <clears throat> so it's hard to get the last couple rounds in. A little harder than I thought. <clears throat> and is this a... If it's a new magazine or an older magazine, does that make a difference in terms of the how strong the springs are in the magazine? Yes, it does, and this proves that this is a brand new magazine, <clears throat> and it was uh, very difficult to get that last round in. Okay. Now, once you've loaded your magazine for your handgun, how do you load the magazine into the handgun? Okay, there's, this is the easy way. When the slide is locked back to the rear, there's a little lever back here that will help lock the slide to the rear, either when you're empty or if you manipulate that with your thumb, merely just inserting the magazine, the little magazine catch here made a little click. Um, then there's two ways to do it. You can use this as a release. That'll let the slide go forward, or you can pull it back here like this and do like a slingshot and let it go in. Either way, the round gets in the chamber, and it's best to do that versus riding the slide home because sometimes things don't chamber correctly. So if the gun's back a little bit like that, it won't work. And when you talked about riding the slide home, you meant hanging on to it the whole time it was coming back forward? Yes, yeah, sometimes people like to keep their hands on the serrated slide and they let it go back and let it go forward. 
So now do you have a round in the chamber? Yes, so now there would be a round in the chamber. The magazine now has 21 rounds in it, and that would mean 22 pulls of the trigger would empty this gun, and the gun would lock back or anywhere in between stop pulling the trigger. And you would be able to fire the first round, if you can do that for us. Okay. And then the slide would go to the rear. That would go shooting out. The casing would shoot the out and the bullet would go forward. Correct. The bullet would go forward, the casing would shoot out to the right, and then you'd have to release the trigger and then pull it again. And you'd be able to continue to fire? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, you can actually, and I, I was going to ask you too, um, how fast do the 40 caliber rounds, maybe you already said this, how fast do the 40 caliber rounds travel? Uh, the, the load that was used was about a 11, a little over 11, 1150 maybe feet per second. A little less than the speed of sound, but pretty close. Probably right about there. Okay. You can go ahead and take a seat again. Okay. I'll just leave this. Did you examine both of the handguns in this case, uh, People's Exhibits 704 and 705, and were you able to determine whether they were fully functional? Yes, both uh, Glock pistols, the 22 and the Model 23, were functional firearms and were both capable of inflicting serious injury or death. <clears throat> Let's t uh, once you had examined the firearms and, and test fired them, what did you examine next in this case? First, I would examine the fired um, shot shells and the fired cartridge cases that were uh, given to me. I'm going to hand you uh, previously six previously admitted shotgun shells. Now I've handed you uh, three ex uh, six exhibits, 205, 243, 200, 201, 203, and 204 that were previously admitted in this case. Do you recognize those items as items that you examined? Yes, I do. How do you recognize them? <clears throat> I have the case number, the item number on both um, smaller envelopes as well as the, uh, the evidence items themselves. <clears throat> and were you able to determine to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty whether any of these spent shotgun shells were fired from the Remington 870 shotgun? Uh, yes, yes, I was able to. And were they, in fact, all fired from that gun? Yes, I was able to determine that the uh, six fired 12-gauge shot shells were all fired in the uh, 870 that I was examining. And I believe you previously said, were these, all of these shot shells, did they all have the same number of BBs in them? Yes, they're all labeled on the side of, of what the manufacturer as well as the, uh, what was contained within, and they're all marked the same high velocity, 1300, indicating the feet per second of the payload, and uh, the weight of the payload, and the fact that they're all steel-sized uh, BBs. After, how did you make the determination that these shotgun shells were fired from the shotgun that was seized? Judge, may we approach? Yes.
Ms. Pearson. Agent Hasgashi, was your conclusion that to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, those shotgun shells were fired from the shotgun recovered in this case? Yes, they, yes it was. And how did you make that determination? It's based on the microscopic comparison of the known exemplars that I generated by test firing uh, the Remington 870 with uh, ammunition that was similar to what was found in this case and comparing them under the microscope and looking at uh, features around the firing pin impression, in this case called the, the breech face impression of that shotgun that are impressed onto the surface of the primer mechanism of the fired shot shells. I look at that under my comparison microscope and that allows me to look at both uh, items through one set of eyepieces so I can uh, maneuver them both around and examine the, the same areas uh, on the known exemplars with the evidence and come to my conclusions. And to be clear, these were all shotgun shells that were collected at the theater that I handed you. Um, you may not know that, but they were previously admitted as that. Yes, ma'am. After you examined the shotgun shells, what did you examine next? Uh, then uh, the uh, 40 Smith & Wesson caliber uh, spear expended cartridge cases from the scene were the next uh, things I examined. I've handed you five spent 40 caliber casings that were uh, recovered in the theater in July of 2012, and they've previously been admitted. Are those items that you examined? Uh, yes, they are. And those are our exhibits uh, 564, 578 to 581. Is that five? That is correct. What did you compare them to? I compared them to the... Um test fired cartridge cases that I generated from uh, both of the Glock pistols, the Glock 22 as well as the Glock 23. Were you able to determine to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty whether any of these five spent casings that were found in Theater 9 were fired from either of the Glock pistols? Yes, I was. And which pistol did you determine that to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty they were fired from? I was able to determine based on my microscopic comparisons that these five casings were all fired in the Glock 22 uh, model pistol. And the Glock 22, that was the one that had the sight on it? With the laser on it, correct. So that was previously admitted in this case as having been seized from the top of the defendant's car. Judge, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to object to the continuing um, testimony by counsel about where items were recovered. That's up to the jury to decide based on the previous testimony. Sustained. Did you, what did you examine next? Uh, next in line would be the, I believe it was 66 fired uh, 5.56 caliber cartridge cases. And I've handed you the uh, spent cartridge casings, I think 66 of them. I believe so. <laughs> Are these all spent casings that you examined? Yes, they all appear to be the ones that I examined in this particular case. Were you able to determine to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty whether any of these spent casings 
were fired from the Smith & Wesson MP15 rifle? Yes, I was able to. And of the 66 that I gave you, were you able to determine to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty that all 66 of them were fired from the rifle? No, uh, 65 of them I was able to identify as been, being fired in the uh, M&P, the Smith & Wesson rifle. Uh, one of them did not um, retain the marks that I was using for my identification, um, meaning the, the firing pin impression that was evident on my test fires that I made from the rifle. Uh, on 65 of them, it was in uh, sufficient quality and quantity for me to make an identification. On one of them, I was unable to identify it based on the firing pin impression. And I believe that the one you were unable to identify is Exhibit uh, 464. Is it at the very end of that group? Yes, that would be um, from the very back. That's correct. Were you able to determine anything about item 464, that it was connected to the rifle in any way? Yes, um, this particular item, which is my item number 56, uh, was identified as having been worked through the action of the Smith & Wesson rifle based on the extractor marks that were found on the on this fired casing, and I compared that to the test-fired rounds that I generated from the uh, Smith & Wesson rifle. What do you mean by worked through the action of? Because the, um, in the during the firing process, uh, Firearms examiners are able to look at the firing pin impression because that is a process made, or that is an, a, a tool mark made during the firing process. Um, also, the uh, sometimes we use the breech face impression. So, just like with the shot shells, the breech of the uh, the rifle sometimes yields good enough marks to identify it um, as being made during the firing process. Uh, those marks weren't present uh, in a quality that I would use for an identification. So I had to look elsewhere uh, on the fired cartridge case uh, in People's uh, 464 for other areas of where that rifle may have come in contact with this casing because the marks due to firing were not uh, sufficient for me to identify. So I did find an extractor mark on um, People's 464 that I could identify to uh, the Smith & Wesson rifle. So again, it, it's a fired casing, but the marks that I was using to identify uh, the fired casings to the rifle were not present on this particular one for some reason, but I was able to identify the extractor mark. So it does have evidence of being in uh, the Smith & Wesson M&P 15, just I couldn't identify it as being fired in. After you examined all of the spent casings in this case, what did you do next? The next task, again, I would go with the, the slightly easier task. There were two fired uh, 40 caliber bullets, and that's the, the next I would go in, in line for my comparisons. I think I'm going to go to those later, okay. if that's okay with you. That's quite all right. Did okay. you examine um, the live rounds that were found in the theater? Yes, I did. And I'm going to hand you some additional exhibits.
Now the items in this box, these are going to be the live ones. Okay. So I'll let you just, I'll just give them the Okay. I've handed you a number of, of uh, live rounds of 223 ammo that were previously collected and um, admitted in this case. Yes, if you, you could did. look through those, are all those items that you examined? Yes, they all appear to be uh, examined live rounds of ammunition that I received. Now, these live rounds have head stamps on them, and, and we've noted previously some of them have LC-11 and some have LC-12. Do you know what that means? Yes, I do. What does it mean? Uh, the, the military rounds are marked with uh, where they're made and the date, typically, um, is to differentiate them from commercial rounds, which would have like federal and, and the caliber designation. Since this is uh, military rounds, they're marked uh, much more, much simpler. So this, uh, the LC denotes uh, Lake City. That's the armorer or armory that uh, made these particular rounds. And then the date, obvious 11 or uh, 2012. Uh, those are stamped on the bottom. And I believe there's also a NATO head stamp on that. So it would denote, again, uh, a military uh, round. When you refer to a military round, what do you mean? Uh, again, these are made for the military, and um, the, the first round ammunition would probably go out directly to our troops, where uh, a surplus round may, be, may hit the civilian market because um, specifications may not be right, or they just may be in excess, so they uh, get released to be sold to the uh, general, pub, um, general public. The rounds that we have in this case have green tips. Yes, they do. Is the, does the green tip mean something? Yes, for the, the military round, this would denote it's a um, M855 round, meaning it's a 62 grain, 5.56 uh, round. Uh, it's got a little steel penetrator in it that would help uh, when this round is fired at a greater range to help uh, penetrate uh, like a Kevlar helmet or something uh, that our troops might face in the battlefield. So it's an enhanced uh, round versus the old stuff that they used to use that was just a uh, copper jacket with a lead core. So this has a little steel penetrator, a little heavier grain weight to help it uh, s sustain some uh, energy down uh, three, four, or 500 yards downrange. When you were examining uh, live ammunition, did you find any bullets that showed evidence of feeding malfunctions? Uh, yes, I did. I did find three rounds that were um, not, not normal. It looked like there was some damage caused to uh, the sides of them uh, based on uh, just a uh, eyeball exam, and that indicated to me that there was some sort of uh, feeding issues with those particular rounds where they not, would not go from whatever magazine they were in properly into the chamber of the M&P rifle. And did I hand you the, the three, uh, three bullets that you found that showed evidence of feeding malfunctions? Yes, you did. And those are all items you examined as well? Yes, ma'am. And I'm going to give these to Ms. Huntsman to show on the Elmo so we can... And we are looking at, I can't, which exhibit number is this? 576. And if we can sharpen up the bullet as much as we can. If you're able to show us on this round um, what evidence you see of a feeding malfunction. 
Okay, uh, this particular round was uh, especially bad. And I'll, I'll if you're going to stand up, if you've done turn um, the microphone, or let me give you the handheld mic. And you know, I can turn this one back on. I have this one. Here we go, Karen. <laughs> so it's right in front of me, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> if it's a snake, it would have bit me. <laughs> or you can use it. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, this particular round had uh, obvious damage that the, the bullet has been pushed back into the, the cartridge case here. And on one of the sides, it actually has a, a flattened area, a gouge. So that, to me, indicates, one, the, to push a bullet back like that, one of two things, either it tried to get chambered into the chamber of the rifle uh, when there's already a round in it that would cause um, the bullet to get pushed back so severely, or if it didn't go up the feed ramps properly and maybe engaged one of the uh, parts of the barrel extension that help uh, that thing lock up properly. If the, the round is misfed and uh, slingshotted in or even under normal fire, the, the bolt is coming forward pretty, uh, pretty quickly. So that could also cause uh, that bullet to be pushed back if it hit one of the parts of the barrel extension or basically a part it wasn't supposed to hit. It's supposed to go directly up one of the feed ramps into the chamber. It helps because back here, this is about a little more than a third of an inch. The bullet diameter is 0.22. So it's going to naturally uh, feed in fairly simply, uh, except when you have a, a problem uh, with the feeding process, whether it's a magazine. Usually it's a magazine-induced problem. So this round either engaged uh, part of the barrel that it wasn't supposed to, or there was already a round in the chamber, and it can't occupy that space. So that could cause the, the bullet to get pushed back in the casing. So again, um, if it's a double feed where this is behind a round that's already in the chamber, uh, the bolt mechanism is going to be severely back. Obviously won't be able to fire, and that has to be cleared out. Um, that malfunction would have to be cleared out probably by removing the magazine to get not only this round out, but also the round out that's in the chamber. So it would take uh, a lot of effort on the part of the operator to get that magazine out, the bolt locked to the rear, clear the, the rounds that haven't fed properly, and then insert a new magazine to get it uh, in a firing position. And if we could see uh, the other two. This is exhibit 566. Okay, this one is my item 75, as you can see from the number there. This one, too, had damage to one of the shoulders, again, indicating it had a problem going up the, the feed ramps. And i show you on the rifle, but there's two feed ramps on either side, just like the magazine staggered. So that's designed to go up these ramps and in properly. Uh, this one uh, obviously had some problems on the shoulder area where it may have been tried to be manually fed into the chamber, and again, it didn't quite make it, so it was on the ground. Um, so that, that is indication of a, of a problem. And the third one, please. And this one, too, um, one of these had a deep gouge in, in the shoulder area. And that's something that I experienced when I test fired the rifle with uh, one of the magazines. The, the bullet didn't quite make it up and into the ramp. And when the bolt came forward, it, it forced part of the body of the cartridge case into uh, one of the locking mechanisms on the barrel extension, causing it to basically lock up. So. Uh, there was damage on this live ammunition to indicate that it didn't feed up into the ramp properly. So those were just noted that uh, these rounds didn't make it into the chamber properly and there was some damage. You could take that down. Were you, 
Was the live ammunition that you looked at that was the, what we've been calling the 223 or the 5.56 ammunition, was it consistent with the kind of ammunition that you would fire from the rifle that was collected in this case? Yes, all the ammunition that I examined was either uh, Lake City uh, 2011 or Lake City 2012 ammunition and all had the, the green tip. Did you look at live ammunition that was 40 caliber as well? Yes, I did. And in addition to what I've handed you, I think we have more in, in magazines. And was all of the 40 caliber ammunition that you looked at consistent with the kind of ammunition that you would fire from the handguns that were seized in this case? Yes, this particular round, um, my item number 83, was a, um, an intact, uh, unfired, 40 Smith & Wesson caliber gold dot ammunition. Now, the gold dot ammunition, that were they hollow points or not? Yes, gold dots are hollow point ammunition. Explain what a hollow point is. A hollow point has a uh, hollow cavity in the front, and it's uh, best used for self-defense or, or police use because once it impacts soft tissue, it's designed to uh, disrupt the front end or mushroom, become a larger frontal area, and not penetrate, or not basically not over-penetrate. The thing with handgun ammunition, they want to try and get at least 12 inches of, of, of penetration. So we, we, we can test this stuff into 10% uh, gelatin to simulate uh, tissue simulant. So we can have the bullets, or the bullet designers will attempt to make a design that will function uh, in this gelatin. They'll also put barriers in front of it because uh, we've learned a lot throughout the years of different police shootings that what is required um, with handgun ammunition. Judge, to I'm going to object well. to relevance at this point. Uh, sustained. Ask your next question, please. The ammunition that you looked at that was all 40 caliber, was all of it hollow point ammunition? Yes, it was. Now, did you also look at some additional 12 gauge shotgun shells? Yes, I did. The shells that have previously been admitted as People's Exhibit 691, and if you can just hold them up so that the jury can see them, are they, they're, they're red as opposed to the green spent shells. Yes. Does that indicate something significant? Uh, mostly a different manufacturer, but on the sides of these, it'll say uh, these are Ranger double out buck low recoil uh, shot shells. Explain what double out buck means. Double out buck means the the size of the um, the the shot that's contained within. These would be 0 0.32 diameter pellets uh, in the low recoil stuff. There's eight of them, and they go out um, lower velocity. I'm not sure of the velocity that's normally advertised, but this is a uh, typical load that a, a police officer might use in in their 12 gauge shotgun because you have um, eight pellets of, of great size that can help stay on target. Again, um, we don't want to get too far away when we deploy these in, in our shotguns, but uh, they're very effective uh, close range. Now, you said there are eight pellets in this compared to the hundred pellets, shot pellets that were in the green rounds that you examined. Yes, the green right? rounds had uh, 100 uh, diameter pellets. This, these are eight point three two diameter lead pellets. And could these red shotgun shells be fired from the rifle that was, or the uh, shotgun that was seized in this case? Yes, these are, these will fit and function in the uh, 870 shotgun. Did you also look at the magazines that were collected in this case? Yes, I did.
I've handed you a, a number of magazines that have been previously uh, admitted in this case. Some of them are in a box in a large exhibit with multiple magazines, and then some of them are more singly located there. Did you examine all of these? Yes, I did. Were these all magazines that are uh, consistent with the kinds of magazines that you would use with the rifle in this case? Yes, with the rifle, and I believe I had some pistol, uh, the 22-round pistol magazines also. First, looking at the, and I think I've just handed you the uh, 223 magazines. Okay. Is that, I think that's right. If you can uh, take a look at those, and, and were you able to determine if all of these were functional or if, or if any of them had any kind of malfunctions? Most of the, uh, there were, I believe, four steel uh, magazines that were supposed to hold 40 rounds. Uh, most of those uh, did have some sort of malfunction uh, th with me. Uh, some, one of them, actually, the, the top end of it, was so distorted it wouldn't even fit in the uh, well of the rifle, so that one I couldn't even test fire. Uh, the, the magazine lips on some of these, uh, the steel ones I'm talking about, uh, were deformed. Uh, and I'll, I'll take one and I'll put it one okay. that has some damage over on the helmet. If we could see the exhibit number, please, which should be at the top. And that is exhibit 256. And if you could show us, I guess, the... The top of the magazine, or... Um, I mean, on the, the end. Dale, if you can... Uh, Show us what, you, what would be helpful. So up here in this region, this is where the, uh, the, the feed lips, the magazine feed lips are. And those are, are very important in the proper feeding of the uh, ammunition that's contained within to make it work properly in the rifle. The back area of most of these ones that are steel, uh, the one that I brought is aluminum. A couple of the other ones that are brought are aluminum. Those are basically like uh, government issue type magazines. They, they tend to work the best. Uh, this 40 rounder is, again, I guess bigger is better. But in this case, the, the material uh, being steel uh, suffered some damage back here. I don't know when they were probably dropped onto this surface, causing some damage here. So when uh, loaded, uh, they wouldn't hold 40 rounds because the back end of here was crushed. So with 38 or 39 rounds in it, the, uh, the attitude of the bullet is supposed to be somewhat level with this. Uh, most of these, the bullet would be pointing up. So that would indicate you would have problems uh, making that gun function properly with, with the, uh, the altitude of the, the round not being in the right configuration. So again, it's, there's some wiggle room in, in how these magazines will function, but uh, most of the steel ones that I examined uh, wouldn't chamber around uh, with even less than capacity just based on the damage to the magazine lips up here to where it wouldn't feed that first round properly. What would cause the magazine lips to become damaged? The, the back end of uh, the magazine here appeared to be peened or basically it hit the deck and um, if they were fully loaded or close to being fully loaded that I think uh, 30 rounds of ammunition or 40 rounds of ammunition is probably close to another pound with uh, the heavier magazine. If it falls on that, there's a good chance it might get damaged enough to where it would cause uh, a problem like this. So I don't know if they were damaged previous or um, having been dropped in the theater. So I, I can't say when they were damaged, but they were damaged when I received them. You said that these were steel magazines. Were some of the magazines not made of steel that you examined? Yes, some of I. Uh, I believe I had two of them that were regular aluminum magazines 
and uh, the the drum magazine. If you could find exhibit 259. Pearson, when you get to a good stopping point, let me know. Okay. Did you want to stop right at five, or did you want to go a few? Go for, if, if you want to go for a couple more minutes, I'm fine doing that. Okay. Now, was this a magazine that you found malfunctioned or had damage to it? And yes. I think we need the other. Are you able to tell from that angle what your what the issue was with this magazine? Yes, with this particular magazine, this was my item number two twenty eight. This one had severe damage up here in the in the magazine lips area, to where it wouldn't even fit in the well. <clears throat> so it, the damage this one sustained was um, basically made it unusable. Was this also a steel magazine? Yes, it was. And you should have their exhibit 265, the um, drum magazine. Yes, here's the drum. <clears throat> now, did that operate um, the way it was supposed to when you tested it? Well, it, it worked how I expected it to. It, um, I, I used it to test fire the, the firearm in the laboratory, so I was able to get two rounds enough for the, the function test and the getting the rounds for my exemplar collection. But I did take this out to the range, load it up with 100 rounds, and at round 39, I experienced a malfunction where the round started to go up the feed ramp, but the bolt came forward on it. So uh, these are prone to have uh, feeding problems, and that's what I uh, experienced when I test fired it with uh, loaded to full capacity. How do you clear a jam from a drum magazine, if that's what you're using? Uh, with this particular one, I had to remove the magazine from the rifle, take the round that was uh, pinned up against the, uh, the barrel extension and the bolt, remove that from the, from the mechanism, and then reinsert the magazine and let the bolt go forward. And then I was able to fire the rest of the rounds uh, normally. Is the kind of malfunction that you experienced with the with the drum magazine something that, in your experience, is common in a magazine of this kind? Objection asked and answered. Uh, overruled. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, because there's, uh, it's a much more complicated system than just the normal uh, follower with the spring pushing it up. It's got uh, dual springs on each side. It, it, it's kind of like a. a on-ramp in Los Angeles County where two people are trying to go occupy the same space. Well, you can't have that with the feeding problems. Sometimes the rounds will get stuck in this uh, middle area here and not uh, go up to where they're supposed to be. So, um, How does this magazine work? I mean, it's round, so obviously the bolts aren't coming straight up. But how do they feed? Okay. Uh, there's 50 or... And I don't know if the jury, if you can put it on the front of the... Okay table perhaps it's a hundred round capacity there's a bunch of chain linked uh, dummy rounds that uh, help push the ammunition from each of the uh, drums into this uh, collection point so the the drum winds up holds probably close to 50 rounds on each side for a hundred round capacity you push them down just like I loaded the other one uh, it's just that they have to one side has to go, then the other side has to go, and they have to play nice. And typically they don't play nice where around somewhere in this may get jammed up, and then you'll have a void uh, where one side may feed and the other side won't. So there's just a, 
it's just too complicated to uh, to work reliably. And you indicated you also examined some 40 caliber magazines. Yes, I did. Were the Glock, uh, were all, are all of these Glock magazines? Yes, all the pistol magazines were, were Glock um, original equipment magazines. And were the magazines that you looked at, are they consistent with the kind of magazines and ammo that you would use in the handguns that were collected in this case? Yes, ma'am. Did you see evidence of the uh, malfunctions that you saw in some of the steel magazines for the rifle in any of these 40 caliber magazines? No, none of these appeared to have any uh, feeding issues or any problems. And this would be a good place to stop, Your Honor. All right, thank you. All right, uh, members of the jury, it's uh, five after five, so we are going to go ahead and adjourn for the day. I want to remind you that uh, you may not discuss any aspect of the case with each other. I know that it may be tempting at times during the breaks to want to talk about the case but you have to resist that temptation. You can talk about other things if you wish. I want you to be friendly with each other, but you cannot talk about the case. You cannot talk to anyone else about the case. All you can tell people is that you're a juror in a trial in Arapahoe County, and we anticipate the trial will end in August or September. Uh, please do not talk to any witnesses, parties, or attorneys about anything. Um, to make sure that witnesses, parties, and attorneys do not talk to you, um, make sure that you, you wear your juror badge at all times and that it is visible to all those around you. Uh, having your juror badge on will also uh, reduce the risk that people will talk about the case in your presence. Uh, but even if despite your best efforts, uh, let's say you're doing everything right, you're doing everything I've asked you to do, you still happen to overhear someone talking about the case, whether it's an attorney, a witness, um, a person from the public, a person from the media, uh, another juror, you have to let my staff know that you have heard that you need to talk to me. Don't say what it's about, just say you need to talk to me. So if you happen to overhear or hear something about the case from anyone else, then you need to let my staff know about that. And if you have, if that has happened throughout this trial, you need to let my staff know that. Uh, please do not talk to any members of the media about anything. Uh, you must not read, view, or listen to any news or mis uh, any news or media reports that may refer to the case. Remember that there is media coverage of the trial, and so you need to be very, very careful. Um, I've indicated to you that the best and safest course of action is to just avoid news reports or media reports. I know how hard that is, but it's frankly the, the, the best thing to do. Uh, if you happen to be watching the news or listening to the radio and a story comes on about the case, change the channel or change the station. Uh, on the internet, same thing, and it can be tricky because something may come up about the case in a headline and you need to immediately avoid reading it and so you need to be ready for it and you need to be on guard to do that quickly so that you avoid reading it. Um, and that applies to social media, that applies to any other part of the internet, that applies to uh, any uh, media whatsoever uh, and it applies to all means of communication. You have to avoid obtaining any information about the case from outside sources. Remember that sometimes the attorneys and I are having discussions outside your presence. If you go and get some of that information that's reported from the media, uh, from an outside source, then what's the point of having the discussion outside your presence? That would defeat the point. The whole point is the law requires that I have certain conversations outside your presence, and so you need to be careful 
about media reports that may be out there, and that includes social media. I know that people sometimes use Facebook, but sometimes you'll see headlines or you'll see news reports, and that jeopardizes your ability to uh, make sure that you uh, do not see, hear, or read any information about the case from any media report. Um, you cannot visit any locations mentioned in the case or conduct your own investigation outside the courtroom. You cannot start forming any opinions about the case. You must keep an open mind throughout the trial. Neither sympathy nor prejudice for the prosecution or the defendant may affect any of your decisions in this case. Remember that the attorneys have a job to do and sometimes they're required to make objections and ask to have bench conferences. Don't hold it against them if they do. Uh, please don't infer uh, from my rulings that I'm for one side or the other or that I like one side uh, better than the other. I'm neutral in these proceedings. I'm doing my best to apply the rules of evidence and other applicable rules of law. I added to the advisements earlier that you cannot have any contact with the jurors who are no longer on this trial. So some of you may have become friends or acquaintances with them. And you may be tempted to want to talk about what happened or to just say hello. You need to avoid that. Uh, it is an advisement now that I'm giving you, an admonishment that you have to follow, that you cannot have any contact with any of those jurors, but through any means, whether in person, uh, email, phone, social media, text, any means whatsoever, no contact whatsoever, whether, whether it's about this case or something else. You cannot have any contact until these proceedings are over. Does everybody understand all the advisements? Yes. All right, and everybody's saying yes. Listen, I know what I'm asking you is not easy, but we didn't just grab the first folks that we found. We took our time selecting a jury because we knew that this would be difficult, and we knew uh, that we would be asking a lot. And as you know, we started this process months and months ago. If either, even one of you fails to follow a single advisement, it can create a lot of problems. So please uh, make sure you follow each and every one of these advisements. All right? Thank you, folks. Have a good evening. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you. Please be seated, everyone. Agent Higashi, you're free to go. Thank you. Thank we'll see you tomorrow morning. You're not free to go. You're free to go for the night. For the night. Yes, but we'll sir. see you tomorrow morning. Uh, your subpoena is continued until tomorrow, okay? Thank All right. Uh, I just want to follow up at the, on the last bench conference that we had with Ms. Pearson and Mr. King. Um, Ms. Pearson was right, and, and I was wrong. She, she asked the question um, uh, by including the language... Um, to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, she asked, and were you able to determine to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty whether any of these spent shotgun shells were fired from the Remington A-70 shotgun? That was the first question that she asked uh, in terms of opinions about uh, matching um, shotgun shells with uh, actual firearms. The next question was, and were they, in fact, all fired from that gun? And that's the one that I think Mr. King and I were focusing on. That question did not include the language to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, but the one immediately preceding that one had made it clear that she was asking a question uh, and asking whether uh, the witness had an opinion to a reasonable degree uh, of scientific certainty. And then after that, pursuant to my instruction, um, Ms. Pearson included that language in her questions, Obviously, Mr. King will have an opportunity on cross-examination to clarify that, uh, and, and he should if he, if he wants to. He'll have a chance to do that. But I just wanted to make that record because when we were at the bench, she said she had included that language, and Mr. King and I uh, didn't remember that language, and so I wanted to explain that. Um, by the way, right after that question that I read a moment ago, 
uh, and the answer that uh, the answer was uh, yes, I was able to, and then uh, that was the answer to the question that included the language to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. And then the next question was, and were they in fact all fired from that gun? And then Agent Higashi gave an answer to that. Uh, there were no more questions that were answered um, before the bench conference that did not include that language to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. Uh, the bench conference took place, I think, when the next question was posed, but before uh, uh, the agent could answer it. And when I mean when the next question, I mean the next question that asked about comparing shotgun shells to a firearm. Before that next question about that subject matter was answered, the objection was made and we had the bench conference. And so, and after that, pursuant to my instruction, Ms. Pearson uh, was um, careful to include that language in all her questions. And then I don't remember any other objections with respect to that. So I wanted, I wanted to, to clarify that. Uh, is there anything that we need to talk about at this time on behalf of the prosecution, Ms. Pearson? Your Honor. Is there anything that we need to talk about at this time on behalf of the defense, Mr. King? Or Ms. Brady? Yes, Your Honor. I just want to give the court a heads up that uh, Ms. Teach McGuire showed me an exhibit that they intend to use. It'll be exhibit number 649, and it is a series of Gmail chats. And I just wanted to let the court know that I do intend to object to all but one of the Gmail chats. And I would not uh, object if the court wanted to look at those before the witness testifies. All right. And uh, is that okay with the people if I review that? It is, Your Honor. May I approach? Yes. Thank you. And this is Exhibit P-TR-649? Yes, sir. And these are Gmail shots, excuse me, Gmail chats between who? James. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, that's right. James Holmes and Gargi Dada. Okay. And the basis of the objection? I'm going to object uh, to all of them except for the last one, Your Honor. The last one is dated March 25th of 2012. The court's heard testimony about uh, the chat where they discuss human capital. So I understand the relevance of that chat. The others I will object under rules 401, 403, and 802. All right, and uh, the people's response to the objection? Your Honor, in this case, it's very similar to the response that we've given to the emails as well. This is even uh, more different than the emails in that these are Gmail chats that took place over an even shorter period of time between two people who had a completely different relationship over the period of time in question than the defendant had with his parents, with people from the school, um, this encompasses a, a far more candid, I think, an intimate look at uh, how the defendant was functioning over, I, I think it goes back to no earlier than maybe October. I could be wrong on it. One second, Your Honor. It looks like the first one is October 10, 2011. That, that's right, Your Honor. I see that too. So it, it really covers about a five-month period of time. I think it also serves to put into context um, that email that the defendant wants to have before the jury in terms of the topics that they had discussed previously. Um, I don't think it's hearsay to the extent that it's the defendant's statements under 801 to the extent that the conversation um, with the with Gargi is in there. I think those statements only serve to put into context, just like we've done with the emails, the statements of the defendant. Um, Otherwise, I'd rely upon the arguments that we've made on the emails as well. Are you at this time intending to call Gargi Dada as a witness? It, yes, sir. That's how we're going to get the foundation to get these admitted. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll take a look at it, and then I'll, I'll um, give you a ruling um, probably tomorrow, okay? All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you for bringing it up to my attention. I appreciate that. Your Honor, one 
thing. Okay. If yeah. I could uh, tender to the court C TR 52, which is the demonstrative exhibit that I use. You want to mark it? Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. All right. The court will be in recess. Thank you. Boy, I got to tell you, this was a busy day for us here in the 7 newsroom as we were watching this trial and updating, especially with the breaking news involving the three jurors. We've had some close calls in the past, but uh, today, for the first time, three jurors were dismissed due to their exposure to some kind of media coverage that was read to them over a phone. And um, gosh, it was just a busy day because of that, and certainly all of us have felt that. We're going to get to our legal expert, Dan Recht, in just a moment. But just to recap where we are leaving off today and what we, it seems like we can expect tomorrow, we heard from the uh, Colorado Bureau of, of Investigation's gun expert, Dale Higashi, talking about the various kinds of 223 and shotgun shells that he examined, the way that he examined the weapons themselves and the magazines and found malfunctions, the explanations he gave to the jury about how the different kinds of magazines work, including that 100 round drum magazine that we know was in the rifle at the time it malfunctioned inside the theater. But then as the jury was leaving, we heard those very, very long uh, and focused on the media coverage rules, those uh, repeating over and over again for the jury. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to ask Dan Recht, who's now on the line, to explain for us about the jury dismissal process and the process within the state of Colorado for replacing those three jurors with the alternates. And Dan, if you're on the line, could you tell us about that? Absolutely. So <clears throat> here's how it works, Marshall. First of all, what your viewers can't see is that in the jury box, um, there have been for a month 24 jurors, not 12, 24. 12 of them being the actual jurors that will uh, deliberate at the end of the case months from now and 12 being alternates. And importantly, those jurors don't know who is an alternate and who will be an actual juror. So they all have to pay very close attention because there's at least a 50-50 chance they will be a juror in the case deliberating on this death penalty case. Um, what happened today is that three of those people were removed um, and now they're down to 21, 12 of whom will be jurors, nine are alternates, and still those 21 people do not know which they are, and so they have to continue, of course, to pay very close attention. And in every minute of the case, every second of testimony, um, all 21 of them are watching. So Dan, tell me if I'm reading too much into this. But after the three jurors were dismissed and this whole story was almost at an end, the judge called the attorneys up to discuss, um, to discuss the alternates. Am I reading too much into this, or does that indicate to us that at least one of those three may have been an actual voting juror, even though they didn't know it yet? Well, um it might mean that, frankly, there's different ways of seating these jurors by seat number, uh, so I'm not sure. Um, and, I, you know, I just don't know the answer to that. But what generally happens, and I'm sure what happens in this case, is in some fashion, alternates fill the seat um, vacated by a juror that has to leave if they're sick or if they have to leave because they're um, excused because of misconduct. So if one of those three was one of the actual jurors, then one of the alternates just uh, fills that space without even knowing it's happening. One last thought for you about the jury. Is there any penalty for them for having committed misconduct and been dismissed now? Is there any penalty or punishment at all? Well, really good question. Um, I have seen judges find jurors in contempt of court and uh, um, sometimes, sometimes, in an extreme example, jailed or fined or, or have a, a contempt of court trial. But clearly the judge just wanted to get moving here instead of um, diverting the attention to a disciplined juror, just get them out of the way, not create any more waves, 
and move forward with the trial. So the judge bent over backward uh, not to discipline the jurors, although he could have tried to, um, and not even tell them, as you'll recall, why they were being removed. He just told them, you're out, and um, that was it. Well, we'd like to ask you one other question before we say goodnight for the day, specifically about the redirect that we heard earlier for Dr. Metzner. And he was asked this question, quote, is it your opinion that he was intending to kill people to make himself feel better? There was an objection, and the objection was one of a time that we haven't heard before. And so we're asking you to give us an explanation. What does it mean to object to, um, is it invading the province of the jury or evading the province of the jury? It's in invading, like a, invading another country. And that is not an uncommon um, objection. Well, it's, it's not as common as hearsay, but it's not uncommon. And here's when it generally happens. Here's an extreme example. You can't ask anyone, an expert or any witness, is it your opinion that Mr. Jones is guilty of first degree murder? That's the province of the jury. Uh, experts and lay people cannot give an opinion with regard to that. And so the defense, Dan King, thought it was getting too close to that when, um, he, when uh, Dr. Metzner was asked, uh, is it your opinion that he intended to kill these people? Because, of course, intention to kill is an element of first degree murder. So that was why he made the objection, but it was overruled. <clears throat> well, thank you for that, Dan, and I think tomorrow what we can expect to be talking to you about and talking with all of our viewers about are these emails and Google chats that we heard. Um, first of all, we heard the ruling on the emails earlier today, and now we're hearing that they're asking for a ruling on the admissibility of the Google chats, and of course, thanks to some previous testimony, we know that at least some of those chats do pertain to the ex-girlfriend, and um, we, we now expect that it seems imminent that we'll be hearing from her and so in the next day or so uh, we will certainly know more about the Google chats and maybe even hear that piece of highly anticipated testimony and we'll talk to you about that then Dan and in the meantime we wish you a good night we wish all of our viewers a great night we're gonna get some rest here we've been busy uh, and come at it fresh again tomorrow we'll be here again at 830 and court will begin at 840 in the morning hopefully a little bit smoother than it did today have a good night